Across the Years by Eleanor H. Porter Chapter 1 When Father and Mother Rebelled Take more than a month till Christmas, Lydia Ann. Did you know it? said the old man, settling back in his chair with a curiously resigned sigh. Yes, I know, Samuel, returned his wife, sending a swift glance over the top of her glasses. If Samuel Bertram noticed the glance, he made no sign. Huh, he murmured. I've got ten neckerchiefs now. How many crocheted bed slippers you got, huh? Oh, Samuel, remonstrated Lydia Ann feebly. I don't care, asserted Samuel, with sudden vehemence, sitting erect in his chair. Seems as if we might get some for Christmas side slippers and neckerchiefs. Just cause we ain't so young as we once was, ain't no sign that we've lost all our faculty for enjoyment. But, Samuel, they're good and kind and want to give us something, faltered Lydia Ann. And, yes, I know, they're good and kind, cut in Samuel wrathfully. We've got three children, and each one brings us a Christmas present every year. They've got so they do it regular now, just the same as they. They go to bed every night, he finished, groping a little for his smile. And they put just about as much thought into it, too, he added grimly. My grief of conscience, Samuel, how can you talk so? gasped the little woman opposite. Well, they do, persisted Samuel. They buy a pair of slippers and a neckerchief and tuck them into their bag for us, and that's done. And next year they do the same, and it's done again. Oh, I know I'm ungrateful and all that acknowledged Samuel testily, but I can't help it. I've been just ready to bowl over ever since last Christmas, and now I've bowled over. Look at here, Lydia Ann. We ain't so awful old. You're 73, and I'm 76, and we're pretty spars, both of us. Don't we live here by ourselves and do most all the work inside and outside the house? Yes, nodded Lydia Ann timidly. Well, ain't there something you can think of besides slippers you'd like for Christmas? Especially as you never wear crocheted bed slippers? Lydia Ann stirred uneasily. Why, of course, Samuel, she began hesitatingly. Bed slippers are very nice and so codfish, interrupted Samuel in open scorn. Come, he coaxed. Just supposing we was youngsters again and telling Santa Claus what we wanted, what would you ask for? Lydia Ann laughed. Her cheeks grew pink, and the lost spirit of her youth sent a sudden sparkle to her eyes. You laugh, dearie. I ain't a-gonna tell. I won't pawn on her. But it's so silly, faltered Lydia Ann, her cheeks a deeper pink. Me, an old woman. Of course, agreed Samuel promptly. It's bound to be silly, you know, if we want anything but slippers and neckerchiefs, he added with a chuckle. Come out with it, Lydia Ann. It's, it's a tree. Dampers and donuts, ejaculated Samuel, his jaw dropping. A tree? There, I knew you'd laugh, quavered Lydia Ann, catching up her knitting. Laugh? Not a bit of it, averred Samuel stoutly. I, I want a tree myself. You see, it's just this, apologized Lydia Ann feverishly. They give us things, of course, but they never make anything of doing it. Not even to tie them up with a piece of red ribbon. They just slip into our bedroom and leave them all done up in brown paper, and we'd find them after they gone. They made an old kind, but I'm so tired of gray, worsted, and sensible things. Of course, I can't have a tree, and I don't suppose I really want it. But I'd like something all pretty and sparkly and, and silly, you know. And there's another thing I want. Ice cream. 
and I want to make myself sick eating it, too, if I want to. And I want little pink and white sugar peppermints hung in bags. Samuel, can't you see how pretty a bag of pink peppermints be on that green tree? Oh, dearie me, broke off the little old woman breathlessly, falling back in her chair. How I'm running on. I reckon I am in my dotage. For a moment, Samuel did not reply. His brow was puckered into a prodigious frown, and his right hand had sought the back of his head, as was always the case when in deep thought. Suddenly, his face cleared. "'Ye ain't your daughters, by gum, ye ain't!' he cried excitedly. "'And I ain't neither. And what's more, you're a-goin' to have that tree, ice cream, pink peppermints, and all.' "'Oh, my grief and conscience, Samuel,' quavered Lydia Ann. "'Well, you be. We can do it easy, too. We'll have it the night before Christmas. The children don't get here until Christmas Day ever, you know. So taunt and fear a mite with their visit, and twill be all over before they get here. And we'll make a party of it, too,' went on Samuel gleefully. There's the Hopkinses and old Miss Newcomb and Uncle Tim and Grandpa Gowan. They'll all come be glad to. Samuel, could we? cried Lydia Ann, incredulous but joyous. Could we really? I'll get the tree myself, murmured Samuel aloud. And we can buy some of that shiny stuff up there to store to trim it. And I'll get some of that pink and white tarleton for bags chimed in Lydia Ann happily. The pink for the white peppermints and the white for the pink. Samuel, won't it be fun? And to hear her, one would have thought 17 instead of 73. A week before Christmas, Samuel Bertram's only daughter, Ella, wrote this letter to each of her brothers. It has occurred to me that it might be an excellent idea if we would plan to spend a little more time this year with father and mother when we go for our usual Christmas visit. And what kind of a scheme do you think it would be for us to take the children and make a real family reunion of it? I figure that we could all get there by four o'clock the day before Christmas, if we plan for it, and by staying perhaps two days after Christmas, we could make quite a visit. What do you say? You see, father and mother are getting old, and we can't have them with us many more years anyway. I'm sure this would please them. Only we must be very careful not to make it too exciting for them. The letters were dispatched with haste, and almost by return mail came the answers, an empathetic approval, and a promise of hearty cooperation signed Frank and Ned. What is everyone's business is apt to be no one's business, however, and no one notified Mr. and Mrs. Samuel Bertram of the change of plan, each thinking that one of the others would attend to it. As for presents mused Ella, as she hurried downtown two days before Christmas. I can never think what to give them, but after all, there's nothing better than bed slippers for mother and a warm neckerchief for father's throat. Those are always good. The day before Christmas dawned clear and cold. It had been expected that Ella, her husband, and her twin boys would arrive at the little village station a full hour before the train from the north bringing Ned, Mrs. Ned, and little Mabel together with Frank and his wife and son. But Ella's train was late, so late that it came in a scant five minutes ahead of the other one, and thus brought about a joyous greeting between the reunited families on the station platform itself. "'Why, it's not so bad we were late, after all,' cried Ella. "'This is fine. Now we can all go together.' "'Jove, but we're a cheery sight,' exclaimed Ned, as he counted off on his fingers the blooming faces of those about him. "'There are ten of us. Only fancy what they'll say at the house when they catch their first glimpse of us,' chuckled Frank. Their dear old souls, how father's eyes will shine and mother's cap strings bob. By the way, of course, they know we're coming today. There was a moment's silence. Then Ella flushed. Why, didn't, 
didn't you tell them? She stammered. I? Why, of course not, cried Frank. I supposed you were going to, but maybe Ned... He paused and turned questioning eyes on his brother. Ned shook his head. Not I, he said. Why then, then they don't know, cried Ella aghast. They don't know a thing. Never mind, come on, laughed Ned. What difference does it make? What difference does it make? retorted Ella indignantly. Ned Bertram, do you suppose I'd take the risk of ten of us pouncing down on those two poor dears like this by surprise? <laughs> Certainly not. But Ella, they're expecting six of us tomorrow, remonstrated Frank. Very true, but that's not ten of us today. I know, but so far as the work is concerned, you girls always do the most of that, cut in Ned. Work? It isn't the work, almost groaned Ella. Don't you see, boys? It's the excitement. Twouldn't do for them at all. We must fix it some way. Come, let's go into the waiting room and talk it up. It was not until after considerable discussion that their plans were finally made and their line of march decided upon. To advance in the open and take the house by storm was clearly out of the question, though Ned remarked that in all probability the dear old creatures would be dozing before the fire and would not discover their approach. Still, it would be wiser to be on the safe side, and it was unanimously voted that Frank should go ahead alone and reconnoiter, preparing the way for the rest, who could wait, meanwhile, at the hotel not far from the house. The short winter day had drawn almost to a close when Frank turned in at the familiar gate of the Bertram homestead. His hand had not reached the white knob of the bell, however, when the eager expectancy of his face gave way to incredulous amazement. From within, clear and distinct, had come the sound of a violin. Why, what? He cried under his breath and softly pushed open the door. The hall was almost dark, but the room beyond was a blaze of light, with the curtains drawn, and apparently every lamp the house contained trimmed and burning. He himself stood in the shadow, and his entrance had been unnoticed, though almost the entire expanse of the room before him was visible through the half-open doorway. In the farther corner of the room, a large evergreen tree, sparkling with candles and tinsel stars, was hung with bags of pink and white tartlin and festoons of puffy popcorn. Near it sat an old man playing the violin, and his whole weary self seemed to quiver with joy to the tune of his merry money musk. In the center of the room, two gray-haired men were dancing an old-time jig, bobbing, bowing, and twisting about it in a gleeful attempt to outdo each other. Watching them were three old women and another old man eating ice cream and contentedly munching peppermints. And here, there, and everywhere was the mistress of the house, Lydia Ann herself, cheeks flushed and cap strings flying but plainly in her element and joyously content. For a time the man by the hall door watched in silent amazement. Then with a low ejaculation he softly let himself out of the house and hurried back to the hotel. Well, greeted half a dozen voices, and one added, What did they say? Frank shook his head and dropped into the nearest chair. I, I didn't tell them. He stammered faintly. Didn't tell them, exclaimed Ella. Why, Frank, what was the trouble? Were they sick? Surely they were not upset by just seeing you. Frank's eyes twinkled. Well, hardly, he retorted. They, they're having a party. A party? Shrieked half a dozen voices. Yes, and a tree and a dance and ice cream and pink peppermints. Frank enumerated in one breath. There was a chorus of expostulation. Then Ella's voice rose dominant. Frank Bertram, what on earth do you mean? She demanded. Who is having all this? 
father and mother returned frank his lips twitching a little and they've got old uncle tim and half a dozen others for guests but frank how can they be having all this faltered ella why father's not so very far from eighty years old and mabel mabel my dear she broke off in sudden reproof to her young niece who had come under her glance at that moment those are presents for grandpa and grandma i wouldn't play with them mabel hesitated plainly rebellious in each hand was a gray worsted bed slipper atop of her yellow curls was a brown neckerchief cap fashion there were exclamations from two men and ned came forward hurriedly oh i say ella he remonstrated you didn't get those for presents did you but i did why not questioned ella why i got slippers you see i i never can think of anything else besides they're always good anyhow but i should think you a woman could think of something never mind interrupted ella airily mother's a dear and she won't care if she does get two pairs but she won't want three pairs groaned frank i got slippers too there was a moment of dismayed silence then everybody laughed ella was the first to speak it's too bad of course but never mind mother'll see the joke of it just as we do you know she never seems to care what we give her old people don't have many wants i fancy frank stirred suddenly and walked the length of the room then he wheeled about do you know he said a little unsteadily i believe that's a mistake a mistake what's a mistake the notion that old people don't have any wants see here they're having a party down there a party and they must have got it up themselves such being the case of course they had what they wanted for entertainment and they aren't drinking tea or knitting socks they're dancing jigs and eating pink peppermints and ice cream their eyes are like stars and mother's cheeks are like a girl's and if you think I'm going to offer those spry young things a brown neckerchief and a pair of bed slippers, you're much mistaken, because I'm not. But what can we do? stammered Ella. We can buy something else, here, tonight, in the village, declared Frank. And tomorrow morning we can go and give it to them. But by what? I haven't the least idea, retorted Frank with an airy wave of his hands maybe it will be a diamond tiara and a polo pony anyway i know what twon't be twon't the slippers or a neckerchief it was later than usual that christmas morning when mr and mrs samuel bertram arose if the old stomachs had rebelled a little at the pink peppermints and ice cream and if the old feet had charged toll for their unaccustomed activity of the night before neither samuel nor lydia ann would acknowledge it well we had it that cherry chuckled samuel as he somewhat stiffly thrust himself into his clothes we did samuel we did quavered lydia ann joyfully and wasn't it nice? Miss Hopkins said she never had such a good time in all her life before. And Uncle Tim and Grandpa Gowan, they were as spry as crickets, and they made old Pete tune up that money must three times before they quit. Yes, and my grief of conscience, Samuel, tis late, ain't it? Broke off Lydia Ann, anxiously peering at the clock. Come, come, dear. You'll have to hurry about getting that tree out the front room before the children get here. I wouldn't have them know for the world how silly we've been, not for the world. Samuel bridled, but his movements showed a perceptible increase of speed. Well, I do know, he chuckled. Twasn't anything so awful after all. But say, he called triumphantly a moment later, as he stopped and picked up a small object from the floor. They will find out if you don't hide these ere peppermints. The tree and the peppermints had scarcely disappeared from the front room when Frank arrived. Oh, they're all coming in a minute, 
He laughed gaily in response to the surprised questions that greeted him. And we've brought the children, too. You'll have a houseful, all right. A houseful it certainly proved to be, and a lively one, too. In the kitchen, the girls, as usual, reigned supreme, and bundled off the little mother to visit with the boys and the children. During the process of dinner getting, and after dinner, they all gathered around the fireplace for games and stories. And now, said Frank, when darkness came and the lamps were lighted, I've got a new game. But it's a very mysterious game, and you, father and mother, must not know a thing about it until it's all ready. And forthwith, he conducted the little old man and the little old woman out into the kitchen with great ceremony. Say, Samuel, seems as if this was most as good as the party, whispered Lydia Ann excitedly as they waited in the dark. I know it. And they hadn't asked us once if we was getting too tired. Did you notice, Lydia Ann? Yes. And they didn't make us take naps either. Ain't it nice? Why, Samuel, I, I shan't mind even the bed slippers now. She laughed. Ready, called Frank, and the dining room door was thrown wide open. The old eyes blinked a little at the sudden light then widened in amazement. Before the fireplace was a low sewing table with a chair at each end. The table itself was covered with a white cloth, which lay fascinating little ridges and hillocks indicating concealed treasures beneath. About the table were grouped the four eager-eyed grandchildren and their no less eager-eyed parents. With still another ceremonious bow, Frank escorted the little old man and the little old woman to the waiting chairs, and with a merry one, two, three, whisked off the cloth. For one amazed instant, there was absolute silence. Then Lydia Ann drew a long breath. Samuel, Samuel, their presents, and for us, she quavered joyously. It's the bed slippers and the neckerchiefs, and they did them all up in white paper and red ribbons, just for us. At the corner of the mantelpiece, a woman choked suddenly and felt for her handkerchief. Behind her, two men turned sharply and walked toward the window, but the little old man and the little old woman did not notice it. They had forgotten everything but the enchanting array of mysteries before them. Trembling old hands hovered over the many-sized, many-shaped packages and gently patted the perky red bows, but not until the grandchildren impatiently demanded, Why don't you look at them? did they venture to untie a single ribbon. Then the old eyes shone, indeed, at sight of the wonderful things disclosed, a fine lace tie and a bottle of perfume, a reading glass and a basket of figs, some dates, raisins, nuts, and candies, and a little electric pocket lantern which would, at the pressure of a thumb, bring to light all the secrets of the darkest of rooms. There were books, too such as Ella and Frank themselves liked to read, and there was a handsome little clock for the mantel. But there was not anywhere a pair of bed slippers or a neckerchief. At last they were all opened, and there remained not one little red bow to untie. On the table, in all their pristine glory, lay the presents, and half buried in bits of paper and red ribbon sat the amazed but blissfully happy little old man and little old woman. Lydia Ann's lips parted, but the trembling words of thanks froze on her tongue. Her eyes had fallen on a small pink peppermint on the floor. No, no, we can't take him, she cried agitatedly. We had not to. We was wicked and ungrateful, and last night we, we, she paused helplessly, her eyes on her husband's face. Samuel, you, you tell, she faltered. Samuel cleared his throat. Well, you see, we, yes, last night, we, we, he could say no more. We, we had a party to, to make up for things, 
blurted out Lydia Ann. And so you see, we, we hadn't ought to take these, all these. Frank winced. His face grew a little white as he threw a quick glance into his sister's eyes. But his voice, when he spoke, was clear and strong from sheer force of will. A party? Good. I'm glad of it. Did you enjoy it? he asked. Samuel's jaw dropped. Lydia Ann stared speechlessly. This cordial approval of their folly was more incomprehensible than had been the failure to relegate them to naps and knitting earlier in the afternoon. And you've got another party tonight, too, haven't you? went on Frank smoothly. As for those things there, he waved his hand toward the table. Of course you'll take them. Why, we picked them out on purpose for you, every single one of them, and only think how we'd feel if you didn't take them. Don't you like them? Like them, cried Lydia Ann, and at the stifled sob in her voice, three men and three women caught their breath sharply and tried to swallow the lumps in their throats. Wait, we just love them. No one spoke. The grandchildren stared silently, a little awed. Ella, Frank, and Ned stirred restlessly and looked anywhere but at each other. Lydia Ann flushed, then paled. Of course, if, if you picked them out specially for us, she began hesitatingly, her eyes anxiously scanning the perturbed faces of her children. We did, especially, came the prompt reply. Lydia Ann's gaze drifted to the table and lingered upon the clock, the tie, and the bottle of perfume. Specially for us, she murmured softly. Then her face suddenly cleared. Why, then we'll have to take them, won't we? She cried, her voice tremulous with ecstasy. We'll just have to, whether we ought to or not. You certainly will declared Frank, and this time he did not try to hide the shake in his voice. Oh, breathed Lydia Ann blissfully. Samuel, I, I think I'll take a fig, please. End of chapter one. Chapter two, Jupiter M. It was only after serious consideration that Miss Prue had bought the little horse, Jupiter, and then she changed the name at once. For a respectable spinster to drive any sort of horse was bad enough, in Miss Prue's opinion, but to drive a heathen one. To replace Jupiter, she considered Anne, a sensible, dignified, and proper name, and Anne she named him, regardless of age, sex, or previous condition of servitude. The villagers accepted the change, though with modifications. The horse was known thereafter as Miss Prue's Jupiter Anne. Miss Prue had said that she wanted a safe, steady horse, one that would not run, balk, or kick. She would not have bought any horse indeed, had it not been that the way to the post office, the store, the church, and everywhere else had grown so unaccountably long. Miss Prue was approaching her sixtieth birthday. The horse had been hers now a month, and thus far it had been everything that a dignified, somewhat timid spinster could wish it to be. Fortunately, or unfortunately, as one may choose to look at it, Miss Prue did not know that in the dim recess of Jupiter's memory there lurked the smell of the turf, the feel of the jockey's coaxing touch, and the sound of a triumphant multitude shouting his name. In Miss Prue's estimation, the next deadly sin to treason and murder was horse-racing. There was no one in town, perhaps, who did not know of Miss Prue's abhorrence of horse-racing. On all occasions she freed her mind concerning it, and there was a report that the only lover of her youth had lost his suit through his passion for driving fast horses. Even the county fair Miss Prue had refused all her life to attend, there was the horse racing. It was because of all this that she had been so loath to buy a horse, if only the way to everywhere had not grown so long. For four weeks, indeed, for five, the new horse, Anne, was a treasure. Then, one day, Jupiter remembered. Miss Prue was driving home from the post office. The wide, smooth road led straight ahead under an arc of flaming gold and scarlet. The October air was crisp and bracing, a 
and unconsciously Miss Prue lifted her chin and drew a long breath. Almost at once, however, she frowned. From behind her had come the sound of a horse's hoofs, and reluctantly Miss Prue pulled the right hand rein. Jupiter Ann quickened his gait perceptibly and lifted his head. His ears came erect. War, Ann, war, stammered Miss Prue nervously. The hoof beats were almost oppressed now, and hurriedly Miss Prue turned her head. At once she gave the reins an angry jerk. In the other light carriage sat Rupert Joyce, the young man who for weeks had been unsuccessfully trying to find favor in her eyes because he had already found it in the eyes of her ward and niece, Mary Bell. "'Good morning, Miss Brew,' called a boyish voice. "'Good morning,' snapped the woman, and chucked the reins again. Miss Brew awoke, then, to the sudden realization that if the other's speed had accelerated, so too had her own. "'Anne, Anne, whoa!' she commanded. Then she turned angry eyes on the young man. "'Go by, go by. Why don't you go by?' she called sharply. In obedience, young Joyce touched the whip to his grey mare, but he did not go by. With a curious little shake, as if casting off years of dull propriety, Jupiter Ann thrust forward his nose and got down to business. Miss Prue grew white, then red. Her hands shook on the reins. Anne, Anne, whoa! You mustn't, you can't, Anne, please, whoa! She supplicated wildly. She might as well have besought the wind not to blow. On and on, neck and neck, the horse raced. Miss Prue's bonnet slipped and hung rakishly above one ear. Her hair loosened and fell in straggling wisps of grey to her shoulders. Her eyeglasses dropped from her nose and swayed dizzily on their slender chain. Her clothes split across the back and showed the white, tense knuckles. Her breath came in gasps, and only a moaning, Whoa! Whoa! fell in jerky rhythm from her white lips. Ashamed, frightened, and dismayed, Miss Prue clung to the reins and kept her straining eyes on the road ahead. On and on, down the long straight road, flew Jupiter Ann and the little grey mare. At door and window of the scudding houses appeared men and women with startled faces and upraised hands. Miss Prue knew that they were there, and shuddered. The shame of it! She, in a horse race, and with Rupert Joyce! Hurriedly, she threw a look at the young man's face to catch his expression. And then she saw something else. The little grey mare was a full half-head in the lead of Jupiter Ann. It was then that a strange something awoke in Miss Prue, a fierce new something that she had never felt before. Her lips set hard and her eyes flashed a sudden fire. Her moaning, whoa, whoa, fell silent, and her hands loosened instinctively on the reins. She was leaning forward now, eagerly, anxiously, her eyes on the head of the other horse. Suddenly her tense muscles relaxed, and a look that was perilously near to triumphant joy crossed her face. Jupiter Ann was ahead once more. By the time the wide sweep of the driveway leading to Miss Bruce's home was reached, there was no question of the result, and while in the lead of the little grey mare, Jupiter Ann trotted proudly up the driveway and came to a panting stop. Flushed, dishevelled, and palpitating, Miss Prue picked her way to the ground. Behind her, Rupert Joyce was just driving into the yard. He, too, was flushed and palpitating, though not for the same reason. I, I just thought I'd drive out and see Mary Bell he blurted out airily assuming a bold front to meet the wrath which he felt was sure to come at once however his jaw dropped in amazement mary bell i left her down in the orchard gathering apples miss prue was saying cheerfully you might look for her there and she smiled the gracious smile of the victor for the vanquished incredulously the youth stared then emboldened he plunged on recklessly i say you know miss prue that little horse of yours can run miss prue stiffened with a jerk, she straightened her bonnet and thrust her glasses on her nose. Anne has been bad, very bad, she said severely. We'll not talk of it. If you please, I'm ashamed of her. And he turned haughtily away. And yet, in the barn, two minutes later, Miss Rue patted Jupiter Anne on the neck, a thing she had never done before. We beat them anyhow, Anne, she whispered. And after all, he's a pleasant, spoken chap. And if Mary Bell wants him, why, let's let her have him. End of Jupiter N. Chapter 3 The Axminster Path. There, dear, here we are, all dressed for the day, said the girl gaily as she led the frail little woman along the strip of Axminster carpet that led to the big chair. And Kathy, 
asked the woman, turning her head with the groping uncertainty of the blind. Here, mother, answered a cheery voice. I'm right here by the window. Oh, and the woman smiled happily. Painting, I suppose, as usual. Oh, I'm working as usual, returned the same cheery voice, its owner changing the position of the garment in her lap and reaching for a spool of silk. There, breathed the blind woman, as she sank into the great chair. Now I am all ready for my breakfast. Tell cook, please, Margaret, that I will have tea this morning, and just a roll besides my orange, as she smoothed the folds of her black silk gown and picked daintily at the lace in her sleeves. Very well, dearie returned her daughter. You shall have it right away, she added over her shoulder as she left the room. In the tiny kitchen beyond the sitting room, Margaret Whitmore lighted the gas stove and set the water on to boil. Then she arranged a small tray with a bit of worn damask and the only cup and saucer of delicate china that the shelves contained. Some minutes later, she went back to her mother, tray in hand. Most starved to death, she demanded merrily, as she set the tray upon the table Catherine had made ready before the blind woman. You have your roll, your tea, your orange, as you ordered, dear, and just a bit of currant jelly besides. Currant jelly? Well, I don't know. Perhaps it will taste good. Twas so like Nora to send it up. She's always trying to tempt my appetite, you know. Dear me, girls, I wonder if you realize what a treasure we have in that cook. Yes, dear, I know, murmured Margaret hastily. And now the tea, mother. It's getting colder every minute. Will you have the orange first? The slender hands of the blind woman hovered for a moment over the table, then dropped slowly and found by touch the position of spoons, plates, and the cup of tea. Yes, I have everything. I don't need you any longer, Meg. I don't like to take so much of your time, dear. You should let Betty do for me. But I want to do it, laughed Margaret. Don't you want me? Want you? That isn't the question, dear, objected Mrs. Whitmore gently. Of course, a maid's service can't be compared for an instant with a daughter's love and care. But I don't want to be selfish. And you and Kathy never let Betty do a thing for me. There, there, I won't scold any more. What are you going to do today, Meg? Margaret hesitated. She was sitting by the window now, in a low chair near her sister's. In her hands was a garment similar to that upon which Catherine was still at work. Why, I thought, she began slowly, I'd stay here with you and Catherine for a while. Mrs. Whitmore set down her empty cup and turned a troubled face toward the sound of her daughter's voice. Meg, dear, she remonstrated. Is it that fancy work? Well, isn't fancy work all right? The girl's voice shook a little. Mrs. Whitmore stirred uneasily. No, it, it isn't in this case, she protested. Meg, Kathy, I don't like it. You are young. You should go out more, both of you. I understand, of course, it's your unselfishness. You stay with me lest I get lonely and you play at painting and fancy work for an excuse. Now, dearies, there must be a change. You must go out. You must take your place in society. I will not have you waste your young lives. Mother! Margaret was on her feet, and Catherine had dropped her work. Mother! they cried again. 
I, I shan't even listen, faltered Margaret. I shall go and leave you right away, she finished tremulously, picking up the tray and hurrying from the room. It was hours later, after the little woman had trailed once more along the Axminster path to the bed in the room beyond and had dropped asleep, that Margaret Whitmore faced her sister with despairing eyes. Catherine, what shall we do? This thing is killing me. The elder girl's lips tightened. For an instant she paused in her work, but only for an instant. I know she said feverishly. But we mustn't give up. We mustn't. But how can we help it? It grows worse and worse. She wants us to go out, to sing, dance, and make merry as we used to. Then we'll go out and tell her we dance. But there's the work. We'll take it with us. We can't both leave at once, of course, but old Mrs. Austin downstairs will be glad to have one or the other of us sit with her an occasional afternoon or evening. Margaret sprang to her feet and walked twice the length of the room. But I've lied so much already, she moaned, pausing before her sister. It's all a lie, my whole life. Yes, yes, I know murmured the other, with a hurried glance toward the bedroom door. But, Meg, we mustn't give up. T'would kill her to know now. And, after all, it's only a little while, such a little while. Her voice broke with a half-stifled sob. The younger girl shivered, but did not speak. She walked again the length of the room and back. Then she sat down to her work, her lips a tense line of determination, and her thoughts delving into the few past years for a strength that might help her to bear the burden of the days to come. Ten years before and one week after James Whitmore's death, Mrs. James Whitmore had been thrown from her carriage, striking on her head and back. When she came to consciousness, hours afterward, she opened her eyes on midnight darkness, though the room was flooded with sunlight. The optic nerve had been injured, the doctor said. It was doubtful if she would ever be able to see again. Nor was this all. There were breaks and bruises and a bad injury to the spine. It was doubtful if she would ever walk again. To the little woman lying back on the pillow, it seemed a living death, this thing that had come to her. It was then that Margaret and Catherine constituted themselves a veritable wall of defense between their mother and the world. Nothing that was not inspected and approved by one or the other was allowed to pass Mrs. Whitmore's chamber door. For young women only seventeen and nineteen, whose greatest responsibility hitherto had been the selection of a gown or a ribbon, this was a new experience. At first the question of expense did not enter into consideration. Accustomed all their lives to luxury, they unhesitatingly demanded it now, and doctors, nurses, wines, fruits, flowers, and delicates were summoned as a matter of course. Then came the crash. The estate of the supposedly rich James Whitmore was found to be deeply involved, and in the end there was only the pittance for the widow and her two daughters. Mrs. Whitmore was not told of this at once. She was so ill and helpless that a more convenient season was awaited. That was nearly ten years ago, and she had not been told yet. Concealment had not been difficult at first. The girls had indeed drifted into the deception, almost unconsciously, as it certainly was not necessary to burden the ears of the already sorely afflicted woman with the pretty details of the economy and retrenchment on the other side of the door. If her own luxuries grew fewer, the change was so gradual that the invalid did not notice it and always her blindness made easy the deception of those about her. 
even the more to another home was accomplished without her realizing it she was taken to the hospital for a month's treatment and when the month was ended she was tenderly carried home and laid on her own bed and she did not know that home now was a cheap little flat in harlem instead of the luxurious house on the avenue where her children were born she was too ill to receive visitors and was therefore all the more dependent of her daughters for entertainment she pitied them openly for the grief and care she had brought upon them and in the next breath congratulated them and herself that at least they had all that money could do to smooth the difficult way in the face of this it naturally did not grow any easier for the girls to tell the truth and they kept silent for six years mrs whitmore did not step then her limbs and back grew stronger and she began to sit up and to stand for a moment on her feet her daughters now brought the strip of axminster carpet and laid a path across the bedroom and another one from the bedroom door to the great chair in the sitting room so that her feet might not note the straw matting on the floor and question its being there in her own sitting room at home which had opened like this out of her bedroom the rugs were soft and the chairs sumptuous with springs and satin damask one such chair had been saved from the wreck the one at the end of the strip of carpet day by day and month by month the years passed the frail little woman walked the axminster path and sat in the tough chair for her there was a china cup and plate and a cook and maids below to serve for her the endless sewing over which katherine and margaret bent their backs to eke out their scanty income was a picture or a bit of embroidery designed to while away the time as margaret thought of it it seemed incredible this tissue of fabrications that enmeshed them but even as she wondered she knew that the very years that marked its gradual growth made now its strength and in a little while would come the end a very little while the doctor said margaret tightened her lips and echoed her sister's words we mustn't give up we mustn't two days later the doctor called he was a bit out of the old life his home too had been and was now for that matter on the avenue he lived with his aunt whose heir he was and he was the only one outside of the whitmore family that knew the house of illusions in which mrs whitmore lived his visits to the little harlem flat had long ceased to have more than a semblance of being professional and it was an open secret that he wished to make margaret his wife margaret said no though with a heightened color and a quickened breath which told at least herself how easily the no might have been a yes. Dr. Little John was young and poor, and he had only his profession, for all he was heir to one of the richest women on the avenue, and Margaret refused to burden him with what she knew it would mean to marry her, in spite of argument, therefore, and a pair of earnest brown eyes that pleaded even more powerfully. She held to her convictions and continued to say no. All this, however, did not prevent Dr. Littlejohn from making frequent visits to the Whitmore home, and always his coming meant joy to the three weary, troubled hearts. Today he brought a great handful of pink carnations and dropped them into the lap of the blind woman. Sweets to the sweet, he cried gaily as he patted the slim hand on the arm of the chair. Dr. Ned, you dear boy, oh, how lovely, exclaimed Mrs. Whitmore, burying her face in the fragrant flowers. And doctor, I want to speak to you, she broke off earnestly. I want you to talk to Meg and Kathy. Perhaps they will listen to you. I want them to go out more. Tell them, please, that I don't need them all the time now. Dear me, how independent we are going to be, laughed the doctor. 
and so we don't need any more attention now, huh? Betty will do. Betty. It was hard sometimes for the doctor to remember. The maid, explained Mrs. Whitmore. Though, for that matter, there might as well be no maid. The girls never let her do a thing for me. No, returned the doctor easily, sure now of where he stood. But you don't expect me to interfere in the housekeeping business. Somebody must, urged Mrs. Whitmore. The girls must leave me more. It isn't as if we were poor and couldn't hire nurses and maids. I should die if it were like that, and I were such a burden. Mother, dearest, broke in Margaret feverishly, with an imploring glance toward her sister and the doctor. Oh, by the way, interposed the doctor airily, it has occurred to me that the very object of my visit today is right along the lines of what you ask. I want Miss Margaret to go driving with me. I have a call to make out Washington Heights way. Oh, but, began Margaret, and paused at a gesture from her mother. There aren't any buts about it, declared Mrs. Whitmore. Meg shall go. Of course she'll go, echoed Catherine. And with three against her, Margaret's protests were in vain. Mrs. Whitmore was nervous that night. She could not sleep. It seemed to her that if she could get up and walk back and forth, back and forth, she could rest afterward. She had not stepped alone yet, to be sure, since the accident, but after all, the girls did little more than guide her feet, and she was sure that she could walk alone if she tried. The more she thought of it, the more she longed to test her strength. Just a few steps back and forth, back and forth, then sleep. She was sure she could sleep then, very quietly, that she might not disturb the sleepers in the bedroom beyond. The blind woman sat up in bed and slipped her feet to the floor. Within reach were her knit slippers and the heavy shawl always kept at the head of her bed. With trembling hands, she put them on and rose upright. At last, she was on her feet and alone to a woman who for ten years had depended on others for almost everything but the mere act of breathing. It was joy unspeakable. She stepped once, twice, and again along the side of her bed. Then she stopped with a puzzled frown. Under her feet, was the unyielding, unfamiliar straw matting. She took four more steps, hesitatingly, and with her arms outstretched at full length before her. The next instant she recoiled and caught her breath sharply. Her hands had encountered a wall and a window, and there should have been no wall or windows there. The joy was gone now. Shaking with fear and weakness, the little woman crept along the wall and felt for something that would tell her that she was still at home. Her feet made no sound, and only her hurried breathing broke the silence. Through the open door to the sitting room, and down the wall to the right, on and on she crept. Here and there a familiar chair or stand met her groping hands and held them hesitatingly for a moment, only to release them to the terror of an unfamiliar corner or window sill. The blind woman herself had long since lost all realization of what she was doing. There was only the frenzying longing to find her own. She did not hesitate even at the outer door of the apartment, but turned the key with shaking hands and stepped fearlessly into the hall. The next moment there came a scream and a heavy fall. The Whitmore apartment was just at the head of the stairs, and almost the first step of the blind woman had been off into space. When Mrs. Whitmore regained consciousness, she was alone in her own bed. Out in the sitting room, Margaret, Catherine, and the doctor talked together in low tones. At last the girls hurried into the kitchen, and the doctor turned and entered the bedroom. With a low ejaculation, he hurried forward. 
Mrs. Whitmore flung out her arm and clutched his hand. Then she lay back on the pillow and closed her eyes. Doctor, she whispered, where am I? At home. In your own bed. Where is this place? Dr. Little John paled. He sent an anxious glance toward the sitting-room door, though he knew very well that Margaret and Catherine were in the kitchen and could not hear. Where is this place? begged the woman again. Why, it, it, is, the man paused helplessly. Five thin fingers tightened their clasp on his hand, and the low voice again broke the silence. Doctor, did you ever know, did you ever hear that a fall could give back sight? Dr. Littlejohn started and peered into the wan face lying back on the pillow. Its impassiveness reassured him. Why, perhaps once or twice, he returned slowly, falling back into his old position, though rarely, very rarely. But it has happened. Yes, it has happened. There was a case recently in England. The shock and blow released the pressure on the optic nerve, but... Something in the face he was watching brought him suddenly forward in his chair. My dear woman, you don't mean... you can't... He did not finish his sentence. Mrs. Whitmore opened her eyes and met his gaze unflinchingly. Then she turned her head. Doctor, she said, that picture on the wall there at the foot of the bed, it doesn't hang quite right. Mrs. Whitmore, breathed the man incredulously, half rising from his chair. Hush, not yet, the woman's insistent hand had pulled him back. Why am I here? Where is this place? There was no answer. Doctor, you must tell me. I must know. Again the man hesitated. He noted the flushed cheeks and shaking hands of the woman before him. It was true, she must know, and perhaps, after all, it was best she should know through him. He drew a long breath and plunged straight into the heart of the story. Five minutes later, a glad voice came from the doorway. Mother, dearest, then you're awake. The doctor was conscious of a low breath. Hush, don't tell her, in his ears. Then, to his amazement, he saw the woman on the bed turn her head and hold out her hand with the old groping uncertainty of the blind. Margaret, it is Margaret, isn't it? Days afterward, when the weary, pain-racked body of the little mother was forever at rest, Margaret lifted her head from her lover's shoulder where she had been sobbing out her grief. Ned, I can't be thankful enough she cried, that we kept it from mother to the end. It's only my comfort. She didn't know, and I'm sure she would wish that thought to be a comfort to you, dear, the doctor said gently. I am sure she would. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 Phineas and the Motor Car Phineas used to wonder sometimes just when it was that he began to court Diantha Bowman, the rosy-cheeked, golden-haired idol of his boyhood. Diantha's cheeks were not rosy now, and her hair was more silver than gold, but she was not yet his wife. And he had tried so hard to win her. Year after year the rosiest apples from his orchard and the choicest honey from his apiary had found their way to Diantha's table. And year after year the county fair and the village picnic had found him at Diantha's door with his old mare and his buggy, ready to be her devoted slave for the day. Nor was Diantha unmindful of all these attentions. She ate the apples and the honey, and spent long contented hours in the buggy. But she still answered his pleadings with her gentle, I hain't no call to marry yet, Phineas, and nothing he could do seemed to hasten her decision in the least. It was the mare and buggy, however, that proved to be responsible for what was the beginning of the end. They were on their way home from the county fair. The mare, head hanging, was plodding through the dust when around the curve of the road ahead shot the one automobile that the town boasted. The next moment the whizzing thing had passed, 
and left a superannuated old mare looming through a cloud of dust and dancing on two wabbly hind legs. Plague take them automobiles, snarled Phineas through set teeth, as he sawed at the reins. I ax your pardon, I'm sure, Dianthe, he added shamefacedly when the mare had dropped to a position more nearly normal, but I hain't no use for them air contraptions. Diantha frowned. She was frightened, and because she was frightened, she was angry. She said the first thing that came into her head, and never had she spoken to Phineas so sharply. If you did have some use for em, Phineas Hopkins, you wouldn't be crawling along in a shiftless old rig like this. You'd have one yourself and be somebody. For my part, I like em, and I am just aching to ride in em, too. Phineas almost dropped the reins in his amazement. Aiken to ride in em, she had said, and all that he could give her was this shiftless old rig that she so scorned. He remembered something else, too, and his face flamed suddenly red. It was Colonel Smith who owned and drove that automobile, and Colonel Smith, too, was a bachelor. What if— Instantly in Phineas's soul rose a fierce jealousy. I like a hoss myself, he said then, with some dignity. I want something that's alive. Diantha laughed slyly. The danger was past, and she could afford to be merry. Well, it strikes me that you come pretty near having something that wa'n't alive just cause you had something that was, she retorted. Really, Phineas, I don't s'pose Dolly could move so fast. Phineas bridled. Dolly knew how to move once, he rejoined grimly. Of course, nobody pretends to say she's young now, any more'n we be, he finished with some defiance. But he drooped visibly at Diantha's next words. Why, I don't feel old, Phineas, and I ain't old either. Look at Colonel Smith. He's just my age, and he's got an automobile. Maybe I'll have one some day. To Phineas it seemed that a cold hand clutched his heart. Dianthe, you wouldn't really ride in one, he faltered. Until that moment Diantha had not been sure that she would, but the quaver in Phineas's voice decided her. Wouldn't I? You just wait and see. And Phineas did wait, and he did see. He saw Diantha not a week later pink-cheeked and bright-eyed, sitting by the side of Colonel Smith in that hated automobile. Nor did he stop to consider that Diantha was only one of a dozen upon whom Colonel Smith, in the enthusiasm of his new possession, was pleased to bestow that attention. To Phineas it could mean but one thing, and he did not change his opinion when he heard Diantha's account of the ride. "'It was perfectly lovely,' she breathed. Oh, Phineas, it was just like flying. Flying. Phineas could say no more. He felt as if he were choking, choking with the dust raised by Dolly's plodding hoofs. And the trees and the houses swept by like ghosts, continued Diantha. Why, Phineas, I could have rode on and on forever. Before the ecstatic rapture in Diantha's face, Phineas went down in defeat. Without one word he turned away, but in his heart he registered a solemn vow. He, too, would have an automobile. He, too, would make Diantha wish to ride on and on forever. Arduous days came then to Phineas. Phineas was not a rich man. He had enough for his modest wants, but until now those wants had not included an automobile. Until now... He had not known that Diantha wished to fly. All through the autumn and winter, Phineas pinched and economized until he had lopped off all the luxuries and most of the pleasures of living. Even then it is doubtful if he would have accomplished his purpose had he not in the spring fallen heir to a modest legacy of a few thousand dollars. The news of his good fortune was not two hours old when he sought Diantha. I calculate maybe I'll be getting me one of them there automobiles this spring, he said, as if casually filling a pause in the conversation. Phineas! 
at the odd joy in diantha's voice the man's heart glowed within him this one moment of triumph was worth all the long miserable winter with its butterless bread and tobaccoless pipes but he carefully hid his joy when he spoke yes he said nonchalantly i'm goin to boston next week to pick one out i calculate on gettin a pretty good one oh phineas but how how you goin to run it phineas's chin came up run it he scoffed well i hain't had no trouble yet steerin a hoss and i calculate i won't have any more steerin a mess o senseless metal what hain't got no eyes ter be seein things and gettin scared i don't worry none bout runnin it but phineas it ain't all steerin ventured diantha timidly there's lots of little handles and things ter turn and there's some things you do with your feet colonel smith did the name smith to phineas was like a match to gunpowder he flamed instantly into wrath well i calculate what colonel smith does i can he snapped besides airily maybe i shan't get the feet kind anyhow i want the best there's as much as four or five kinds jim blair says and i calculate to try em all oh breathed diantha falling back in her chair with an ecstatic sigh oh phineas won't it be grand and phineas seeing the joyous light in her eyes gazed straight down a vista of happiness that led to wedding bells and bliss phineas was gone some time on his boston trip when he returned he looked thin and worried he started nervously at trivial noises and his eyes showed a furtive restlessness that quickly caused remark why phineas you don't look well diantha exclaimed when she saw him well oh i'm well and did you buy it that automobile i did phineas's voice was triumphant diantha's eyes sparkled where is it she demanded comin next week and did you try em all as you said you would phineas stirred then he sighed well i don't know he acknowledged i hain't done nothin but ride in em since i went down i know that but there's such a powerful lot o em dianthe and when they found out i wanted one they all took hold and showed off the best points demonstratin they called it they raced me up hill and down hill and scooted me round corners till i didn't know where i was i didn't have a minute ter myself and they went fast dianthe powerful fast i ain't real sure yet that i'm breathin natural but it must have been grand phineas i should have loved it oh it was course assured phineas hastily and you take me to ride right away if phineas hesitated it was for only a moment course he promised er, there's a man he's comin with it and he's goin to stay a little just to to make sure everything's all right after he goes i'll come and you want to be ready i'll show ye a thing or two he finished with a swagger that was meant to hide the shake in his voice in due time the man in the automobile arrived but diantha did not have her right at once it must have taken some time to make sure that everything was all right for the man stayed many days and while he was there of course phineas was occupied with him colonel smith was unkind enough to observe that he hoped it was taking phineas hopkins long enough to learn to run the thing but his remark did not reach diantha's ears she knew only that phineas together with the man in the automobile started off early every morning for some unfrequented road and did not return until night there came a day however when the man left town and not twenty-four hours later phineas with a gleaming thing of paint and polish stood at diantha's door now ain't that pretty quavered diantha excitedly ain't that awful pretty phineas beamed pretty slick i think myself he acknowledged and green is so much nicer than red cooed diantha phineas quite glowed with joy colonel smith's car was red oh green's the thing he retorted airily and see he added 
and forthwith he burst into a paean of praise, in which tires, horns, lamps, pumps, baskets, brakes, and mudguards were the dominant notes. It almost seemed, indeed, that he had bought the gorgeous thing before him to look at and talk about rather than to use, so loath was he to stop talking and set the wheels to moving. Not until Diantha had twice reminded him that she was longing to ride in it did he help her into the car and make ready to start. It was not an entire success, that start. There were several false moves on Phineas's part, and Diantha could not repress a slight scream and a nervous jump at sundry unexpected puffs and snorts and snaps from the throbbing thing beneath her. She gave a louder scream when Phineas, in his nervousness, sounded the siren, and a wail like a cry from the spirit world shrieked in her ears. "'Phineas, what was that?' she shivered when the voice had moaned into silence. Phineas's lips were dry, and his hands and knees were shaking, but his pride marched boldly to the front. "'Why, that's the siren whistle course,' he chattered. "'Ain't it great? I thought you'd like it and to hear him one would suppose that to sound the siren was always a necessary preliminary to starting the wheels. They were off at last. There was a slight indecision, to be sure, whether they would go backward or forward, and there was some hesitation as to whether Diantha's geranium bed or the driveway would make the best thoroughfare. But these little matters having been settled to the apparent satisfaction of all concerned, the automobile rolled down the driveway and out on to the main highway. "'Oh, ain't this grand!' murmured Diantha, drawing a long but somewhat tremulous breath. Phineas did not answer. His lips were tense, and his eyes were fixed on the road ahead. For days now he had run the car himself, and he had been given official assurance that he was quite capable of handling it. Yet here he was on his first ride with Diantha, almost making a failure of the whole thing at the start. Was he to be beaten? Beaten by a senseless motor-car and Colonel Smith? At the thought Phineas lifted his chin and put on more power. "'Oh, my, how fast we're going!' cried Diantha close to his ear. Phineas nodded. "'Who wants to crawl?' he shouted and the car leaped again at the touch of his hand. They were out of town now, on a wide road that had few turns. Occasionally they met a carriage or a wagon, but the frightened horses and the no less frightened drivers gave the automobile a wide berth, which was well, for the parallel tracks behind Phineas showed that the car still had its moments of indecision as to the course to pursue. The town was four miles behind them when Diantha, who had been for some time vainly clutching at the flying ends of her veil, called Phineas to stop. The request took Phineas by surprise. For one awful moment his mind was a blank. He had forgotten how to stop. In frantic haste he turned and twisted and shoved and pulled, ending with so sudden an application of the brakes that Diantha nearly shot head first out of the car as it stopped. "'Why, why, Phineas!' she cried a little sharply. Phineas swallowed the lump in his throat and steadied himself in his seat. "'You see, I, I can stop her real quick if I want to,' he explained jauntily. "'You can do most anything with these ere things if you only know how, Dianthe. Didn't we come slick?' "'Yes, indeed,' stammered Diantha, hastily smoothing out the frown on her face and summoning a smile to her lips. Not for her best black silk gown would she have had Phineas know that she was wishing herself safe at home, and the automobile back where it came from. "'We'll go home through the holler,' said Phineas, after she had retied her veil and they were ready to start. "'It's a long way round, you know. I ain't going to give you no snippy little two-mile run, Dianthe, like Colonel Smith did,' he finished gleefully. "'No, of course not.' murmured Diantha, smothering a sigh as the automobile started with a jerk. An hour later, tired, frightened, a little breathless, but valiantly declaring that she had had a beautiful time, Diantha was set down at her own door. That was but the first of many such trips, 
ever sounding in Phineas Hopkins' ears, and spurring him to fresh endeavor, were Diantha's words, I could a rode on and on forever. And deep in his heart was the determination that if it was automobile rides that she wanted, it was automobile rides that she should have. His small farm on the edge of the town, once the pride of his heart, began to look forlorn and deserted, for Phineas, when not actually driving his automobile, was usually to be found hanging over it with wrench and polishing cloth. He bought little food and less clothing, but always gasoline, and he talked to anyone who would listen about automobiles in general and his own in particular, learnedly dropping in frequent references to cylinders, speed, horsepower, vibrators, carburetors, and spark plugs. As for Diantha, she went to bed every night with thankfulness that she possessed her complement of limbs and senses, and she rose every morning with the fear that the coming night would find some of them missing. To Phineas and the town in general she appeared to be devoted to this breathless whizzing over the country roads, and wild horses could not have dragged from her the truth that she was longing with an overwhelming longing for the old days of dolly, dawdling, and peace. Just where it all would have ended, it is difficult to say, had not the automobile itself taken a hand in the game, as automobiles will sometimes, and played trumps. It was the first day of the county fair again, and Phineas and Diantha were on their way home. Straight ahead the road ran between clumps of green, then unwound in a white ribbon of dust across wide fields and open meadows. "'Tain't much like last year, is it, Dianthe?" crowed Phineas shrilly in her ear. Then something went wrong. Phineas knew it instantly. The quivering thing beneath them leaped into new life, but a life of its own. It was no longer a slave, but a master. Phineas's face grew white. Thus far he had been able to keep to the road, but just ahead there was a sharp curve, and he knew he could not make the turn. Something was the matter with the steering gear. "'Look out! She's got the bits in her teeth!' he shouted. "'She's bolted!' There came a scream, a sharp report, and a grinding crash. Then silence. From away off in the dim distance, Phineas heard a voice. "'Phineas! Phineas!' Something snapped, and he seemed to be floating up, 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 out of the black oblivion of nothingness. He tried to speak, but he knew that he made no sound. "'Phineas! Phineas!' The voice was nearer now, so near that it seemed just above him. It sounded like... With a mighty effort he opened his eyes. Then full consciousness came. He was on the ground, his head in Diantha's lap. Diantha, bonnet crushed, neck bow askew and coat torn, was bending over him, calling him frantically by name. Ten feet away the wrecked automobile, tip-tilted against a large maple tree, completed the picture. With a groan Phineas closed his eyes and turned away his head. "'She's all stove up, and now you won't ever say yes,' he moaned. "'You wanted to ride on forever.' "'But I will. I don't. I didn't mean it,' sobbed Diantha incoherently. "'I'd rather have Dolly twice over. I like to crawl. Oh, Phineas, I hate that thing. I've always hated it. I'll say yes next week. Tomorrow.' "'Today, if you'll only open your eyes and tell me you ain't a-dying.' Phineas was not dying, and he proved it promptly and effectually even to the doubting Diantha's blushing content. And there their rescuers found them a long half-hour later, a blissful old man and a happy old woman sitting hand in hand by the wrecked automobile. "'I calculated somebody'd be along pretty soon,' said Phineas, rising stiffly. "'You see,' We've each got a foot that don't go, so we couldn't get help. But we hain't minded the wait. Not a mite. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 The Most Wonderful Woman And a Great Man Who Proves Himself Truly Great It was old home week in the little village, and this was to be the biggest day. 
from a distant city was to come the town's one really great man to speak in the huge tent erected on the common for just that purpose from end to end the village was aflame with bunting and astir with excitement so that even i merely a weary sojourner in the place felt the thrill and tingled pleasantly when the hon jonas whitermore entered the tent at two o'clock that afternoon i had a good view of him for my seat was next the broad aisle behind him on the arm of an usher came a small frightened-looking little woman in a plain brown suit and a plainer brown bonnet set askew above thin gray hair the materials of both suit and bonnet were manifestly good but all distinction of line and cut was hopelessly lost in the wearing who she was i did not know but i soon learned for one of the two young women in front of me said a low something to which the other gave back a swift retort woefully audible his wife that little dowdy thing in brown oh what a pity such an ordinary woman my cheeks grew hot in sympathy with the painful red that swept to the roots of the thin gray hair under the tip-tilted bonnet then i glanced at the man had he heard i was not quite sure his chin i fancied was a trifle higher i could not see his eyes but i did see his right hand and it was clenched so tightly that the knuckles were white with the strain i thought i knew then he had heard the next minute he had passed on up the aisle and the usher was sitting the more frightened than ever little wife in the roped-off section reserved for important guests it was then that i became aware that the man on my right was saying something i beg your pardon but did you speak to me i asked turning to him hesitatingly the old man met my eyes with an abashed smile i guess i'm the party what had ought to be asking pardon stranger he apologized i talk to myself so much i kind of forget sometimes and do it when folks is round i was only saying that i wondered why twas the good lord give folks tongues and forgot to give em brains to run em with but maybe you didn't hear what she said he hazarded with a jerk of his thumb toward the young woman in front about mrs whitermore yes i heard his face darkened then you know and she heard too ordinary woman indeed hm? to think that better tillington should ever live to hear herself called an ordinary woman you see i knew her when she was betty tillington did you i smiled encouragingly i was getting interested and i hope he would keep on talking on the platform the guest of honor was holding a miniature reception he was the picture of polite attention and punctilious responsiveness but i thought i detected a quick glance now and then toward the roped-off section where sat his wife and i wondered again had he heard that thoughtless comment from somewhere had come the rumor that the man who was to introduce the honorable jonas whitermore had been delayed by a washout down the road but was now speeding toward us by automobile for my part i fear i wished the absentee a punctured tire so that i might hear more of the heart history of the faded little woman with the bonnet askew yes i knew her nodded my neighbor and she didn't look much then like she does now she was as pretty as a picture and there wa'n't a chap within sight of her what twan't head over heels in love with her but there wa'n't never a chance for but two of us and we knew it joe whitermore and a chap named fred farrell so after a time we just sort of stood off and watched the race as pretty a race as ever you see farrell had the money and the good looks while whitermore was poor as a church mouse and he was homely too but whitermore must have had something maybe something we didn't see for she took him well they were married and settled down happy as two twittering birds but poor as job's turkey for a year or so she was as pretty and gay as ever she was and into every good time goin'. then the babies came one after another some of em livin and some dyin soon after they came of course things was different then what with the babies and the housework betty couldn't get out much and we didn't see much of her when we did see her though she'd smile and toss her head in the old way 
and say how happy she was and didn't we think her babies was the prettiest things ever and all that and we did of course and told her so but we couldn't help seeing that she was getting thin and white and that no matter how she tossed her head there wa'n't any curls there to bob like they used to cause her hair was pulled straight back and twisted up into a little hard knot just like as she had done it up when some one was calling her to come quick yes i can imagine it i nodded well that's the way things went at the first while he was getting his start and i guess they was happy then you see they was pullin even them days and runnin neck and neck even when fred farrell her old beau married a girl she knew and built a fine house all piazzas and bow winders right in sight of their shabby little rented cottage i don't think she minded it even if miss farrell didn't have anything to do from morning till night only sat in a white dress on her piazza and rock and give parties betty didn't seem to mind she had her joe but by and by she didn't have her joe other folks had him and his business had him i mean he'd got up where the big folks in town began to take notice of him and when he wa not tendin' to business he was hobnobbin with them so's to bring more business and of course she with her babies and housework didn't have no time for that well next day they moved away when they went they took my oldest girl mary to help betty and so we still kept track of him mary said it was worse than ever in the new place it was quite a big city and just livin cost a lot mr whitermore of course had to look decent out among folks as he was so he had to be tended to first then what was left of money and time went to the children it wa'n't long too before the big folks there began to take notice and mr whitermore would come home all excited and tell about what was said to him and what fine things he was being asked to do he said twas goin to mean everything to his career then come the folks to call ladies in fine carriages with dressed-up men to hold the door open and all that but always after they'd gone mary'd find betty crying somewhere or else trying to fix a bit of old lace or ribbon onto some old dress mary said betty's clothes were awful thin you see the one never any money left for her things but all this didn't last long for very soon the fine ladies stopped coming and betty just settled down to the children and didn't try to fix her clothes any more but by and by of course the money began to come in lots of it and that meant more changes naturally they moved into a bigger house and got two more hired girls and a man besides mary mr whitermore said he didn't want his wife to work so hard now and that besides his position demanded it he was always talking about his position those days trying to get his wife to go callin and go to parties and take her place as his wife as he put it and mary said betty did try and try hard of course she had nice clothes now lots of em but somehow they never seemed to look just right and when she did go to parties she never knew what to talk about she told mary she didn't know a thing about the books and pictures and the plays and quantities of other things that everybody else seemed to know about and so she just had to sit still and say nothing mary said she could see it plagued her and she wa'n't surprised when after a time betty began to have headaches and be sick party nights and beg mr whitermore to go alone and then cry because he did go alone you see she'd got it into her head then that her husband was ashamed of her and was he demanded i i don't know mary said she couldn't tell exactly he seemed worried sometimes and quite put out at the way his wife acted about going to places then other times he didn't seem to notice or care if he did have to go alone it wa'n't that he wasn't kind to her it was just that he was so busy looking after himself that he forgot all about her but betty took it as all being ashamed of her no matter what he did and for a while she just seemed to pine away under it they'd moved to washington by that time and of course with him in the president's cabinet it was pretty hard for her 
then all of a sudden she took a new turn and began to study and to try to learn things everything how to talk and dress and act besides stuff that was just book learnin she's been doin that for quite a spell and mary says she thinks she'd do pretty well now in lots of ways if only she had half a chance something to encourage her you know but her husband don't seem to take no notice now just as if he's got tired expectin anything of her and that's made her so scared and discouraged she's too nervous to act as if she did know anything and there it is well maybe she is just an ordinary woman sighed the old man a little sternly if bein ordinary means she's like lots of others for i suspect stranger that if the truth was told lots of other big men have got wives just like her women what have been working so tarnal hard to help their husbands get ahead that they ain't had time to see where they themselves was goin and by and by they wake up to the fact that they ain't got nowhere they've just stayed still way behind mary says she don't believe betty would mind even that if her husband only seemed to care to to understand you know how it had been with her and how crikey i guess they've come broke off the old man suddenly craning his neck for a better view of the door from outside had sounded the honk of an automobile horn and the wild cheering of men and boys a few minutes later the long delayed program began it was the usual thing before the speaker of the day came other speakers and each of them no matter what his subject failed not to refer to our illustrious fellow townsman in terms of highest eulogy one told of his humble birth his poverty-driven boyhood his strenuous youth another drew a vivid picture of his rise to fame a third dilated upon the extraordinary qualities of brain and body which had made such achievement possible and which would one day land him in the white house itself meanwhile close to the speaker's stand sat the honorable jonas whitermore himself for the most part grim and motionless though i thought i detected once or twice a repetition of the half troubled half questioning glances directed toward his wife that i had seen before perhaps it was because i was watching him so closely that i saw the sudden change come to his face the lips lost their perfunctory smile and settled into determined lines the eyes under their shaggy brows glowed with sudden fire the entire pose and air of the man became curiously alert as if with the eager impatience of one who has determined upon a certain course of action and is anxious only to be up and doing very soon after that he was introduced and amid deafening cheers rose to his feet then very quietly he began to speak we had heard he was an orator doubtless many of us were familiar with his famous nickname silver-tongued joe we had expected great things of him a brilliant discourse on the tariff perhaps or on our foreign relations or yet on the hag tribunal but we got none of these we got first a few quiet words of thanks and appreciation for the welcome extended him then we got the picture of an everyday home just like ours with all its petty cares and joys so vividly drawn that we thought we were seeing it not hearing about it he told us it was a little home of forty years ago and we began to realize some way that he was speaking of himself i may you know here he said for i am among my own people i am at home even then i didn't see what he was coming to like the rest i sat slightly confused wondering what it all meant then suddenly into his voice there crept a tense something that made me sit more erect in my seat my indomitable will-power my superb courage my stupendous strength of character my undaunted persistence and marvelous capacity for hard work he was saying do you think it's to that i owe what i am never come back with me to that little home of forty years ago and i'll show you to what and to whom i do owe it first and foremost i owe it to a woman no ordinary woman i want you to understand but to the most wonderful woman in the world 
i knew then so did my neighbor the old man at my side he jogged my elbow frantically and whispered he's goin to he's goin to he's goin to show her he does care and understand he did hear that girl crikey but ain't he the cute one to pay her back like that for what she said the little wife down front did not know yet however i realized that the minute i looked at her and saw her drawn face and her frightened staring eyes fixed on her husband up there on the platform her husband who was going to tell all these people about some wonderful woman whom even she had never heard of before but who had been the making of him it seemed my will power the honorable jonas whitermore was saying then not mine but the will power of a woman who did not know the meaning of the world fell not my superb courage but the courage of one who day in and day out could work for a victory whose crown was to go not to herself but to another not my stupendous strength of character but that of a beautiful young girl who could see youth and beauty and opportunity nod farewell and yet smile as she saw them go not my undaunted persistence but the persistence of one to whom the goal is always just ahead but never reached and last not my marvellous capacity for hard work but that of the wife and mother who bends her back each morning to a multitude of tasks and cares that she knows night will only interrupt not finish my eyes were still on the little brown-clad woman down in front so i saw the change come to her face as her husband talked i saw the terror give way to puzzled questioning and that in turn become surprise incredulity then overwhelming joy as the full meaning came to her that she herself was the most wonderful woman in the world who had been the making of him i looked then for just a touch of the old frightened self-consciousness at finding herself thus so conspicuous but it did not come the little woman plainly had forgotten us she was no longer mrs jonas whitermore among a crowd of strangers listening to a great man's old home day speech she was just a loving heart-hungry tired all but discouraged wife hearing for the first time from the lips of her husband that he knew and cared and understood through storm and sunshine she was always there at her post aiding encouraging that i might be helped the honorable jonas whitermore was saying week in and week out she fought poverty sickness and disappointments and all without a murmur lest her complaints distract me for one precious moment from my work even the nights brought her no rest for while i slept she stole from cot to cradle and from cradle to crib covering outflung little legs and arms cooling parched little throats with water quieting fretful whimpers and hushing threatening outcries with a low hush darling mother's here don't cry you'll wake father and father must have his sleep and father had it that sleep just as he had the best of everything else in the house food clothing care attention everything what mattered it if her hands did grow rough and toil-worn mine were left white and smooth for my work what mattered it if her back and her head and her feet did ache mine were left strong and painless for my work what mattered her wakefulness if i slept what mattered her weariness if i was rested what mattered her disappointments if my aims were accomplished nothing the honorable jonas whitermore paused for breath and i caught mine and held it it seemed for a minute as if everybody all over the house was doing the same thing too so absolutely still was it after that one word nothing they were beginning to understand a little i could tell that they were beginning to see this big thing that was taking place right before their eyes i glanced at the little woman down in front the tender glow on her face had grown and deepened and broadened until her whole little brown-clad self seemed transfigured my own eyes dimmed as i looked then suddenly i became aware that the honorable jonas whitermore was speaking again 
and not for one year only nor two nor ten has this quintessence of devotion been mine he was saying but for twice ten then a score more for forty years for forty years did you ever stop to think how long forty years could be forty years of striving and straining of pinching and economizing of serving and sacrificing forty years of just loving somebody else better than yourself and doing this every day and every hour of the day for the whole of those long forty years it isn't easy to love somebody else always better than yourself you know it means the given up of lots of things that you want you might do it for a day for a month for a year even but for forty years yet she has done it that most wonderful woman do you wonder that i say it is to her and to her alone under god that i owe her all that i am all that i hope to be once more he paused then in a voice that shook a little at the first but that rang out clear and strong and powerful at the end he said ladies gentlemen i understand this will close your program it will give me great pleasure therefore if at the adjournment of this meeting you will allow me to present you to the most wonderful woman in the world my wife i wish i could tell you what happened then the words oh yes i could tell you in words what happened for that matter the reporters at the little stand down in front told it in words and the press of the whole country blazoned it forth on the front page the next morning but really to know what happened you should have heard it and seen it and felt the tremendous power of it deep in your soul as we did who did see it there was a moment's breathless hush then to the canvas roof there rose a mighty cheer and a thunderous clapping of hands as by common impulse the entire audience leaped to its feet for one moment only did i catch a glimpse of mrs jonas whitermore blushing laughing and wiping teary eyes in which the wondrous glow still lingered then the eager crowd swept down the aisle toward her crikey breathed the red-faced old man at my side well stranger even if it does seem sometimes as if the good lord gives some folks tongues and forgot to give em brains to run em with i guess maybe he'd kinder makes up for it once in a while by givin other folks the brains to use their tongues so powerful well i nodded dumbly i could not speak just then but the young woman in front of me could very distinctly as i passed her i heard her say well now ain't that the limit sue and her such an ordinary woman too end of chapter five chapter six the price of a pair of shoes for fifty years the meadow lot had been mowed and the side hill ploughed at the nod of jeremiah's head and for the same fifty years the plums have been preserved and the mince meat chopped at the nod of his wife's and now the whole farm from the meadow lot to the mince meat was to pass into the hands of william the only son and william's wife sarah ellen it'd be so much nicer mother no care for you sarah ellen had declared and so much easier for you father too william had added it is time you rested as for money of course you'll have plenty in the savings bank for clothes and such things you won't need much anyhow he finished for you'll get your living off the farm just as you always have so the matter was settled and the papers were made out there was no one to be considered after all but themselves for william was the only living son and there had been no daughters for a time it was delightful jeremiah and hester whipple were like children led out of school they told themselves that they were people of leisure now and they forced themselves to lie abed half an hour later than usual each day they spent long hours in the attic looking over old treasures 
and they loitered about the garden and the barn with no fear that it might be time to get dinner or to feed the stock gradually however there came a change a new restlessness entered their lives a restlessness that speedily became the worst kind of homesickness the homesickness of one who is already at home the extra half hour was spent in bed as before but now hester lay with one ear listening to make sure that sarah ellen did let the cat in for her early breakfast and jeremiah lay with his ear listening for the squeak of the barn door which would tell him whether william was early or late that morning there were the same long hours in the attic and the garden too but in the attic hester discovered her treasured wax wreath late of the parlor wall and in the garden jeremiah found more weeds than he had ever allowed to grow there he was sure the farm had been in the hands of william and sarah ellen just six months when the huntersville savings bank closed its doors it was the old story of dishonesty and disaster and when the smoke of treasurer hilton's revolver cleared away there was found to be practically nothing for the depositors perhaps on no one did the blow fall with more staggering force than on jeremiah whipple why hester he moaned when he found himself alone with his wife here i'm seventy-eight years old and no money what i'm going ter do i know dear soothed hester but ain't as bad for us as this for some we've got the farm you know and we ain't got the farm cutting her husband sharply william and sarah ellen is got it yes i know but they why they're us jeremiah reminded hester trying to keep the quaver out of her voice maybe hester maybe conceded jeremiah but he turned and looked out of the window with gloomy eyes there came a letter to the farmhouse soon after this from nathan banks a favorite nephew suggesting that uncle and aunt pay them a little visit just a thing father cried william go it'll do you both good and after some little talk it was decided that the invitation should be accepted nathan banks lived thirty miles away but not until the night before the whipples were to start did it suddenly occur to jeremiah that he had now no money for railroad tickets with a heightened color on his old cheeks he mentioned the fact to william gee see i i s'pose i'll have ter come ter you he apologized them won't take us and he looked ruefully at the few coins he had pulled from his pocket they're all the cash i've got left william frowned a little and stroked his beard sure enough he muttered i forgot the tickets too father it it's so worth that van glowing up isn't it oh i'll let you have it all right of course and glad to only it so happens that just now i are uh, how much is it anyway he broke off abruptly why i reckon a couple of dollars will take us down and more maybe stammered the old man only of course there is coming back and oh we don't have to reckon on that part now interrupted william impatiently as he thrust his hands into his pockets and brought out a bill and some change i can send you down some more when the time comes there here is a two if it doesn't take it all what's left can go toward bringing you back and he handed out the bill 
and dropped the change into his pocket. Thank you, William, stammered the old man. I... I'm sorry. Oh, that's all right, cut in William cheerfully, with a wave of his two hands. Glad to do it, father, glad to do it. Mr. and Mrs. Whipple stayed some weeks with their nephew, but much as they enjoyed their visit, there came a day when home, regardless of weeds that were present and wax wreaths that were absent, seemed to them the one place in the world, and they would have gone there at once had it not been for the railroad fares. William had not sent down any more money though his letters had been kind and had always spoken of the warm welcome that awaited them any time they wished to come home toward the end of the fifth week a bright idea came to jeremiah we'll go to cousin abby's he announced gleefully to his wife nathan said last night he'd drive us over there any time we'll go tomorrow and we won't come back here at all. It'll be ten miles nearer home there, and ain't won't cost us a cent to get there. He finished triumphantly, and to Cousin Abby's they went. So elated was Jeremiah with the result of his scheming that he set his wits to work in good earnest, and in less than a week, he had formulated an itinerary that embraced the homes of two other cousins, an aunt of Sarah Ellen's, and the niece of a brother-in-law, the latter being only three miles from his own farmhouse, or rather William's farmhouse, as he corrected himself bitterly. Before another month had passed, the round of visits was accomplished, and the little old man, and the little old woman having been carried to their destination in each case by their latest host finally arrived at the farmhouse door they were weary penniless and half sick from being feasted and fed at every turn but they were blissfully conscious that of no one had then been obliged to beg the price of their journey home we didn't write we were coming apologized jeremiah faintly as he stumbled across the threshold and dropped into the nearest chair we were going to write from kesiah's but we were so tired we hurried right up and come home this nice to get here ain't it hester he finished settling back in his chair nice cried hester tremulously tugging at her bonnet strings nice ain't no name for it jeremiah why sarah ellen seems if i don't want to do nothing for a whole month but set in my own room and just look round all day you poor dear and that's all you shall do soothed sarah ellen and hester sighed content for so many many weeks now she had sat upon strange chairs and looked out upon an unfamiliar world it was midwinter when jeremiah's last pair of shoes gave out and there ain't a cent ter get any new ones hester he exclaimed ruefully eyeing the ominously thin place in the soul i know jeremiah but there's william murmured hester i am sure he oh of course he'd give it to me cried jeremiah quickly but i i sort of hate to ask fool i couldn't think of that declared hester stoutly but even as she spoke she took her own feet farther under her chair we gave them the farm and they understood they was to take care of us, of course. Hmm, yes, I know, I know. I'll ask him, murmured Jeremiah, but he did not ask him until the ominously thin place in the soul had become a hole 
large, round, and unmistakable. Well, William, he began jocosely, trying to steady his shaking voice, guess them won't stand for it much longer, and he held up the shoe sole uppermost. Well, I should say not, laughed William. Then his face changed. Oh, and you'll have to have the money for some new ones, of course. By George, it doesn't beat all how I keep forgetting about that bank. I know, William, I'm sorry, stammered the old man miserably. Oh, I can let you have it all right, father. I'm glad to, assured William, still frowning. It's only that just at this time I'm a little short and... He stopped abruptly and thrust his hands into his pockets. Mmm, he vouchsafed after a minute. Well, I'll tell you what, I haven't got any now. But in a day or two I'll take you over to the village and see what the Skinner's got that will fit you. Oh, we'll have some shoes, father, never fear, he laughed. You don't suppose I'm going to let my father go barefoot, eh? And he laughed again. Things wore out that winter in the most unaccountable fashion, at least those belonging to Jeremiah and Hester did, especially under garments. One by one they came to mending, and one by one Hester mended them, patch upon patch, until sometimes there was left scarcely a thread of the original garment. Once she asked William for money to buy new ones, but it happened that William was again short, and though the money she had asked for came later, Hester did not make that same request again. There were two things that Hester could not patch very successfully. Her shoes. She tried to patch them to be sure, but the coarse thread knotted in her shaking old hands, and the bits of leather cut from still older shoes slipped about and left her poor old thumb exposed to the sharp prick of the needle, so that she finally gave it up in despair. She tuck her feet still farther under her chair these days when Jeremiah was near, and she pieced down two of her dress skirts so that they might touch the floor all round. In spite of all this, however, Jeremiah saw one day and understood. Hester, he cried sharply, put out your foot. Hester did not hear, apparently. She lowered the paper she was reading and laughed a little hysterically. Such a good joke, Jeremiah, she quavered. Just let me read it, a man. Hester, be them the best shoes you've got? demanded Jeremiah. And Hester, with a wisdom born of fifty years' experience of that particular tone of voice, dropped her paper and her subterfuge and said gently, Yes, Jeremiah. There was a moment's pause. Then Jeremiah sprang to his feet, thrust his hands into his pockets, and paced the tiny bedroom from end to end. Hester, these things are killing me, he blurted out at last. Here I'm seventy-eight years old, and I ain't got money enough to buy my wife a pair of shoes. But the farm, Jeremiah. I'll take you, the farm ain't mine, cut in Jeremiah savagely. Look a here, Hester, how do you suppose it feels to a man who's paid his own way since he was a boy, bought a farm with his own money and run it, brought up his boys and educated them? How do you suppose it feels fair that man to go to his own son and say, please, sir, can I have a nickel to buy me a pair of shoestrings? How do you suppose it feels? I'll tell you, Hester. I can't stand it. I just can't. I'm going to work. Jeremiah. Well, I am, repeated the old man doggedly. You're going to have some shoes. 
and I'm going to earn them. See if I don't. And he squared his shoulders and straightened his bent back as if already he felt the weight of a welcome burden. Spring came, and with it long sunny days, and the smell of green things growing. Jeremiah began to be absent day after day from the farmhouse. The few tasks that he performed each morning were soon finished, and after that he disappeared, not to return until night. William wondered a little, but said nothing. Other and more important matters filled his mind. Only Hester noticed that the old man's step grew more languid and his eye more dull, and only Hester knew that at night he was sometimes too tired to sleep, that he could not seem to hit the bed, as he expressed it. It was about this time that Hester began to make frequent visits to the half-dozen farmhouses in the settlement about them. She began to be wonderfully busy these days, too, knitting socks and mittens or piecing up quilts. Sarah Ellen asked her sometimes what she was doing, but Hester's answers were always so cheery and bright that Sarah Ellen did not realize that the point was always evaded and the subject changed. It was in May that the inevitable happened. William came home one day to find an excited, weeping wife who hurried him into the seclusion of their own room. William, William, she moaned. What shall we do? It's father and mother. They've... Oh, William, how can I tell you? And she covered her face with her hands. William paled under his coat of tan. He gripped his wife's arm with fingers that hurt. What is it? What's happened? he asked hoarsely. They aren't hurt or dead? No, no, choked Sarah Ellen. I didn't mean to frighten you. They're all right that way. They, they've gone to work. William, what shall we do? Again William Whipple gripped his wife's arm with fingers that hurt. Sarah Ellen, quit that crying for heaven's sake. What does this mean? What are you talking about? he demanded. Sarah Ellen sopped her eyes with her handkerchief and lifted her head. It was this morning. I was over to Maria Weston's, she explained brokenly. Maria dropped something about a quilt mother was piecing for her, and when I asked her what in the world she meant, she looked queer and said she supposed I knew. Then she tried to change the subject, but I couldn't let her, and finally I got the whole story out of her. Yes, yes, go on, urged William impatiently, as Sarah Ellen paused for breath. It seems mother came to her a while ago, and, and she went to others too. She asked if there wasn't some knitting or patchwork she could do for them. She said she, she wanted to earn some money. Sarah Ellen's voice broke over the last word, and William muttered something under his breath. She said, they've lost all they had in the bank, went on Sarah Ellen hurriedly and that they didn't like to ask you for money. Why, I always let them have, began William defensively. Then he stopped short, a slow red staining his face. Yes, I know you have, interposed Sarah Ellen eagerly. And I said so to Maria, but mother had already told her that, it seems. She said that mother said, you were always glad to give it to them when they asked for it, but that it hurt father's pride to beg, so he'd gone to work to earn some of his own. Father? exclaimed William. But I thought you said that was mother. Surely father isn't knitting socks or mittens, is he? No, no, cried Sarah Ellen. I'm coming to that as fast as I can. You see, that was father who went to work first. He's been doing all sorts of little odd jobs, even to staying with the snow children while their folks went to town, 
and spading up nancy house flower beds for her but it's been wearing on him and he was getting all tired out only think of it william working out father and mother i just can't ever hold up my head again what shall we do do why well stop it of course declared william savagely i guess i can support my own father and mother without their working for a living but it's money william that they want don't you see well we'll give them money then i always have anyway when they ask for it finished william in an aggrieved voice sarah ellen shook her head it won't do she sighed it might have done once but not now they've got to the point where they just can't accept money doled out to them like that why just think it was all theirs once well it's now in a way i know but we haven't acted as if it were i can see that now when it's too late we'll give it back then cried william his face clearing the whole blamed farm sarah ellen frowned she shook her head slowly then paused a dawning question in her eyes you don't suppose william could we she cried with sudden eagerness well we can try mighty hard retorted the man grimly but we've got to go easy sarah ellen no bungling we got to spin some sort of a yarn that won't break nor have any weak places and of course as far as the real work of the farm is concerned we'll still do the most of it but the place be theirs see theirs working out good heavens it must have been a week later that jeremiah burst into his wife's room hester sat by the window bending over numberless scraps of blue red and pink calico put it up put it up hester he panted joyously ya ain't got to sew no more and i ain't neither the farm is ours why jeremiah what how i don't know hester no more than you do laughed jeremiah happily only william says he's tired of running things all alone and he wants me to take hold again they're going to make our papers right away and say hester the bent shoulders drew themselves erect with an air of pride i thought maybe this afternoon we drive over to huntsville and get some shoes for you you know you're always needing shoes End of chapter six chapter seven the lawn road jane yes father is the house locked up yes i is here now why yes dear i just did it well want to see but i have seen father jane did not often make so many words about this little matter but she was particularly tired to-night the old man fell back wearily seems to me jane you may just see he fretted did much i'm asking of you and you know um spoons yes yes dear i'll go interrupted the woman hurriedly and jane yes the woman turned away and waited she knew quite well what was coming but it was the very exquisiteness of her patient care that allowed her to give no sign that she had waited in that same spot to hear those same words every night for long years past and you might count them um spoons said the old man yes and folks yes and then photographs picture is in the parlor all right father the woman turned away her step was slow but confident the last word has been said to jane pendergast her father had gone with the going of his keen clear mind twenty years before this fretful childish exacting old man that pottered about the house all day was but the shell that had held the colonel the casket that had held the jewel but because of what it had held jane guarded it tenderly laying at its feet her life as a willing sacrifice there had been four children edgar the eldest jane mary and fred edgar had left home early and was a successful businessman in boston mary had married a wealthy lawyer of the same city 
and Fred had opened a real estate office in a thriving southern town. Jane had stayed at home. There had been a time, it is true, when she had planned to go away to school, but the death of Mrs. Pendergast left no one at home to care for Mary and Fred, so Jane had abandoned the idea. Later, after Mary had married and Fred had gone away, there was still her father to be cared for, though at this time he was well and strong. Jane had passed her thirty-fifth birthday when she became palpitatingly aware of a pair of blue-gray eyes and a determined smooth-shaven chin belonging to the recently arrived principal of the village school. In spite of her stern admonition to herself to remember her years and not quite lose her head, she was fast drifting into a rosy dream of romance that was all the more enthralling because so belated, when the summons of a small boy brought her sharply back to the realities. "'It's your father, miss. They want you to come,' he panted. "'Something has took him. He's in make his drug store, talking awful queer. He and himself, you know. They thought maybe you could, could do something.' Jane went at once, but she could do nothing except to lead gently home the chattering, shifting-eyed thing that had once been her father. One after another the village physicians shook their heads. They could do nothing. Skilled alienists from the city, they too could do nothing. There was pr nothing that could be done, they said, except to care for him as one would for a child. He would live years, probably. His constitution was wonderfully good. He would not be violent, just foolish and childish, with perhaps a growing irritability as the years passed and his physical strength failed. Mary and Edgar had come home at once. Mary had stayed two days and Edgar five hours. They were shocked and dismayed at their father's condition. So overwhelmed with grief were they, indeed, that they fled from the room almost immediately upon seeing him, and Edgar took the first train out of town. Mary shiveringly crept from room to room, trying to find a place where the cackling laugh and the fretful voice would not reach her. But the old man, like a child with a new toy, was pleased at his daughter's arrival and followed her about the house with unfailing persistence. "'But, Mary, he won't hurt you. Why do you run?' remonstrated Jane. Mary shuddered and covered her face with her hands. "'Jane, Jane, how can you take it so calmly?' she moaned. "'How can you bear it?' There was a moment's pause. A curious expression had come to Jane's face. "'Someone has to,' she said at last, quietly. Jane went down to the village the next afternoon, leaving her sister in charge at home. When she returned an hour later, Mary met her at the gate, crying and wringing her hands. "'Jane, Jane, I thought you would never come. I can't do a thing with him. He insists that he isn't at home and that he wants to go there. I told him over and over again that he was at home already, but he didn't do a bit of good. I've had a perfectly awful time.' "'Yes, I know. Where is he?' I "'In the kitchen. I, I tied him. He just would go, and I couldn't hold him. Oh, Mary!' and Jane fairly flew up the walk to the kitchen door. A minute later she appeared, leading an old man who was whimpering pitifully. Oh, Jane, I want to go home. Yes, dear, I know. We'll go. And Mary watched with wandering eyes while the two walked down the path through the gate and across the street to the next corner, then slowly crossed again and came back through the familiar doorway. Home, chuckled the old man gleefully. We've come home. Mary went back to Boston the next day. She said it was fortunate indeed that Jane's nerves were so strong. For her part, she could not have stood it another day. The day slipped into weeks and weeks into months. Jane took the entire care of her father, except that she hired a woman to come in for an hour or two once or twice a week, when she herself was obliged to leave the house. The owner of the blue-gray eyes did not belie the determination of his chin, but made a valiant effort to establish himself on the basis of the old intimacy. But Miss Pendergast held herself sternly aloof and refused to listen to him. In a year he had left town, but it was not his fault that he was obliged to go away alone, as Jane Pendergast well knew. One by one the years passed. Twenty had gone by now since the small boy came with fateful summons that June day. Jane was fifty-five now, a thin-faced, stoop-shouldered, tired woman, but a woman to whom release from this constant care was soon to come, for she was not yet fifty-six when her father died. 
all the children and some of the grandchildren came to the funeral. In the evening the family, with the exception of Jane, gathered in the sitting-room and discussed the future, while upstairs the woman, whose fate was most concerned, laid herself wearily in bed, with almost a pang that she need not first be doubly sure that doors were locked and spoons were counted. In the sitting-room below, discussion waxed warm. "'But what shall we do with her?' demanded Mary. "'I had meant to give her my share of property,' she added with an air of great generosity. "'But it seems there is nothing to give.' "'No, there is nothing to give,' returned Edgar. "'The house had to be mortgaged long ago to pay their living expenses, and it will have to be sold. "'But she's got to live somewhere.' Mary's voice was fretful, questioning. For a moment there was silence. Then Edgar stirred in his chair. "'Well, why can't she go to you, Mary?' he asked. "'Me?' Mary almost screamed the word. "'Why, Edgar, when you know how much I have on my hands with my great house and all my social duties, to say nothing of Bell's engagement? Well, maybe Jane could help.' "'Help? How, pray, to entertain my guests?' And even Edgar smiled as he thought of Jane in her five-year-old bonnet and her ten-year-old black gown, standing in the receiving light at an exclusive Commonwealth Avenue reception. "'Well, but—' Edgar paused impotently. "'Why don't you take her?' It was Mary who made the suggestion. "'I—oh, but I—' Edgar stopped and glanced uneasily at his wife. "'Why, of course, if it's necessary,' murmured Mrs. Edgar with a resigned air. I should certainly never wish it said that I refused a home to any of my husband's poor relations. Oh, good heavens! Let her come to us, cut in Fred sharply. I reckon we can take care of our poor relations, for a spell yet, huh, Sally? Why, sure we can, retorted Fred's wife in her soft southern drawl. We'll be right glad to take her, I reckon. And the, there the matter ended. Jane Pendergast had been south two months when one day Edgar received a letter from his brother Fred. "'Jane's going north,' wrote Fred. "'Sally says she can't have her in the house another week. "'Course, we don't want to tell Jane exactly that, "'but we've fixed it, so she's going to leave. "'I'm sorry if this move causes you folks any trouble, "'but there just wasn't any other way out of it. "'You see, Sally is southern and easy-going, "'and I suppose not over-particular in the eyes of your Steve Northerners.' I don't mind things either, and I suppose I'm easy too. Well, great Scott, Jane hadn't been down here five minutes before she began to slick up, as she called it, and she's been slicking up ever since. Sally always left things around handy, and so have the children, but since Jane came we haven't been able to find a thing when we wanted it. All our boots and shoes are put away, turned toes out, and all our hats and coats are snatched up and hung on pegs the minute we toss them off. Maybe this don't seem much to you, but it's lots to us. Anyhow, Jane's going north. She says she's going to visit Edgar a little while, and I told her I'd write and tell you she's coming. She'll be there about the twentieth. We'll wire you what train. Your affectionate brother, Fred. As gently as possible, Edgar broke to his wife the news of the prospective guest. Julia Pendergast was a good woman. At least, she often said that she was, adding, at the same time, that she never knowingly refused to her duty. She said the same thing now to her husband, and she immediately made some very elaborate and very apparent changes in her home and in her plans, all with an eye to the expected guest. At four o'clock Wednesday afternoon, Edgar met his sister at the station. "'Well, I don't see as you've changed much,' he said kindly. "'Haven't I?' "'Why, seems as if I must look changed a lot,' cheer up Jane. "'I'm so rested, and Fred and Sally were so good to me. "'Why, they tried not to have me do a thing, "'and I didn't do much, only a little, little puttering around "'just to help out with the work.' "'Hm,' murmured Edgar. "'Well, I'm glad to see you rested.' "'Julia met them in the hall of the beautiful Brookline residence. "'Lined up with her were the four younger children who lived at home.' They made an imposing array, and Jane was visibly affected. "'Oh, it's so good of you to meet me like this,' she faltered. "'Why, we wish to, I'm sure,' returned Mrs. Pendergast, with a half-stifled sigh. "'I hope I understand my duty to my guest and my sister-in-law sufficiently to know what is her due. I did not allow anything, not even my committee meeting today, to interfere with this call for duty at home.' Jane fell back. All the glow fled from her face. 
Oh, then you did stay at home, and for me, I'm so sorry, she stammered. But Mrs. Pendergast raised a deprecatory hand. Say no more. It was nothing. Now come, let me show you to your room. I have given you Ella's room, and put Ella in Tom's and Tom in Bert's, and moved Bert upstairs to the little room over. Oh, don't, interrupted Jane, in quick distress. I don't want to put people out so. Let me go upstairs. Mrs. Pendergast frowned and sighed. She had the air of one whose kindest efforts are misunderstood. My dear Jane, I am sorry, but I shall have to ask you to be as satisfied as you can be with the arrangements I am able to make for you. You see, even though this house is large, I am in a way cramped for room. I always have to keep three guest rooms ready for immediate occupancy. I am a member of four clubs and six charitable and religious organizations, besides the church, and there are always ministers and delegates whom I feel it my duty to entertain. But that is all the more reason why I should go upstairs and not put all those children out of their rooms, begged Jane. Mrs. Pendergast shook her head. It does them good, she said decidedly, to learn to be self-sacrificing. That is a virtue we all must learn to practice. Jane flushed again. Then she turned abruptly. Julia, did you want me to... to come to see you? she asked. Why, certainly, what a question! returned Mrs. Pendergast in a properly shocked tone of voice, as if I could do otherwise than to want my husband's sister to come to us. Jane smiled faintly, but her eyes were troubled. Thank you. I am glad you feel that way. You see, at Fred's, I wouldn't have them know it for the world. They were so good to me, but I thought lately that maybe they didn't want. But it wasn't so, of course. It couldn't have been. I... I ought not even to think it. Hm, no, returned Mrs. Pendergast with noncommittal briefness. Not six weeks later, Mary, in her beautiful Commonwealth Avenue home, received a call from a little, thin-faced woman, who curtsied to the butler and asked him to please tell her sister that she wished to speak to her. Mary looked worried and not over cordial when she rustled into the room. Why, Jane, did you find your way here all alone? she cried. Yes. No, well, I asked a man at the last, but you know, I've been here twice before with the others. Yes, I know, said Mary. There was a pause. Then Jane cleared her throat timidly. Mary, I, I've been thinking. You see, just as soon as I'm strong enough, I, I'm going to take care of myself, and then I won't be a burden to, to anybody. Jane was talking very fast now. Her words came tremulously between short, broken breaths. But until I get well enough to earn money, I can't, you see. And I've been thinking, uh, would you be willing to take me until, until I can? I'm lots better already and getting stronger every day. It wouldn't be for long. Why, of course, Jane. Mary spoke cheerfully and in a tone a little higher than her ordinary voice. I should have asked to you to come here before, only I feared you wouldn't be happy here. Such a different life for you, and so much noise and confusion with Belle's wedding coming on and all. Jane gave her a grateful glance. I know, of course. You'd think that. And it isn't that I'm finding fault with Julia and Edgar. I couldn't do that. They're so good to me. But you see, I put them out, so... Now there is my room, for one thing. It was Ella's, and Ella has to keep running in for things she's left, and she says it's the same with the others. You see, I've got Ella's room, and Ella's got Tom's, and Tom's got Bert's. It's a regular house that Jack built, and I am the Jack. I see, laughed Mary constrainedly. And you want to come here? Well, you shall. You, mm, you may come a week from Saturday, she added after a pause. I have a reception and a dinner here the first of the week, and you'd better stay away until after that. Oh, thank you, sighed Jane. You are so good. I shall tell Julia that I am invited here, so she won't think I am dissatisfied. They are so good to me. I wouldn't want to hurt their feelings. Of course not, murmured Mary. The big fat tire of the touring car popped like a pistol shot directly in front of the large white house with the green blinds. This is the time we're in luck, Belle, laughed the good-natured young fellow who had been driving the car. Do you see that big piazza just taking for you to come and sit on it? Are we really stalled, Will? asked the girl. 
Looks like it, for a while. I'll have to phone Peters to bring down a tire. Of course, today is the day we didn't take it. Some minutes later, the girl found herself on the cool piazza in charge of a wonderfully hospitable old lady, while down the road the good-looking young fellow was making long strides toward the next house and a telephone. We are staying at the Lindsay's in North Belton, explained the girl when he was gone, and we came out for a little spin before dinner. Isn't this Belton? I have an aunt who used to live here somewhere, Aunt Jane Pendergast. The old lady sat suddenly erect in her chair. My dear, she cried, you don't mean to say that you're Jane Pendergast's niece. Now that is queer. Why, this was her very house. We bought it when the old gentleman died last year. But come, we'll go inside. You'll want to see everything, of course. It was some time before the young man came back from telephoning, and it was longer still before Peters came with the new tire and helped get the touring car ready for the road. The girl was very quiet when they finally left the house, and there was a troubled look deep in her eyes. "'Why, Belle, what's the matter?' asked the young fellow concernedly as he slackened speed in the cool twilight of the woods some minutes later. "'What's troubling you, dear?' "'Will,' the girl's voice shook, Will, that was Aunt Jane's house, that, I, that old lady told me. Aunt Jane? Yes, yes, the little grey-haired woman that came to live with us two months ago. You know her. Why, yes, I think I've seen her. The girl winced as from a blow. Will, don't. I can't bear it, she choked. It only shows how we've treated her, how little we've made of her, when we ought to have done everything, everything to make her happy. Instead of that, we were brutes, all of us. Bell, the tone was an indignant protest. But we were, listen. She lived in that house all her life till last year. She never went anywhere or did anything. For twenty years she lived with an old man who had lost his mind, and she tended him like a baby. Only a baby grows older all the time and more interesting, while he... Oh, Will, it was awful. That old lady told me. By Jove, exclaimed the young fellow under his breath. And there were other things, hurried on the girl tremulously. Some way I never thought of Aunt Jane only as old and timid, but she was young like us once. She wanted to go away to school, but she couldn't go. And there was someone who loved her once later, and she sent him away. That was after, after Grandfather lost his mind. Mother and Uncle Edgar and Uncle Fred, they all went away and lived their own lives, but she stayed on. Then, last year, Grandfather died. The girl paused and moistened her lips. The man did not speak. His eyes were on the road ahead of the slow-moving car. I heard today how, how proud and happy Aunt Jane was that Uncle Fred had asked her to come and live with him, resumed the girl after a minute. The old lady told me how Aunt Jane talked and talked about it before she went away, and how she said that all her life she had taken care of others, and it, it would be so good to feel that now someone was going to look out for her, though, of course, she should do everything she could to help, and she hoped she could still be of some use. Well, she has been, hasn't she? The girl shook her head. That's the worst of it. We haven't made her think she was. She stayed at Uncle Fred's for a while, and then he sent her to Uncle Edgar's. Something must have been wrong there, for she asked Mother two months ago if she might come to us. Well, I'm sure you've been good to her. But we haven't, cried the girl. Mother meant all right, I know, but she didn't think. And I've been horrid. Aunt Jane tried to show her interest in my wedding plans, but I only laughed at her and said she wouldn't understand. We've pushed her aside, always. You've never made her one of us, and we've always made her feel her dependence. But you'll do differently now, dear, now that you understand. Again the girl shook her head. We can't, she moaned. It's too late. I had a letter from Mother last night. Aunt Jane's sick, awfully sick. Mother said I might expect to, to hear of the end any day. But there is some time left, a little. His voice broke and choked into silence. Suddenly he made a quick movement, and the car beneath them leaped forward like a charger that fills the prick of the spur. The girl gave a frightened cry, then a tremulous little sob of joy. The man had cried in her ear in response to her questioning eyes. We're going to Aunt Jane! 
and to them both at the moment there seemed to be waiting at the end of the road a little bent old woman into whose wistful eyes they were to bring the light of joy and peace end of the long road chapter eight a couple of capitalists on the top of the hill stood the big brick house a mansion compared to the other houses of the new england village at the foot of the hill nestled the tiny brown farmhouse half buried in lilacs climbing roses and hollyhocks years ago when reuben had first brought emily to that little brown cottage he had said to her ruefully sweetheart tain't much of a place i know but we'll save and save every cent we can get and by and by we'll go up to live in the big house on the hill and he kissed her so tenderly, the pretty little woman he had married only that morning, that she smiled brightly and declared that the small brown house was the very nicest place in the world. But as time passed, the big house came to be the mecca of all their hopes, and penny by penny the savings grew. It was slow work, though, and to hearts less courageous the thing would have seemed an impossibility. No luxuries, and scarcely the bare necessities of life, came to the little house under the hill. But every month a tiny sum found its way into the savings bank. Fortunately, air and sunshine were cheap, and if inside the house there was a lack of beauty and cheer, outside there was a riotous wealth of color and bloom. The flowers under Emily's loving care flourished and multiplied. The few gowns in the modest trousseau had been turned inside out and upside down, only to be dyed and turned and twisted all over again. But what was a dyed gown, when one had all the money in the bank and the big house on the hill in prospect? Reuben's best suit grew rusty and seedy, but the man patiently, even gleefully, wore it as long as it would hang together, and when the time came that new garments must be bought for both husband and wife, only the cheapest and flimsiest of material was purchased but the money in the bank grew. Reuben never smoked. While other men used the fragrant weed to calm their weary brains and bodies, Reuben ate peanuts. It had been a curious passion of his from the time when, as a boy, he was first presented with a penny for his very own to spend all his spare cash on this peculiar luxury and the slow munching of this plebeian delicacy had the same soothing effect on him that a good cigar or an old clay pipe had upon his brother-man but from the day of his marriage all this was changed the dimes and the nickels bought no more peanuts but went to swell the common fund it is doubtful if even this heroic economy would have accomplished the desired end had not a certain railroad company cast envious eyes upon the level valley and forthwith sent long arms of steel bearing a puffing engine up through the quiet village a large tract of waste land belonging to reuben gray suddenly became surprisingly valuable and a sum that trebled twice over the scanty savings of years grew all in a night one crisp october day Mr. and Mrs. Reuben Gray awoke to the fact that they were a little under sixty years of age, and in possession of more than the big sum of money necessary to enable them to carry out the dreams of their youth. They began joyous preparations at once. The big brick house at the top of the hill had changed hands twice during the last forty years, and the present owner expressed himself as nothing loath to part, not only with the house itself, but with many of its furnishings and before the winter snow fell the little brown cottage was sold to a thrifty young couple from the neighbouring village, and the greys took up their abode in their new home. "'Well, Emily, this is living now, ain't it?' said Reuben, as he carefully let himself down into the depths of a velvet-covered chair in the great parlour. "'My, ain't this nice!' "'Just perfectly lovely!' quavered the thin voice of his wife, as she threw a surreptitious glance at Reuben's shoes to see if they were quite clean enough for such sacred precincts. It was their first evening in their new abode, and they were a little weary, for they had spent the entire day in exploring every room, peering into every closet, and trying every chair the establishment contained. It was still quite early when they trudged anxiously about the house, intent on fastening the numerous doors and windows. 
dear me, exclaimed the little woman nervously. I'm most afraid to go to bed, Reuben, for fear someone will break in and steal all these nice things. Well, you can sit up if you want to, replied the husband dryly, but I shall go to bed. Most of these things have been here all night twenty years, and I guess they'll last the night through. And he marched solemnly upstairs to the big east chamber, meekly followed by his wife. It was the next morning when Mrs. Gray was washing the breakfast dishes that her husband came in at the kitchen door and stood looking thoughtfully at her. "'Say, Emily,' said he, "'you ought to have a hired girl. Tain't your place to be doing work like this now.' Mrs. Gray gasped, half terrified, half pleased, and shook her head, but her husband would not be silenced. "'Well, you had and you got to, too, and you must buy some new clothes, lots of them. Why, Emily, We've got heaps of money now, and we hadn't ought to wear such looking things. Emily nodded. She had thought of this before, and the hired girl hint must have found a warm spot in her heart in which to grow, for that very afternoon she sallied forth, intent on a visit to her counselor on all occasions, the doctor's wife. Well, Miss Steele, I don't know what to do. Reuben says I ought to have a hired girl but I hain't no more idea where to get one than anything, and I don't knows I want one if I did. And Mrs. Gray sat back in her chair and rocked violently to and fro, eyeing her hostess with the evident consciousness of having presented a poser. That resourceful woman, however, was far from being nonplussed. She beamed upon her visitor with a joyful smile. Just the thing, my dear Mrs. Gray. "'You know I am to go south with May for the winter. "'The house will be closed and the doctor at the hotel. "'I had just been wondering what to do with Nancy, "'for I want her again in the spring. "'Now you can have her until then, "'and by that time you will know how you like the idea of keeping a girl. "'She is a perfect treasure, "'capable of carrying along the entire work of the household, "'only,' and Mrs. Steele paused long enough "'to look doubtfully at her friend, "'she is a little independent.' and won't stand much interference. Fifteen minutes later, Mrs. Gray departed, well pleased, though withal a little frightened. She spent the rest of the afternoon in trying to decide between black alpaca and a green cashmere dress. That night, Reuben brought home a large bag of peanuts and put them down in triumph on the kitchen table. There, he announced in high glee, I'm gonna to have a bang up good time. Why, Reuben, remonstrated his wife gently. You can't eat them things. You ain't got no teeth to chew em with. The man's lower jaw dropped. Well, I'm going to try it anyhow, he insisted. And try he did. But the way his poor old stomach rebelled against the half-masticated things effectually prevented a repetition of the feast. Early on Monday morning, Nancy appeared. Mrs. Gray assumed a brave aspect, but she quaked in her shoes as she showed the big strapping girl to her room. Five minutes later, Nancy came into the kitchen to find Mrs. Gray bending over an obstinate coal fire in the range. With neither coal nor range was the little woman in the least familiar. "'There now,' said Nancy, briskly. "'I'll fix that. You just tell me what you want for dinner, and I can find the things myself.' and she attacked the stove with such a clatter and din that Mrs. Gray retreated in terror, murmuring, hey, ham and eggs, if you please, as she fled through the door. Once in the parlor, she seated herself in the middle of the room and thought how nice it was not to get dinner, but she jumped nervously at every sound from the kitchen. On Tuesday, she had mastered her fear sufficiently to go into the kitchen and make a cottage cheese. She did not notice the unfavorable glances of her maid of all work. Wednesday morning she spent happily pattering over doing up some handkerchiefs, and wondered why Nancy kept banging the oven door so often. Thursday she made a special kind of pie that Reuben liked, and remarked pointedly to Nancy that she herself never washed dishes without wearing an extra apron. Furthermore, she always placed the pans the other way in the sink. Friday she rearranged the tins on the pantry shelves that Nancy had so unaccountably mussed up. On Saturday the inevitable explosion came. "'If you please, ma'am, I'm willing to do your work. 
but it seems to me it don't make no difference to you whether I wear one apron or six, or whether I hang my dish towels on a string or on the bars, or whether I wash goblets or kittles first, and I ain't in the habit of having folks spying round on me. If you want me to go, I'll go, but if I stay, I want to be let alone. Poor little Mrs. Gray fled to her seat in the parlor, and for the rest of that winter she did not dare to call her soul her own, but her table was beautifully set and served, and her house was as neat as wax. The weeks passed, and Reuben began to be restless. One day he came in from the post office fairly bubbling over with excitement. Say, Emily, when folks have money they travel. Let's go somewhere. Well, Reuben, where? quavered his wife, dropping into the nearest chair. Oh, I don't know, with cheerful vagueness, then suddenly animated. Let's go to Boston and see the sights. But, Reuben, we don't know no one there ventured his wife, doubtfully. Pooh! What if we don't? Hain't we got money? Can't we stay at a hotel? Well, I guess we can. And his overwhelming courage put some semblance of confidence into the more timid heart of his wife, until by the end of the week she was as eager as he. Nancy was tremblingly requested to take a two-weeks vacation, and great was the rejoicing when she graciously acquiesced. On a bright February morning the journey began. It was not a long one, four hours only, and time flew by as on wings of the wind. Reuben assumed an air of worldly wisdom, quite awe-inspiring to his wife. He had visited Boston as a boy, and so had a dim idea of what to expect. Moreover, he had sold stock and produce in the large towns near his home, and on the whole felt quite self-sufficient. As the long train drew into the station and they alighted and followed the crowd, Mrs. Gray looked with round eyes of wonder at the people. She had not realized that there were so many in the world, and she clung closer and closer to Reuben, who was marching along with a fine show of indifference. There, said he, as he deposited his wife and his bags in a seat in the huge waiting room. Now, you stay right here and don't you move. I'm going to find out about hotels and things. He was gone so long that she was nearly fainting from fright before she spied his dear form coming toward her. His thin, plain face looked wonderfully beautiful to her, and she almost hugged him right before all those people. Well, I've got a hotel all right, but I hain't been here so long I've kind of forgot about the streets, so the man said we'd better have a team to take us there. And he picked up the bags and trudged off, closely followed by Emily. His shrewd Yankee wit carried him safely through a bargain with the driver, and they were soon jolting and rumbling along to their destination. He had asked the man behind the newsstand about a hotel, casually mentioning that he had money, plenty of it, and wanted a bang-up good place. The spirit of mischief had entered the heart of the newsman, and he had given Reuben the name of one of the very highest-priced, most luxurious hotels in the city. As the carriage stopped, Reuben marched boldly up the broad steps and entered the palatial office, with Emily close at his heels. Two bellboys sprang forward, the one to take the bags, the other to offer to show Mrs. Gray to the reception room. "'No, thank you, I ain't particular,' she said sweetly. "'I'll wait for Reuben here,' and she dropped into the nearest chair, while her husband advanced toward the desk. She noticed that men were looking curiously at her, and she felt relieved when Reuben and the pretty boy came back and said they would go up to their room. She stood the elevator pretty well, though she gave a little gasp, which she tried to choke into a cough as it started. Reuben turned to the boy. "'Where can I get something to eat?' "'Luncheon is being served in the main dining room on the first floor, sir.' Visions of a lunch as he knew it in Emily's pantry came to mind, and he looked a little dubious. "'Well,' I'm pretty hungry, but if that's all I can get, I suppose it will have to do. Ten minutes later, an officious head waiter, whom Emily looked upon with timid awe, was seating them in a superbly appointed dining room. Reuben looked at the menu doubtfully, while an attentive, soft-voiced man at his elbow bent low to catch his order. Few of the strange-looking words conveyed any sort of meaning to the poor, hungry man. At length spying chicken halfway down the card, he pointed to it in relief. "'I'll guess I'll take some of that,' he said briefly. Then he added, "'I don't know how much it costs. You hain't got no price after it.' The waiter comprehended at once. 
The luncheon is served in courses, sir. You pay for the whole whether you eat it or not, he added shrewdly. If you will let me serve you according to my judgment, sir, I think I can please you. And there the forlorn little couple sat, amazed and hungry, through six courses, each one of which seemed to their uneducated palate one degree worse than the last. Two hours later they started for a long walk down the wonderful, fascinating street. Each marvellous window display came in for its full share of attention, but they stood longest before bakeries and restaurants. Finally, upon coming to one of the latter, where an enticing sign announced, Boiled dinner today, served hot at all hours. Reuben could endure it no longer. By jinx, Emily, I just gotta have some of that. That stodged up mess I ate at the hotel didn't go to the spot at all. Come on, let's have a good square meal. The hotel knew them just one night. The next morning before breakfast, Reuben manfully paid his, to him astounding, bill, and departed for more congenial quarters, which they soon found on a neighboring side street. The rest of the visit was, of course, delightful, only the streets were pretty crowded and noisy, and they couldn't sleep very well at night. Moreover, Reuben lost his pocketbook with a small sum of money in it, so, on the whole, they concluded to go home a little before the two weeks ended. When spring came, Nancy returned to her former mistress, and her vacant throne remained unoccupied. Little by little the dust gathered on the big velvet chairs in the parlor, and the room was opened less and less. When the first green things commenced to send tender shoots up through the wet brown earth, Reuben's restlessness was very noticeable. By and by he began to go off very early in the morning, returning at noon for a hasty dinner, then away again till night. To his wife's repeated questioning he would reply, sheepishly, Oh, just loafing, that's all. And Emily was nervous, too. Of late she had taken a great fancy to a daily walk and it always led in one direction down past the little brown house of course she glanced over the fence at the roses and lilacs and she couldn't help seeing that they all looked sadly neglected by and by the weeds came grew and multiplied and every time she passed the gate her throat fairly choked in sympathy with her old pets evenings she and reuben spent very happily on the back stoop talking of their great good fortune in being able to live in such a fine large house somehow they said more than usual about it this spring and reuben often mentioned how glad he was that his wife didn't have to dig in the garden any more and emily would reply that she too was glad that he was having so easy a time then they would look down at the little brown farmhouse and wonder how they had ever managed to get along in so tiny a place one day in passing this same little house emily stopped a moment and leaned over the gate that she might gain a better view of her favorite rose-bush she evinced the same interest the next two mornings and on the third she timidly opened the gate and walked up the old path to the door a buxom woman with a big baby in her arms and a bigger one hanging to her skirts answered her knock how do you do miss gray won't you come in she said civilly, looking mildly surprised. "'No, thank you. Ye yes, I mean, I, I came to see you,' stammered Emily, confusedly. "'You're very good,' murmured the woman, still standing in the doorway. "'Your flowers are so pretty,' ventured Mrs. Gray, unable to keep the wistfulness out of her voice. "'Do you think so?' carelessly. "'I suppose they need weedin'. What with my babies and all, I don't get much time for posies.' "'Oh, please, would it be too much trouble to let me come and putter round in the beds?' queried the little woman eagerly. "'Oh, I would like it so much.' The other laughed heartily. "'Well, I really don't see how it's going to trouble me to have you weeding my flowers. In fact, I should think the shoe would be on the other foot.' Then the red showed in her face a little. "'You're welcome to do whatever you want, Miss Gray.' "'Oh, thank you.' exclaimed Emily, as she quickly pulled up an enormous weed at her feet. It took but a few hours' work to bring about a wonderfully happy change in that forlorn garden, and then Mrs. Gray found that she had a big pile of weeds to dispose of. Filling her apron with a portion of them, she started to go behind the house in search of a garbage heap. Around the corner she came face to face with her husband, hoe in hand. Why, Reuben Gray, whatever in the world are you doing? For a moment the man was crushed with the enormity of his crime. Then he caught sight of his wife's 
dirt-stained fingers. "'Well, I guess I ain't doing no worse than you be.' And he turned his back and began to hoe vigorously. Emily dropped the weeds where she stood, turned about, and walked through the garden up the hill, pondering many things. Supper was strangely quiet that night. Mrs. Gray had asked a single question. "'Reuben, do you want the little house back?' A glad light leaped into the old man's eyes. "'Emily, would you be willing to?' After the supper dishes were put away, Mrs. Gray, with a light shawl over her head, came to her husband on the back stoop. "'Come, dear, I think we'd better go down tonight.' A few minutes later they sat stiffly in the best room of the farmhouse, while the buxom woman and her husband looked wonderingly at them. "'You want thinking of sailing, was ye?' began Reuben, insinuatingly. The younger man's eyelids quivered a little. "'Well, no, I can't hardly say that I was. I ain't but just bought.' Reuben hitched his chair a bit and glanced at Emily. "'Well, me and my wife have concluded that we're too old to transplant. We don't seem to take root very easy, and we've been thinking, would you swap even now? It must have been a month later that Reuben Gray and his wife were contentedly sitting in the old, familiar kitchen of the little brown house. I've been wondering, Reuben, said his wife, I've been wondering if twouldn't have been just as well if we'd taken some of the good things while they was going, before we got too old to enjoy em. Yes, peanuts, for instance, acquiesced her husband ruefully. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 In the Footsteps of Katie Only Alma had lived. Alma, the last-born. The other five, one after another, had slipped from loving, clinging arms into the great silence, leaving worse than a silence behind them and neither Nathan Kelsey nor his wife Mary could have told you which hurt the more, the saying of a last goodbye to a stalwart grown lad of twenty, or the folding of tiny waxen hands over a heart that had not counted a year of beating, yet both had fallen to their lot. As for Alma, Alma carried in her dainty self all the love, hopes, tenderness, ambitions, prayers that otherwise would have been bestowed upon six, and Alma was coming home. "'Mary,' said Nathan one June evening, as he and his wife sat on the back porch, "'I saw Jim Hopkins today. Katie's got home.' "'Hm,' the low rocker swayed gently to and fro. "'Katie's been to college, same as Alma, you know.' "'Yes, and—' And that's what Jim was talking about. He was feeling bad, powerful bad. Bad? The rocker stopped abruptly. Why, Nathan? Yes, he... There was a pause. Then the words came with the rush of a desperation. He said home, want like home no more. That Katie was as good as gold, and they was proud of her, but she was terrible upsetting. Jim has to rig up nights now to eat supper, put on his coat and a biled collar, and he says he's got so he don't dast to open his head. They're all so to Miss Hopkins and Sue and Aunt Jane. Don't none of them dast to speak. Why, Nathan, why not? Cause of Katie. Jim says there don't nothing they say suit Katie. About its wordin', I mean. She changes it and tells them what they'd oughter say. Why, the saucy little baggage. The rocker resumed its swaying, and Mary Kelsey's foot came down on the porch floor with decided rhythmic pats. The man stirred restlessly. But she ain't sassy, Mary, he demurred. Jim says Katie's that sweet and pleasant about it that you can't do nothing. She tells them she's correcting them for their own good and that they need culturin', and Jim says she spends all a meal time tellin' em about the things on the table, salt and where folks get it, and pepper and tumblers, and how folks makes em. He says at first twas kind of nice, and he liked to hear it, but now seems as he ain't got no appetite left every time he sits down to the table. 
he don't relish eating such big words and queer names. And that ain't all, resumed Nathan, after a pause for breath. Jim can't go hoeing nor digging, but she'll foller him and tell about the bugs and worms he turns up. How many legs they've got and all that. And the moon ain't just a moon no more, and the stars ain't stars. They're spears and planets with heathenish names and rings and orbits. Jim feels bad, powerful bad, about it. And he says he can't see no way out of it. He knows they hain't had much school in any of them only Katie, and he says that sometimes he most wishes that that she hadn't neither. Nathan Kelsey's voice had sunk almost to a whisper, and with the last words his eyes sent a furtive glance toward the stoop-shouldered little figure in the low rocker. The chair was motionless now, and its occupant sat picking at a loose thread in the gingham apron. I, I wouldn't have spoke of it, stammered the man with painful hesitation, only, well, you see, I, you, he stopped helplessly. I know, faltered the little woman. You was thinking of Alma. She wouldn't do it. Alma wouldn't, retorted the man sharply, almost before his wife had ceased speaking. No, no, of course not. But, Nathan, ye don't think Alma'd ever be ashamed of us, do ye? "'Course not,' asserted Nathan, but his voice shook. "'Don't ye worry, Mary,' he comforted. "'Alma ain't a-goin' to do no correctin' of us.' "'Nathan, I think that's correctin,' suggested the woman a little breathlessly. The man turned and gazed at his wife without speaking. Then his jaw fell. "'Well, by sugar, Mary, you ain't a-goin' to begin it, be ye?' he demanded." Why, no, of course not, she laughed confusedly, and, and Alma wouldn't. Of course Alma wouldn't, echoed her husband. Come, it's time to shut up the house. The date of Alma's expected arrival was yet a week ahead. As the days passed, there came a curious restlessness to the movements of both Nathan and his wife. It was on the last night of that week of waiting that Mrs. Kelsey spoke. Nathan, she began, with forced courage, I've been over to Miss Hopkins's and asked her what special things twas that Katie set such store by. I thought maybe if we knew em beforehand and could do em and... That's just what I asked Jim today, Mary, cut in Nathan excitedly. Nathan, you didn't now. Oh, I'm so glad. And we'll do em, won't we, just to please her? Course we will. You see, it's four years since she was here, Nathan. What with her teaching summers? Sugar now, is it? It ain't seemed so long. Nathan, interposed Mrs. Kelsey anxiously. I think that hain't, ain't, I mean aren't, right. I think you'd order say it haven't seemed so long. The man frowned and made an impatient gesture. Yes, yes, I know, soothed his wife. But, well, we might just as well begin now and get used to it. Miss Hopkins said that them two words, hain't and ain't, was what Katie hated most of anything. Yes, Jim mentioned them too, acknowledged Nathan gloomily. But he said that even them wasn't half so bad as his rigging up nights. He said that, Katie said that after the toil of the day, they must don fresh garments and come to the evening meal with minds and bodies refreshed. Yes, and Nathan, ain't my black silk? Ahem, I'm a-thinkin' it warn't me that said hain't that time, interposed Nathan. Dear, dear, Nathan, did I? Oh, dear, what will Alma say? It don't make no difference what Alma says, Mary. Don't ye fret, returned the man with sudden sharpness as he rose to his feet. I guess Alma'll have to take us bowed as we be, bowed as we be. Yet it was Nathan who asked, just as his wife was dropping off to sleep that night. Mary, is it three of them collars I've got? Or four? Biled ones, I mean. 
At five o'clock the next afternoon, Mrs. Kelsey put on the treasured black silk dress, sacred for a dozen years to church, weddings, and funerals. Nathan, warm and uncomfortable in his Sunday suit and stiff collar, had long since driven to the station for Alma. The house, brushed and scrubbed into a state of speckless order, was thrown wide open to welcome the returning daughter. At a quarter before six she came. "'Mother, you darling!' cried a voice, and Mrs. Kelsey found herself in the clasp of strong young arms and gazing into a flushed, eager face. "'Don't you look good? Doesn't everything look good?' finished the girl. "'Does it? I mean, do it?' quavered the little woman excitedly. "'Oh, Alma, I am glad to see you.' Behind Alma's back, Nathan flicked a bit of dust from his coat. The next instant he raised a furtive hand and gave his collar and neckband a savage pull. At the supper table that night, ten minutes of eager questioning on the part of Alma had gone by before Mrs. Kelsey realized that thus far their conversation had been of nothing more important than Nathan's rheumatism, her health, and the welfare of Rover, Tabby, and the mare Topsy. Commensurate with the happiness that had been hers during those ten minutes came now her remorse. She hastened to make amends. There, there, Alma. I beg your pardon, I'm sure. I hain't, er, er, I haven't meant to keep you talking on such trifling things, dear. Now talk to us yourself. Tell us about things, anything, anything on the table or in the room, she finished feverishly. For a moment, the merry-faced girl stared in frank amazement at her mother. Then she laughed gleefully. On the table? In the room? she retorted. Well, it's the dearest room ever and looks so good to me. As for the table, the rolls are feathers, the coffee is nectar, and the strawberries, well, the strawberries are just strawberries. They couldn't be nicer. Oh, Alma, but I didn't mean. Tut, tut, tut interrupted Alma laughingly, just as if the cook didn't like her handiwork praised. Why, when I draw a picture, oh, and I haven't told you, she broke off excitedly. The next instant she was on her feet. Alma Mead Kelsey, illustrator, at your service, she announced with a low bow. Then she dropped into her seat again and went on speaking. You see, I've been doing this sort of thing for some time, she explained and have had some success in selling. My teacher has always encouraged me in acting on his advice. I stayed over in New York a week with a friend and took some of my work to the big publishing houses. That's why I didn't get here as soon as Kate Hopkins did. I hated to put off my coming, but now I'm so glad I did. Only think, I sold every single thing, and I have orders and orders ahead. Well, by sugar, ejaculated the man at the head of the table. Oh, breathed the little woman opposite. Oh, Alma, I'm so glad. In spite of Mrs. Kelsey's protests that night after supper, Alma tripped about the kitchen and pantry, wiping the dishes and putting them away. At dusk, father, mother, and daughter seated themselves on the back porch. There, sighed Alma, isn't this restful, and isn't that moon glorious? Mrs. Kelsey shot a quick look at her husband, then she cleared her throat nervously. Er, yes, she assented. I suppose you know what it's made of, and how big it is, and, and what there is on it, don't you, Alma? Alma raised her eyebrows. Hmm, well, there are still a few points that I and the astronomers haven't quite settled, she returned with a whimsical smile. And the stars, they've got names, I suppose, every one of them proceeded Mrs. Kelsey, so intent on her own part that Alma's reply passed unnoticed. Alma laughed, then she assumed an attitude of mock rapture and quoted, Scintillate, scintillate, globule, vivific, fain would I fathom thy nature specific, loftily poised in ether capacious, strongly resembling the gem carbonaceous. There was a long silence. Alma's eyes were on the flying clouds. Would, would you mind saying that again, Alma? asked Mrs. Kelsey at last timidly. Alma turned with a start. Saying what, dearie? 
Oh, that nonsensical verse? Of course not. That's only another way of saying twinkle, twinkle, little star. Means just the same, only uses up a few more letters to make the words. Listen. And she repeated the two line for line. Oh, said her mother faintly. Er, thank you. I, I guess I'll go to bed, announced Nathan Kelsey suddenly. The next morning, Alma's pleadings were in vain. Mrs. Kelsey insisted that Alma should go about her sketching, leaving the housework for her own hands to perform. With a laughing protest and a playful pout, Alma tucked her sketchbook under her arm and left the house to go down by the river. In the field, she came upon her father. Hard at work, Dad, she called affectionately. Old Mother Earth won't yield her increase without just so much labor, will she? That she won't, laughed the man. Then he flushed a quick red and set a light foot on a crawling thing of many legs, which had emerged from beneath an overturned stone. Oh, cried Alma, your foot, father, you're crushing something. The flush grew deeper. Oh, I guess not, rejoined the man, lifting his foot and giving a curiously resigned sigh as he sent an apprehensive glance into the girl's face. "'Dear, dear, isn't he funny?' murmured the girl, bending low and giving a gentle poke with the pencil in her hand. "'Only fancy,' she added, straightening herself. "'Only fancy, if we had so many feet. Just picture the size of our shoe bill.' And she laughed and turned away. "'Well, by gum!' ejaculated the man, looking after her. Then he fell to work, and his whistle, as he worked, carried something of the song of a bird set free from a cage. A week passed. The days were spent by Alma in roaming the woods and fields, pencil and paper in hand. They were spent by her mother in the hot kitchen over a hotter stove. To Alma's protests and pleadings, Mrs. Kelsey was deaf. Alma's place was not there. Her work was not housework, declared Alma's mother. On Mrs. Kelsey, the strain was beginning to tell. It was not the work alone, though that was no light matter, owing to her anxiety that Alma's pleasure and comfort should find nothing wanting. It was more than the work. Every night at six, the anxious little woman, flushed from biscuit baking and chicken broiling, and almost sick with fatigue, got out the black silk gown and the white lace collar and put them on with trembling hands, thus robed in state, she descended to the supper table, there to confront her husband, still more miserable in the stiff collar and black coat. Nor yet was this all. Neither the work nor the black silk dress contained for Mrs. Kelsey quite the possibilities of soul torture that were to be found in the words that fell from her lips. As the days passed, the task the little woman had set for herself became more and more hopeless, until she scarcely could bring herself to speak at all. So stumbling and halting were her sentences. At the end of the eighth day came the culmination of it all. Alma, her nose sniffing the air, ran into the kitchen that night to find no one in the room and the biscuits burning in the oven. She removed the biscuits, threw wide the doors and windows, then hurried upstairs to her mother's room. Why, mother! Mrs. Kelsey stood before the glass, a deep flush on her cheeks and tears rolling down her face. Two trembling hands struggled with the lace at her throat until the sharp point of a pin found her thumb and left a tiny crimson stain on the spotlessness of the collar. It was then that Mrs. Kelsey covered her face with her hands and sank into the low chair by the bed. "'Why, mother!' cried Alma again, hurrying across the room and dropping on her knees at her mother's side. "'I can't, Alma, I can't,' moaned the woman. "'I've tried and tried, but I've got to give up. I've got to give up. Can't what, dearie? Give up what? demanded Alma. Mrs. Kelsey shook her head. Then she dropped her hands and looked fearfully into her daughter's face. And your father, too, Alma. He's tried, and he can't, she choked. Tried what? What do you mean? With her eyes on Alma's troubled, amazed face, Mrs. Kelsey made one last effort to gain her lost position. She raised her shaking hands to her throat and fumbled for the pin in the collar. There, there, dear, don't fret, she stammered. I didn't think what I was saying. It ain't nothing. I mean, it aren't nothing. It am not. Oh, she sobbed. There, you see, Alma, I can't. I can't. 
it ain't no more use ter try down went the gray head on alma's strong young shoulder there there dear cry away comforted alma with loving pats it will do you good then we'll hear what this is all about from the very beginning and mrs kelsey told her and from the very beginning when the telling was over and the little woman a bit breathless and frightened sat awaiting what alma would say there came a long silence alma's lips were close shut alma was not quite sure if she opened them whether there would come a laugh or a sob the laugh was uppermost and almost parted the firm set lips when a side glance at the quivering face of the little woman in the big chair turned the laugh into a half-stifled sob. Then Alma spoke. Mother, dear, listen. Do you think a silk dress and a stiff collar can make you and father any dearer to me? Do you think an ain't or a hain't can make me love either of you any less? Do you suppose I expect you, after fifty years' service for others, to be as careful in your ways and words as if you'd spent those fifty years in training yourself instead of training six children? Why, mother dear, do you suppose that I don't know that for twenty of those years you have had no thoughts, no prayers, save for me? That I have been the very apple of your eye? Well, it's my turn now, and you are the apple of my eye, you and father. Why, dearie, you have no idea of the plans I have for you. There's a good strong woman coming next week for the kitchen work. Oh, it's all right, assured Alma quickly, in response to the look on her mother's face. Why, I'm rich. Only think of those orders. And then you shall dress in silk or velvet or calico, anything you like, so long as it doesn't scratch or prick, she added merrily, bending forward and fastening the lace collar. And you shall... Mary? It was Nathan at the foot of the back stairway. Yes, Nathan. Ain't it almost supper time? Bless my soul, cried Mrs. Kelsey, springing to her feet. And Mary? Yes. Hain't I got a collar, a boiled one on the bureau up there? No, called Alma, snatching up the collar and throwing it on the bed. There ain't a sign of one there. Suppose you let it go tonight, Dad. Well, if you don't mind and a very audible sigh of relief floated up the back stairway. End of chapter 9 in the Footsteps of Katie Chapter 10 The Bridge Across the Years John was expected on the five o'clock stage. Mrs. John had been there three days now, and John's father and mother were almost packed up. So Mrs. John said, The auction would be tomorrow at nine o'clock, and with John there to see that things hustled, which last was really unnecessary to mention, for John's very presence meant hustle. With John there, then, the whole thing ought to be over by one o'clock, and they off in season to catch the afternoon express. And what a time it had been, those three days! Mrs. John, resting in the big chair on the front porch, thought of those days with complacency, that they were over. Grandpa and Grandma Burton, hovering over old treasures in the attic, thought of them with terrified dismay that they had ever begun. I am coming up on Tuesday, Mrs. John had written. We have been thinking for some time that you and father ought not to be left alone up there on the farm any longer. Now, don't worry about the packing. I shall bring Marie, and you won't have to lift your finger. John will come Thursday night and be there for the auction on friday by that time we shall have picked out what is worth saving and everything will be ready for him to take matters in hand i think he has already written to the auctioneer so tell father to give himself no uneasiness on that score john says he thinks we can have you back here with us by friday night or saturday at the latest you know john's way so you may be sure there will be no tiresome delay your rooms here will be all ready before i leave so that part will be all right this may seem a bit sudden to you but you know we have always told you that the time was surely coming when you couldn't live alone any longer john thinks it has come now and as i said before you know john so after all you won't be surprised at his going right ahead with things 
we shall do everything possible to make you comfortable and i am sure you will be very happy here good-bye then until tuesday with love to both of you edith that had been the beginning to grandpa and grandma burton it had come like a thunderclap on a clear day they had known to be sure that son john frowned a little at their lonely life but that there should come this sudden transplanting this ruthless twisting and tearing up of roots that for sixty years had been burrowing deeper and deeper it was almost beyond one's comprehension and there was the auction we shan't need that anyway grandma burton had said at once what few things we don't want to keep i shall give away an auction indeed pray what have we to sell hm to be sure to be sure her husband had murmured but his face was troubled and later he had said apologetically you see hannah there's the farm things we don't need them on tuesday night mrs john and the somewhat awesome maria to whom grandpa and grandma burton never could learn not to curtsy arrived and almost at once grandma burton discovered that not only farm things but such precious treasures as the hair wreath and a parlor set were auctionable in fact everything the house contained except her clothing and a few crayon portraits seemed to be in the same category but mother dear mrs john had returned with a laugh in response to grandma burton's horrified remonstrances just wait till you see your rooms and how full they are of beautiful things and then you'll understand but they won't be these the old voice had quavered and mrs john had laughed again and had patted her mother-in-law's cheek and had echoed but with a different shade of meaning no they certainly won't be these in the attic now on a worn black trunk sat the little old man and down on the floor before an antiquated cradle knelt his wife they was all rocked in it seth she was saying john and the twins and my two little girls and now there ain't any one left only john and the cradle i know hannah but you ain't usin that nowadays so you don't really need it comforted the old man but there's my big chair now seems as though we just thought to take that why there ain't a day goes by that i don't set in it but john's wife says there's better ones there seth soothed the old woman in her turn as much as four or five of em right in our rooms so she did so she did murmured the man i'm an ungrateful thing so i be there was a long pause the old man drummed with his fingers on the trunk and watched the cloud sail across the skylight the woman gently swung the cradle to and fro if only they weren't going to be sold she choked after a time i like to know that they're where i can look at em and feel of em and and remember things now there's them quilts with all my dress pieces in em a piece of most every dress i've had since i was a girl and there's that hair wreath seems as if i just couldn't let that go seth why there's your hair and john's and some of the twins and there there dear now i just wouldn't fret cut in the old man quickly like enough when you get used to them mother things on the wall you'll like em even better than the hair wreath john's wife says she's taken lots of pains and fix em up with pictures and curtains and everything nice went on seth talking very fast why hannah it's you that's been ungrateful now dear so tis so tis seth and it ain't right and i know it i ain't her goin to do so no more now see and she bravely turned her back on the cradle and walked head erect toward the attic stairs john came at five o'clock he engulfed the little old man and the little old woman in a bear-like hug and breezily demanded what they had been doing to themselves to make them look so forlorn in the very next breath however he answered his own question and declared it was because they had been living all cooped up alone so long so it was and that it was high time it was stopped and that he had come to do it whereupon the old man and the old woman 
smiled bravely and told each other what a good good son they had to be sure friday dawned clear and not too warm an ideal auction day long before nine o'clock the yard was full of teams and the house of people among them all however there was no sign of the bent old man and the erect little old woman the owners of the property to be sold john and mrs john were not a little disturbed they had lost their father and mother nine o'clock came and with it began the strident call of the auctioneer men laughed and joked over their bids and women looked and gossiped adding a bid of their own now and then everywhere was the son of the house and things went through with a rush upstairs in the darkest corner of the attic which had been cleared of goods sat hand in hand on an old packing box a little old man and a little old woman who winced and shrank together every time the going going gone floated up to them from the yard below at half past one the last wagon rumbled out of the yard and five minutes later mrs john gave a relieved cry oh there you are why mother father where have you been there was no reply the old man choked back a cough and bent to flick a bit of dust from his coat the old woman turned and crept away her erect little figure looking suddenly bent and old why what began john as his father too turned away why edith you don't suppose he stopped with a helpless frown perfectly natural my dear perfectly natural returned mrs john lightly we'll get them away immediately it'll be all right when once they are started some hours later a very tired old man and a still more tired old woman crept into a pair of sumptuous canopy-topped twin beds there was only one remark why seth mine ain't feathers a mite is yours there was no reply tired nature had triumphed seth was asleep they made a brave fight those two they told themselves that the chairs were easier the carpet softer and the pictures prettier than those that had gone under the hammer that day as they sat hand in hand in the attic they assured each other that the unaccustomed richness of window and bed hangings and the profusion of strange vases and statuettes did not make them afraid to stare lest they soil or break something they insisted to each other that they were not homesick and that they were perfectly satisfied as they were and yet when no one was looking grandpa burton tried chair after chair and wondered why there was only one particular chair in the whole world that just exactly fitted and when the twilight hour came grandma burton wondered what she would give to be able just to sit by the old cradle and talk with the past the newspapers said it was a most marvellous escape for the whole family they gave a detailed account of how the beautiful residence of the honourable john burton with all its costly furnishings had burned to the ground and of how the entire family was saved making special mention of the honourable gentleman's aged father and mother no one was injured fortunately and the family had taken up a temporary residence in the nearest hotel it was understood that mr burton would begin rebuilding at once the newspapers were right mr burton did begin rebuilding at once in fact the ashes of the burton mansion were not cold before john burton began to interview architects and contractors it'll be way ahead of the old one he confided to his wife enthusiastically mrs john sighed i know dear she began plaintively but don't you see it won't be the same it can't be why some of those things we've had ever since we were married they seemed a part of me john i was used to them i had grown up with some of them those candlesticks of mamma's for instance that she had when i was a bit of a baby do you think money can buy another pair that that were hers and mrs john burst into tears come come dear protested her husband with a hasty caress and a nervous glance at the clock he was due at the bank in ten minutes don't fret about what can't be helped besides and he laughed whimsically 
you must look out or you'll be getting as bad as mother over her hair wreath and with another hasty pat on her shoulder he was gone mrs john suddenly stopped her crying she lowered her handkerchief and stared fixedly at an old print on the wall opposite the hotel though strictly modern in cuisine and management was an old one and prided itself on the quaintness of its old-time furnishings just what the print represented mrs john could not have told though her eyes did not swerve from its face for five long minutes what she did see was a silent dismantled farmhouse and a little old man and a little old woman with drawn faces and dumb lips what is possible had she indeed been so blind mrs john rose to her feet bathed her eyes straightened her neck bow and crossed the hall to grandma burton's room well mother and how are you getting along she asked cheerily just as nice as can be daughter and ain't this room pretty returned the little old woman eagerly do you know it seems kind of natural like maybe it's because of that chair there seth says it's almost like his at home it was a good beginning and mrs john made the most of it under her skilful guidance grandma burton in less than five minutes had gone from the chair to the old clock which her father used to wind and from the clock to the bureau where she kept the dead twins little white shoes and bonnets she told too of the cherished parlor chairs and the marble top table and of how she and father had saved and saved for years to buy them and even now as she talked her voice rang with pride of possession though only for a moment it shook then with the remembrance of loss there was no complaint it is true no audible longing for lost treasures there was only the unwanted joy of pouring into sympathetic ears the story of things loved and lost things the very mention of which brought sweet faint echoes of voices long since silent there there broke off the little old woman at last how i am running on but somehow something set me talking today maybe it was the chair that's like your father's she hazarded maybe it was agreed mrs john quietly as she rose to her feet the new house came on apace in a wonderfully short time john burton began to urge his wife to see about rugs and hangings it was then that mrs john called to him to one side and said a few hurried but very earnest words words that made the honorable john open wide his eyes but edith he remonstrated are you crazy it simply couldn't be done the things are scattered over half a dozen townships besides i haven't the least idea where the auctioneer's list is if i saved it at all never mind dear i may try surely begged mrs john and her husband laughed and reached for his checkbook try of course you may try and here's this by way of wishing you good luck he finished as he handed her an oblong bit of paper that would go far toward smoothing the most difficult of ways you dear cried mrs john and now i'm going to work it was about this time that mrs john went away the children were at college and boarding school john was absorbed in business and house building and grandpa and grandma burton were contented and well cared for there really seemed to be no reason why mrs john should not go away if she wished and she apparently did wish it was at about this time too that certain vermont villages one of which was the honorable john burton's birthplace were stirred to sudden interest and action a persistent smiling-faced woman had dropped into their midst a woman who drove from house to house and who in every case left behind her a sworn ally and friend pledged to serve her cause little by little in an unused room in the village hotel there began to accumulate a motley collection a clock a marble top table a cradle a patchwork quilt a bureau a hair wreath a chair worn with age and use and as this collection grew in size and fame only that family which could not add to it counted itself abused and unfortunate 
so great was the spell that the persistent smiling-faced woman had cast about her just before the burton house was finished mrs john came back to town she had to hurry a little about the last of the decorations and furnishings to make up for lost time but there came a day when the place was pronounced ready for occupancy it was then that mrs john hurried into grandpa and grandma burton's rooms at the hotel come dears the house is all ready and we're going home done so soon faltered grandma burton who had not been told very much concerning the new home's progress why how quick they have built it there was a note of regret in the tremulous old voice but mrs john did not seem to notice the old man too rose from his chair with a long sigh and again mrs john did not seem to notice yes dearie yes it's all very nice and fine said grandma burton wearily half an hour later as she trudged through the sumptuous parlors and halls of the new house but if you don't mind i guess i'll go to my room daughter i'm tired terrible tired up the stairs and along the hall trailed the little procession mrs john john the bent old man and the little old woman at the end of the hall mrs john paused a moment then flung the door wide open there was a gasp and a quick step forward then came the sudden illumination of two wrinkled old faces john edith it was a cry of mingled joy and wonder there was no reply mrs john had closed the door and left them there with their treasures end of chapter ten chapter eleven for jimmy uncle zeke's pipe had gone out sure sign that uncle zeke's mind was not at rest for five minutes the old man had occupied in frowning silence the other of my veranda rocking chairs as i expected however i had not long to wait i met old sam hadley and his wife in the cemetery just now he observed yes i was careful to express just enough and not too much interest one had to be circumspect with uncle zeke hmm i was thinking uncle zeke paused shifted his position and began again this time i had the whole story i was thinking i don't say that jimmy did right and i don't say that jimmy did wrong maybe you can tell twas like this in a way we all claimed jimmy hadley as a little feller he was one of them big-eyed curly-haired chaps that gets inside your heart no matter how tough tis and we was really fond of him too so fond of him that we didn't do nothing but join in when his pa and ma talked as if he was the only boy that ever was born or ever would be and you know we must have been pretty daft as to that us being fathers ourselves well as was natural perhaps the headless just lived for jimmy they'd lost three and he was all there was left they wasn't very well to do but nothing was too grand for jimmy and when the boy begun to draw them little pictures of his all over the shed and the barn door they was plump crazy there wa'n't no doubt of it jimmy was going to be famous they said he was going to be one of them painter fellows and make big money and jimmy did work even then he stood well in his studies and worked outside earning money so's he could take drawing lessons when he got bigger and by and by he did get bigger and he did take lessons down to the junction twice a week there wa'n't no livin with miss hadley then she was that proud and when he brought home his first picture they say she never went to bed at all that night but just sat gloating over it till the sun came in and made her kerosene lamp look as silly as she did when she saw twas moonin there was one thing that plagued her though twan't painted that picture jimmy called it a black and white and said twan't painting that he wanted to do but lustratin fur books and magazines you know she felt hurt and all put out at first but jimmy told her twas all right and that there was big money in it so she's got round contented again she couldn't help it anyhow with jimmy he was that lovin and nice with her he was the kind that always bringin footstools and shawls 
and making folks comfortable everybody loved jimmy even the cats and dogs rubbed up against him and wagged their tails at sight of him and the kids goodness jimmy couldn't cross the streets without a dozen kids making a grand rush for him well time went on and jimmy grew tall and good-looking then came the girl and she was a girl too course jimmy bein as how he had all the frozen there was goin' on everything so fur carried out the same idea in girls and picked out the prettiest one he could find rich old townsend's daughter bessie to the hadleys this seemed all right jimmy was merely getting the best as usual but the rest of us including old man townsend begun to sit up and take notice the old man was mad clean through he had other plans for bessie and he said so pretty plain but it seems there didn't any of us only jimmy maybe take the girl herself into consideration for a time she was a little skittish and led jimmy a pretty chase with her dancing nearer and nearer and then flying off out of reach but at last she came out fair and square for jimmy and they was as lively a pair of lovers as should wish to see it looked too as if she'd even wheedle the old man round to her side of thinkin the next thing we knew jimmy had gone to new york he was to study and at the same time pick up what work he could to turn an honest penny the hadley said we like that in him he was goin to make something of himself so's he'd be worthy of bessie townsend and any other girl but twas hard on the hadleys jimmy's lesson cost a lot and so did just livin there in new york and course jimmy couldn't pay for it all though i guess he worked nights and sundays to peace out back home here the hadleys scrimped and scrimped till they didn't have half enough to eat and hardly enough to cover their nakedness but they didn't mind was for jimmy he wrote often and told how he was working and the girl got letters too at least miss hadley said she did and once in a while he'd tell of some pictures he'd finished or what the teacher said but by and by the letters didn't come so often sam told me about it at first and he said it plagued his wife a lot she said she thought maybe jimmy was getting discouraged specially as he didn't seem to say much of anything about his work now sam owned up that the letters wa'n't so free talking and that worried him he was afraid the boy was keepin back something he asked me kind of sheepish like if i s'posed such a thing could be as that jimmy had gone wrong somehow he knew cities was awful wicked and temptin he said i laughed him out of that notion quick and i was honest in it too i'd have as soon suspected myself of going to the bed as jimmy and i told him so things didn't look right though the letters got scurser and scurser and i began to think myself maybe something was up then come the newspaper it was me that took it over to the hadleys it was a little notice in my weekly and i spied it way down in the corner just as i thought i had the paper all read twan't so much but to us twas a powerful lot jest a little notice that they was glad to see that the first prize had gone to the talented young illustrator james hadley and that he deserved it and they wished him luck the hadleys were pretty pleased you'd better believe they hadn't seen it course as they wa'n't wasting no money on weeklies them days sam sat right down and wrote and so did miss hadley right out of the fullness of the hearts miss hadley give me her letter to read she was that proud and excited and twas a good letter all brimmin over with love and pride and joy in his success i could see just how jimmy'd colour up and choke when he read it specially where she owned up how she'd been getting pretty near discouraged cause they didn't hear much from him and how she'd rather die than have her jimmy fail well they sent off the letters and by and by come the answer it was kind of shy and stiff-like and i think it sort of disappointed them but they tried to throw it off and say that jimmy was so modest he didn't like to take praise course the whole town was interested and proud too 
to think he belonged to us and we couldn't hear half enough about him but as time went on we got worried things didn't look right the hadleys were still scrimping still sending money when they could and they owned up that jimmy's letter wa'n't real satisfying and that they didn't come often though they always told how hard he was working what was queerer still every now and then i'd see his name in my weekly i looked for it i'll own i ran across it once in the personals and after that i hunted the paper all through every week he went through parties and theatres and seemed to be one of a gay crowd that was always having good times i didn't say nothing to the hadleys all about this course but it bothered me lots what with all these fine doings and his not sending any money home it looked as if the old folks didn't count much now and that his head had got turned sure as time passed things got worse and worse sam lost two cows and miss hadley grew thinner and whiter and finally got down sick in her bed then i wrote i told jimmy pretty plain how things was and what i thought of him i told him that there wouldn't be any more money coming from this direction and i meant to see that there wa'n't too and i hinted that if that ere price brought him anything but honor i should think twould be a mighty good plan to share it with the folks that help him to win it it was a sharp letter and when it was gone i felt most sorry i'd sent it and when the answer come i was sorry jimmy was all broke up and he showed it he begged me to tell him just how his ma was and if they needed anything to get it and call on him he said he wished the price had brought him lots of money but it hadn't he enclosed twenty-five dollars however and said he should write the folks not to send him any more money as he was going to send to them now instead of course i took the letter and the money right over to sam and after they'd got over frettin cause i'd written at all they took the money and i could see it made them look ten years younger after that you couldn't come near either of them that you didn't hear how good jimmy was and how he was sending home money every week well it wa'n't four months before i had to write jimmy again sam asked me to this time miss hadley was sick again and sam was worried he thought jimmy ought to come but he didn't like to say so himself he wondered if i wouldn't drop him a hint so i wrote and jimmy wrote right away that he'd come we was all of a twitter course then the whole town he'd got another prize so the paper said and there was a paragraph praising up some pictures of his in the magazine he was our jimmy and we was proud of him yet we couldn't help wondering how he'd act we wa'n't used to celebrities not near to well he came he was taller and thinner than when he went away and there was a tired look in his eyes that went straight to my heart most the whole town was out to meet him and that seemed to bother him he was cordial enough in a way but it seemed to try to avoid folks and he asked me right off to get him out of it i could see he wa'n't hankering to be made a lion of so we got away soon's we could and went to his home you should have seen miss hadley's eyes when she saw him tall and straight in the doorway and sam sam cried like a baby he was so proud of that boy as for jimmy his eyes just shone and the tired look was all gone from them when he strode across the room and dropped on his knees at his mother's bedside with a kind of choking cry i come away then and left them we was kind of divided about jimmy after that we liked him most all of us but we didn't like his ways he was too standoffish and queer and we was all mad at the way he treated the girl twas given out that the engagement was broken but we didn't believe twas her done it cause up to the last minute she'd been running down to the house with posies and goodies then he came and she stopped he didn't go there neither and so far as we knew they hadn't seen each other once the whole town was put out 
we didn't relish seein' her thrown off like an old glove just cause he was somebody out in the world now and could have his pick of girls with city airs and fur bellows but we couldn't do nothin cause he he was good to his folks and no mistake and we did like that miss hadley got better in a couple of weeks and he begun to talk of going back we wanted to give him a banquet and speeches and a serenade but he wouldn't hear a word of it he wouldn't let us tell him how pleased we was at his success either the one thing he wouldn't talk about was his work and some got most mad he was so modest he hardly ever left the house except for long walks and it was on one of them that the accident happened it was in the road right in front of the field where i was ploughing so i saw it all bessie townsend on her little gray mare came tearing down the townsend hill like mad jimmy had stopped to speak to me at the fence but the next minute he was off like a shot up the road he ran and made a flying leap and i saw the mare rear and plunge then beast and man came down together and i saw bessie slide to the ground landing on her feet when i got there bessie townsend was sitting on the ground with jimmy's head in her arm which i thought uncommon good of her seeing the mortification he'd cost her but when i saw the look in her eyes and in his as he opened them and gazed up at her i reckoned there might be more to that love story than most folks knew what he said to her then i don't know but to me he said just four words don't tell the folks and i didn't rightly understand just then what he meant for surely an accident like that couldn't be kept unbeknownst the next minute he fell back unconscious it was a bad business all around and from the very first there wa'n't no hope in a week twas over and we laid poor jimmy away two days later after the funeral sam come to me with a letter it was addressed to jimmy and the old man couldn't bring himself to rope in it he wanted too that i should go on to new york and get jimmy's things and after i had opened the letter i said right off that i'd go i was mad over that letter it was a bill for a suit of clothes and it asked him pretty sharp like to pay it i had some trouble in new york finding jimmy's boarding place there had been a fire the night before and his landlady had had to move but at last i found her and asked anxiously for jimmy's things and if his pictures had been hurt jimmy's landlady was fat and greasy and foreign-looking and she didn't seem to understand what i was talking about till i repeated a bit sharply yes his pictures i've come for em then she shook her head mr hadley did not have any pictures but he must have had em says i for them papers and magazines he worked for he made em she shook her head again then she gave a queer hitch to her shoulders and a little flourish with her hands oh the pictures he did do them once a little months ago but the prize says i the prize to jimmy hadley then she laughed as if she suddenly understood oh but it is a grand mistake you are making she cried in her silly outlandish way of talking there is a mr james hadley and he does make pictures beautiful pictures but it is not this one this mr hadley did try long ago but he failed to succeed so my son said and he had to to cease for long time he has worked for me for the grocer for any one who would pay till a little while ago then he left in the new clothes he had bought he went away the old ones burnt he had nothing else she said once more but i didn't even listen i was back with jimmy by the roadside and his don't tell the folks was ringing in my ears i understood it then the whole thing from the beginning and i felt dazed and shocked as if someone had struck me a blow in the face i wa not brought up to think lying and deceiving was right 
I got up by and by and left the house. I paid poor Jimmy's bill for clothes, the clothes that I knew he wore when he stood tall and straight in the doorway to meet his mother's adoring eyes. Then I went home. I told Sam that Jimmy's things got burned up in the fire, which was the truth. I stopped there. Then I went to see the girl. And right there I got the surprise of my life. She knew. He had told her the whole thing long before he come home and insisted on giving her up just what he meant to do in the end and how he meant to do it she didn't know and she said with a great sob in her voice that she didn't believe he knew either all he did know apparently was that he didn't mean his ma should find out and grieve over it how he had failed but whatever he was going to do it was taken quite out of his hands at the last as for Bessie, now, it seems as if she can't do enough for Sam and Miss Hadley. She's that good to run, and they set the world by her. She's got a sad, proud look to her eyes, but Jimmy's secret is safe. As I said, I saw old Sam and his wife in the cemetery tonight. They stopped me as usual, and told me all over again what a good boy Jimmy was, and how smart he was and what a lot he'd made of himself in the little time he'd lived. The Hadleys are old and feeble and broken, and it's their one comfort, Jimmy's success. Uncle Zeke paused and drew a long breath. Then he eyed me almost defiantly. I ain't saying that Jimmy did right, of course, but I ain't saying that Jimmy did wrong, he finished. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12. A Summons Home Mrs. Thaddeus Clayton came softly into the room and looked with apprehensive eyes upon the little old man in the rocking chair. How be you, dearie? You ain't waiting for nothing now, have you? Not a thing, Harriet, he returned cheerily. I'm feeling real pert, too. Was there lots there? And did Parson Drew say a heap of fine things? Mrs. Clayton dropped into a chair and pulled listlessly at the black strings of her bonnet. "'Twas a beautiful funeral, Thaddeus, a beautiful funeral. Ah, I most wished it was mine. Harriet, she gave a shamefaced laugh. "'Well, I did. Then Jehiel and Hannah Jane would have come, and I could have seen them. The horrified look on the old man's face gave way to a broad smile. "'Oh, Harriet, Harriet,' he chuckled. "'How could you seen him if you was dead?' "'Huh? Well, ah, Thaddeus.' Her voice rose sharply in the silent room. Every single one of them Perkins boys was there, and Annabel too. Only think what poor Miss Perkins would have given to see him before she went. But they waited, waited, Thaddeus, just as everybody else, till their folks is dead. But Harriet, demurred the old man, surely you'd have had them boys come to their own mother's funeral. Come? I'd have had em come before, while Ella Perkins could have feasted her eyes on em, Thaddeus. Mrs. Clayton rose to her feet and stretched out two gaunt hands longingly. Thaddeus, I get so hungry sometimes for Jehiel and Hannah Jane. Seems as though I just can't stand it. I know, I know, dearie, quavered the old man, vigorously polishing his glasses. Fifty years ago my first baby came, resumed the woman in tremulous tones. Then another came, and another, till I'd had six. I loved them and tended them and cared for em, and didn't have a thought but was for them babies. Four died. Her voice broke, then went on with renewed strength. But I've got Jehiel and Hannah Jane left, at least. I've got two bits of paper that comes maybe once a month, and one of them signed, your dutiful son Jehiel, and the other from your loving daughter, Hannah Jane. Well, Harriet, they, they're pretty good to write letters, ventured Mr. Clayton. Letters, well, his wife. I can't hug and kiss letters, though I try to sometimes. I want warm flesh and blood in my arms, Thaddeus. I want to look down into Jehiel's blue eyes and hear him call me dear old Mumsy, as he used to. I wouldn't ask them to stay. I ain't unreasonable, Thaddeus. I know they can't do that. Well, well, wife, maybe it'll come. Maybe it'll come this summer. Who knows? She shook her head dismally. You've said it every year for the last fifteen summers, and they hadn't come. Jehiel went west more than twenty years ago, and he's never been home since. 
Why, Thaddeus, we've got a grandson most eighteen that we ain't even seen. Hannah Jane's been home just once since she was married, but I was nigh on her sixteen years ago. She's always writing of her Tommy and Nelly, but I want to see them, Thaddeus. I want to see them. Yes, yes, well, we'll ask him, Harriet, again. We'll ask him real urgent-like, and maybe that'll fetch him, comforted the old man. We'll ask him to be here the fourth. That's eight weeks off yet. Now she'll be real smart by then. Two letters that were certainly urgent-like left the New England farmhouse the next morning. One was addressed to a thriving western city, the other to Chattanooga, Tennessee. In course of time, the answers came. Hannah Jane's appeared first, and was opened with shaking fingers. Dear mother, read Mrs. Clayton aloud, your letter came two or three days ago, and I have hurried round to answer it, for you seem to be so anxious to hear. I'm real sorry, and I don't see how we can get away this summer. Nathan is real busy at the store, and some way I can't seem to get up energy enough to even think of fixing up the children to take them so far. Thank you for the invitation, though. We should enjoy the visit very much, but I guess we can't go just yet. Of course, if anything serious should come up, that made it necessary. Why, that would be different, but I know you are sensible, and you will understand how it is with us. Nathan is well, but business has been pretty brisk, and he is in the store early and late. As long as he's making money, he don't mind, but I tell him I think he might rest a little sometimes, and let someone else do the things he does. Tom is a big boy now, smart in his studies, and with a good head for figures. Nellie loves her books too, and for a little girl of eleven, does pretty well, we think. I must close now. We all send love and hope you are getting along all right. Was glad to hear father was gaining so fast. Your love and daughter, Hannah Jane. The letter dropped from Mrs. Clayton's fingers and lay unheeded on the floor. The woman covered her face with her hands and rocked her body back and forth. Dear, dear, dearie, soothed the old man huskily. Maybe Jemiles will be different. I shouldn't wonder now if Jehiel would come. There, there. Don't take on so, Harriet. Don't. I just know Jehiel will come. A week later, Mrs. Clayton found another letter in the rural delivery box. She clutched it nervously, peering at the writing with her dim old eyes, and hurried into the house for her glasses. Yes, it was from Jehiel. She drew a long breath. Her eager thumb was almost under the flap of the envelope when she hesitated. Eyed the letter uncertainly and thrust it into the pocket of her calico gown. All day it lay there, save at times which indeed were of frequent occurrence, when she took it from its hiding place, pressed it to her cheek, or gloried in every curve of the boldly written address. At night, after the lamp was lighted, she said to her husband in tones so low he could scarcely hear, Thaddeus, I, I had a letter from Jehiel today. You did, and never told me, why, Harriet, what? He paused helplessly. I, I haven't read it, Thaddeus, she stammered. I couldn't bear it to you some way. I don't know why, but I couldn't. You read it. She held out the letter with shaking hands. He took it, giving her a sharp glance from anxious eyes. As he began to read aloud, she checked him. No, to yourself, Thaddeus, to yourself. Then tell me. As he read, she watched his face. The light died from her eyes, and her chin quivered as she saw the stern lines deepen around his mouth. A minute more, and he had finished the letter, and laid it down without a word. Thaddeus, you don't mean he didn't say... Read it. I... I can't... choked the old man. She reached slowly for the sheet of paper and spread it on the table before her. Dear Mother, Jehiel had written, just a word to tell you we are all okay and doing finely. Your letter reminded me that it is about time I was writing home to the old folks. I don't mean to let so many weeks go by without a letter from me, but somehow the time just gets away from me before I know it. Minnie is well, and deep in spring sewing and house cleaning. I know because dressmakers' bills are beginning to come in, and every time I go home I find a carpet up in a new place. Our boy Fred's eighteen tomorrow. You'd be proud of him. I know if you could see him. Business is rushing. Glad to hear you're all right, and that father's rheumatism is on the game. As ever, your affectionate and dutiful son, Jehiel. 
Oh, by the way, about that visit east. I reckon we'll have to call it off this year. Too bad, but can't seem to see my way clear. Bye-bye. J. Harriet Clayton did not cry this time. She stared at the letter long minutes, with wide, open, tearless eyes. Then she slowly folded it, and put it back in its envelope. Here you, maybe, began the old man timidly. Don't, Farius, please don't, she interrupted. Ah, I, I don't want to talk. And she rose unsteadily to her feet, and moved toward the kitchen door. For a time Mrs. Clayton went about her work in a silence quite unusual, while her husband watched her with troubled eyes. His heart grieved over the bowed head and drooping shoulders, and over the blurred eyes that were so often surreptitiously wiped on a corner of the gingham apron. But at the end of a week the little old woman accosted him with a face full of aggressive yet anxious determination. Thaddeus, I want to speak to you about something. I've been thinking it all out, and I've decided that I've got to kill one of us off. Hear you? Well, I have. A funeral's the only thing that will fetch you Highland. Hear it, are you gone crazy? Have you gone clean mad? She looked at him appealingly. Now, Thaddeus, don't try to hinder me, please. You see, it's the only way. A funeral is to... A funeral? It's murder! He shuddered. Oh, not to make believe, as I shall, she protested eagerly. It's make believe? Why, yes, of course, you'll have to be the one to do it, as I'm going to be the dead one, Anne. Harriet! There, there, please, Thaddeus, I've just got to see Jehiel and Hannah Jane for a die. But they, they'll come if. No, they won't come. We've tried it over and over again. You know we have. Hannah Jane herself said that if anything serious came up, it would be different. Well, I'm going to have something serious come up. But Harriet! Now, Thaddeus, begged the woman, almost crying. You help me, dear. I've thought it all out, and it's easy as can be. I shan't tell any lies, of course. I cut my finger today, didn't I? Why, yes, I believe so, he acknowledged dazedly. But what has that to do? That's the accident, Thaddeus. You're to send two telegrams at once, one to Jehiel and one to Hannah Jane. The telegrams will say, Accident to your mother, funeral, Saturday afternoon. Come at once. That's just ten words. The old man gasped. He could not speak. Now that's all true, ain't it? She asked anxiously. The accident is this cut. The funeral is old Miss Wentworth's. I heard today that they couldn't have it until Saturday, so that'll give us plenty of time to get the folks here. I needn't say whose funeral it is that's going to be on Saturday. Thaddeus, I want you to hitch up and drive over to Hopkinsville to send the telegrams. The man's new over there and won't know you. You couldn't send him from here, of course. Thaddeus Clayton never knew just how he allowed himself to be persuaded to take part in this crazy scheme, as he termed it. But persuaded he certainly was. It was a miserable time for Thaddeus then. First, there was that hurried drive to Hopkinsville. Though the day was warm, though the day was warm, he fairly shivered as he handed those two fateful telegrams to the man behind the counter. Then there was the homeward trip, during which, like the guilty thing he was, he cast furtive glances from side to side. Even home itself came to be a misery, for the sweeping and the dusting and the baking and the brewing which he encountered there left him no place to call his own, so that he lost his patience at last and moaned. Seems to me, Harriet, you're a pretty lively corpse. His wife smiled and flushed a little. There, there, dear, don't fret. Just think how glad we'll be to see him, she exclaimed. Harriet was blissfully happy. Both the children had promptly responded to the telegrams and were now on their way. Hannah Jane with her husband and two children were expected on Friday evening. But Jehiel and his wife and boy could not possibly get in until early in the following morning. All this brought scant joy to Thaddeus. There was always hanging over him the dread horror of what he had done, and a fearful questioning as to how it was all going to end. Friday came, but a telegram at the last moment 
told of trains delayed and connections missed. Hannah Jane would not reach home until 9.40 the next morning. So it was with a four-seated carriole that Thaddeus Clayton started for the station on Saturday morning to meet both of his children and their families. The ride home was a silent one, but once inside the house, Jehiel and Hannah Jane, amid a storm of sobs and cries, besieged their father with questions. The family were all in the darkened sitting room, all indeed, save Harriet, who sat in solitary state in the chamber above, her pale face and her heart beating almost to suffocation. It had been arranged that she was not to be seen until some sort of explanation had been given. Father, what was it? sobbed Hannah Jane. How did it happen? It must have been so sudden, faltered Jehiel. It cut me up completely. I can't ever forgive myself moaned Hannah Jane hysterically. She wanted us to come east, and I wouldn't. It was my selfishness. It was easier to stay where I was. And now, now, we've been brutes, father, cut in Jehiel with a shake in his voice. All of us, I never thought, I never dreamed, father. Can, can we see her? In the chamber above, a woman sprang to her feet. Harriet had quite forgotten the stovepipe hole to the room below and every sob and moan and wailing cry had been woefully distinct to her ears. With streaming eyes and quivering lips, she hurried down the stairs and threw open the sitting-room door. Jehiel, Hannah Jane, I'm here, right here, alive, she cried, and I've been a wicked, wicked woman. I never thought how bad twas going to make you feel. I truly never did. Twas only myself I wanted you so. Oh, children! children i've been so wicked so awful wicked jehiel and hannah jane were steady of head and strong of heart and joy it is said never kills otherwise the results of that sudden apparition in the sitting-room doorway might have been disastrous as it was a wonderfully happy family party gathered around the table an hour later and as jehiel led a tremulous grey-haired woman to the seat of honour he looked into her shining eyes and whispered, Dear old Mumsy, now that we've found a way home again, I reckon we'll be coming every year, don't you? End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 The Black Silk Gowns The Heath Twins, Miss Priscilla and Miss Amelia, rose early that morning, and the world looked very beautiful to them. One does not buy a black silk gown every day, at least Miss Priscilla and Miss Amelia did not. They had waited, indeed, quite forty years to buy this one. The women of the Heath family had always possessed a black silk gown. It was a sort of outward symbol of inward respectability, an unfailing indicator of their proud position as members of one of the old families. It might be donned at any time after one's twenty-first birthday, and it should be donned always for funerals, church, and calls after one had turned thirty. Such had been the code of the Heath family for generations, as Miss Priscilla and Miss Amelia well knew. And it was this that had made all the harder their own fate, that their twenty-first birthday was now forty years behind them, and not yet had either of them attained this cachet of respectability. Today, however, there was to come a change, no longer need the carefully sponged and darned black alpaca gowns flaunt their wearers' poverty to the world, and no longer would they force these same wearers to seek dark corners and sunless rooms, lest the full extent of that poverty became known. It had taken forty years of the most rigid economy to save the necessary money, but it was saved now, and the dresses were to be bought. Long ago there had been enough for one, but neither of the women had so much as thought of the possibility of buying one silk gown. It was sometimes said in the town that if one of the Heath twins strained her eyes, the other was obliged at once to put on glasses. And it is not to be supposed that two sisters, whose sympathies were so delicately attuned, would consent to appear clad, one in new silk and the other in old alpaca. In spite of their early rising that morning, it was quite ten o'clock before Miss Priscilla, and Miss Amelia had brought the house into the state of speckless nicety that would not shame the lustrous things 
that were so soon to be sheltered beneath its roof. Not that either of the ladies expressed this sentiment in words, or even in their thoughts. They merely went about their work that morning with the reverent joy that a devoted priestess might feel in making ready a shrine for its idol. They had to hurry a little to get themselves ready for the eleven o'clock stage that passed their door, and they were still a little breathless when they boarded the train at the home station for the city twenty miles away. The city where were countless yards of shimmering silk waiting to be bought. In the city that night, at least six clerks went home with an unusual weariness in their arms, which came from lifting down and displaying almost their entire stock of black silk. But with all the weariness there was no irritation. There was only in their nostrils a curious perfume as of lavender and old lace, and in their hearts a strange exultation, as if they had that day been allowed a glad part in a sacred rite. As for Miss Priscilla and Miss Amelia, they went home awed, yet triumphant. When one has waited forty years to make a purchase, one does not make that purchase lightly. "'Tomorrow we will go over to Miss Snow's and see about having them made up,' said Miss Priscilla, with a sigh of content, as the stage lumbered through the dusty home streets. "'Yes, we want them rich but plain,' supplemented Miss Amelia rapturously. "'Dear me, Priscilla, but I am tired.' In spite of their weariness, the sisters did not go to bed very early that night. They could not decide whether the top drawer of the spare-room burrow or the long box in the parlour closet would be the safer refuge for their treasure, and when the matter was decided, and the sisters had gone to bed, Miss Priscilla, after a prolonged discussion, got up and moved the silk to the other place, only to slip out of bed later, after a much longer discussion, and put it back. Even then they did not sleep well. For the first time in their lives they knew the responsibility that comes with possessions. They feared burglars. With the morning sun, however, came peace and joy. No moth, nor rust, nor thief had appeared, and the lustrous lengths of shimmering silk defied the sun itself to find spot or blemish. "'It looks even nicer than it did in the store, don't it?' murmured Miss Priscilla ecstatically as she hovered over the glistening folds that she had draped in riotous luxury across the chair-back. "'Yes, oh yes,' breathed Miss Amelia. "'Now, let's hurry with the work so we can go right down to Miss Snow's. "'Black silk, black silk,' ticked the clock to Miss Priscilla, washing the dishes at the kitchen sink. "'You've got a black silk! You've got a black silk!' chirped the robins to Miss Amelia, looking for weeds in the garden. At ten o'clock the sisters left the house, each with a long brown parcel, carefully borne in her arms. At noon the sisters were back again, still carrying the parcels. Their faces wore a look of mingled triumph and defeat. "'As if we could have that beautiful silk put into a plaited skirt,' quavered Miss Priscilla, thrusting the key into a lock with a trembling hand. "'Why, Amelia, plates always crack!' "'Of course they do!' almost sobbed Miss Amelia. Only think of it, Priscilla. Our silk cracked. We will just wait until the styles change, said Miss Priscilla, with an air of finality. They won't always wear plates. And we know all the time that we've really got the dresses, only they aren't made up, finished Miss Amelia, in tearful triumph. So the silk was laid away in two big rolls, and for another year the black alpaca gowns trailed across the town's thresholds, and down the aisle of the church on Sunday. Their owners no longer sought shadowed corners and sunless rooms. However, it was not as if one were obliged to wear sponged and darned alpacas. Plates were out next year, and the Heath sisters were among the first to read it in the fashion notes. Once more on a bright spring morning, Miss Priscilla and Miss Amelia left the house tenderly, bearing in their arms the brown paper parcels, and once more they returned, the brown parcels, still in their arms. There was an air of indecision about them this time. "'You see, Amelia, it seemed foolish, almost wicked,' Miss Priscilla was saying, "'to put such a lot of that expensive silk into just sleeves.' "'I know it,' sighed her sister. "'Of course I want the dresses just as much as you do,' went on Miss Priscilla, more confidently, 
but when I thought of allowing Miss Snow to slash into that beautiful silk, and just waste it on those great balloon sleeves, I, I simply couldn't give my consent. And tisn't as though we hadn't got the dresses. No, indeed, agreed Miss Amelia, lifting her chin, and so once more the rolls of black silk were laid away in the great box that had already held them a year. And for another twelve months, the black alpacas, now grown shabby indeed, were worn with all the pride of one whose garments are beyond reproach. When, for the third time, Miss Priscilla and Miss Amelia returned to their home with the oblong brown parcels, there was no indecision about them. There was only righteous scorn. And do you really think that Miss Snow expected us to allow that silk to be cut up into those skimpy little skin-tight bags she called skirts? demanded Miss Priscilla, in a shaking voice. Why, Amelia, we couldn't ever make them over. Of course we couldn't, and when skirts got bigger, what could we do? cried Miss Amelia. Why, I'd rather never have a black silk dress than to have one like that. That just couldn't be changed. We'll go on wearing the gowns we have. It isn't as if everybody didn't know we had these black silk dresses. When the fourth spring came, the rolls of silk were not even taken from their box, except to be examined with tender care and replaced in the enveloping paper. Miss Priscilla was not well. For weeks she had spent most of her waking hours on the sitting-room couch, growing thinner, weaker, and more hollow-eyed. "'You see, dear, I—I I am not well enough now to wear it,' she said faintly to her sister one day when they had been talking about the black silk gowns. "'But you—' Miss Amelia had stopped her with a shocked gesture of the hand. "'Priscilla, as if I could,' she sobbed, and there the matter had ended. The townspeople were grieved, but not surprised, when they learned that Miss Amelia was fast following her sister into a decline. It was what they had expected of the heat winds, they said, and they reminded one another of the story of the strained eyes and the glasses. Then came the day when the little dressmaker's rooms were littered from end to end with black silk scraps. "'It's for Miss Priscilla and Miss Amelia,' said Mrs. Snow, with tears in her eyes, in answer to the questions that were asked. "'It's their black silk gowns, you know.' "'But I thought they were ill, almost dying,' gasped the questioner. The little dressmaker nodded her head. Then she smiled, even while she brushed her eyes with her fingers. "'They are, but they're happy. They're even happy in this.' touching the dress in her lap. They've been forty years buying it, and four making it up. Never until now could they decide to use it. Never until now could they be sure they wouldn't want to... to make it over. The little dressmaker's voice broke, then went on tremulously. There are folks like that, that never enjoy a thing for what it is, lest some time they might want it different. Miss Priscilla and Miss Amelia never took the good that was going. They've always saved it for some time later. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 A Belated Honeymoon The haze of a warm September day hung low over the house, the garden, and the dust-white road. On the side veranda, a grey-haired, erect little figure sat knitting. After a time, the needles began to move more and more slowly, until at last, they lay idle in the motionless, withered fingers. "'Well, well, Abby, take in a nap,' demanded a thin-chested, wiry old man, coming around the corner of the house and seating himself on the veranda steps. The little old woman gave a guilty start and began to knit vigorously. "'Dear me, no, Hezekiah, I was thinking,' she hesitated a moment, then added a little feverishly. "'It's ever so much cooler here than up to the fairgrounds now, ain't it, Hezekiah?' The old man threw a sharp look at her face. Hmm, yes, he said. Maybe it is. From far down the road came the clang of a bell. As by common consent, the old man and his wife got to their feet and hurried to the front of the house, where they could best see the trolley car as it rounded a curve and crossed the road at right angles. Go slick, don't it? murmured the man. There was no answer. The woman's eyes were hungrily devouring the last glimpse of paint and polish. "'And we ain't been on him tall yet, have we, Abby?' he continued. She drew a long breath. 
well you see i i hadn't had time hezekiah she rejoined apologetically hm muttered the old man as they turned and walked back to their seats for a time neither spoke then hezekiah warden cleared his throat determinedly and faced his wife look a here abby he began i'm a-goin ter say something that has been most tumblin off in the end of my tongue for more than a year jenny and frank are good and kind and they mean well but they think cause our hair's white and our feet ain't quite so lively as they once was that we're just as good as buried already and that we don't need anything more excitin than a nap in the sun now abby didn't you want to go to that fair with the folks today didn't you a swift flush came into the woman's cheek why hezekiah it's ever so much cooler here and she paused helplessly hm retorted the man i thought as much it's always nice and cool here in summer and nice and warm here in winter when jenny goes somewheres that you want her to go and don't take ye and when tain't that you say you hain't had time i know ye you'd talk anyway to hide their selfishness look a here abby didn't you ever ride in them electric cars i mean anywheres well i hain't neither and by ginger i'm a-goin to oh hezekiah hezekiah don't swear i tell you abby i will swear it's a swearin matter ever since i heard of em i wanted to try em and here they're now most to my own do and i hain't even been on em once look a here abby just because we're most eighty ain't no sign we've lost interest in things i'm spry as a cricket and so be you yet frankie and jenny expect us to stay grouped up here as if we was old really old ninety or a hundred you know and tain't fair why we will be old one of these days i know it hezekiah we couldn't go much when we was younger he resumed even our wedding trip was chopped right off short fore it even begun a tender light came into the dim old eyes opposite i know dear and what plans we had cried abigail boston and bunker hill and faneuil hall the old man suddenly squared his shoulders and threw back his head abby look a here do you remember that money i've been savin off and on when i could get a dollar here and there that was extra well there's as much as ten of em now and i'm a-goin ter spend em all of em mebby i'm a-goin ter ride in them electric cars and so be you and i ain't goin ter no old country fair neither and no more be you look a here abby the folks are goin again ter morrow ter the fair ain't they abigail nodded mutely her eyes were beginning to shine well resumed hezekiah when they go we'll be settin in the sun where they say we'd ought to be but we ain't a-goin ter stay there abby we're goin down the road and get on them electric cars and when we get to the junction we're a-goin ter take the steam cars for boston what if this thirty miles i calculate we're equal to em we'll have one good time and we won't come home until in the evening we'll see faneuil hall and bunker hill and you shall buy a new cap and ride in the subway if there's a preaching service we'll go to that they have em sometimes weekdays you know oh hezekiah we couldn't gasped the little old woman pooh course we could listen and hezekiah proceeded to unfold his plans more in detail it was very early the next morning when the household awoke by seven o'clock a two-seated carryall was drawn up to the side door and by a quarter past the carryall bearing jenny frank the boys and the lunch baskets rumbled out of the yard and onto the highway now keep quiet and don't get heated mother cautioned jenny looking back at the little gray-haired woman standing all alone on the side veranda find a good cool spot to smoke your pipe in father called frank as an old man appeared in the doorway there followed a shout a clatter and a cloud of dust then silence fifteen minutes later hand in hand a little old man and a little old woman walked down the white road together to most of the passengers on the trolley car that day the trip was merely a necessary means to an end to the old couple on the front seat it was something to be remembered and lived over all their lives 
even at the junction the spell of unreality was so potent that the men forgot things so trivial as tickets and marched into the car with head erect and eyes fixed straight ahead it was after hezekiah had taken out the roll of bills all ones to pay the fares to the conductor that a young man in a tall hat sauntered down the aisles and dropped into the seat in front going to boston i take it said the young man genially yes sir replied hezekiah no less genially you guessed right the first time abigail lifted a cautious hand to her hair and her bonnet so handsome and well dressed a man would notice the slightest things awry she thought hm smiled the stranger i was so successful that time suppose i try my luck again you don't go every day i fancy eh sugar how did he know that now chuckled hezekiah turning to his wife in open glee so we don't stranger so we don't he added turning back to the man you hit it plumb bright hm great place boston observed the stranger i'm glad you're going i think you'll enjoy it the two wrinkled old faces before him fairly beamed i thank you sir said hezekiah heartily i call that mighty kind of you specially as there are them that thinks we're too old to be angy of anything old of course you're not too old why you're just in the prime to enjoy things cried the handsome man and in the sunshine of his dazzling smile the hearts of the little old man and woman quite melted with them thank you sir thank you sir nodded abigail while hezekiah offered his hand shake stranger shake and i ain't too old and i'm a-goin to prove it i've got money sir heaps of it and i'm goin to spend it maybe i'll spend it all we're a-goin to see bunker hill and faneuil hall and we're a-goin to ride in the subway now don't tell me we don't know how to range ourselves it was a very simple matter after that on the one hand were infinite tact and skill on the other innocence ignorance and an overwhelming gratitude for this sympathetic companionship long before boston was reached mr and mrs warden and mr livingstone were on the best of terms and when they separated at the foot of the car steps to the old man and woman it seemed that half their joy and all their courage went with the smiling man who lifted his hat in farewell before being lost to sight in the crowd there abby we're here announced hezekiah with an exultation that was a little forced gory there must be something to go in today he added as he followed the long line of people down the narrow passage between the cars there was no reply abigail's cheeks were pink and her bonnet strings untied her eyes wide opened and frightened were fixed on the swaying bobbing crowds ahead in the great waiting-room she caught her husband's arm hezekiah we can't we mustn't to-day she whispered there's such a crowd let's go home and come when it's quieter but abby we're here let's sit down hezekiah finished helplessly near one of the outer doors mr livingstone better known to his friends and the police as slick bill smiled behind his hand not once since he had left them had mr and mrs hezekiah warden been out of his sight what's up bill need assistance demanded a voice at his elbow jim by all that's lucky cried livingstone turning to greet a dapper little man in gray sure i need you it's a peach though i doubt if we get much but fun but there'll be enough of that to make up oh he's got money heaps of it he says laughed livingstone and i saw a roll of bills myself but i advise you not to count too much on that though it'll be easy enough to get what there is all right as for the fun jim look over by that post near the parcel window great scott where'd you pick them chuckled the younger man never mind returned the other with a shrug meet me at clyde's in half an hour we'll be there never fear over by the parcel room an old man looked about him with anxious eyes but abby don't you see he urged we've come so far seems as though we ought to do the rest all right now 
you just sit here and let me go and find out how to get there we'll try for bunker hill first cause we want to see the moon your man sure he rose to his feet only to be pulled back by his wife hezekiah warden she almost sobbed if you dare to steer ten feet away from me i'll never forgive you as long as i live we'd never find each other again well well abby soothed the man with grim humor if we never found each other again i don't see as twould make much difference whether you forgive me or not for another long minute they silently watched the crowd then hezekiah squared his shoulders come come abby he said this ain't no way to do only think how we wanted to get here and now we're here and don't dare to stare there ain't any less folks than there was growin worse if anything but i'm gettin used to em now and i'm goin to make a break come what would mr livingstone say if he could see us now where'd he think our boastin was about our bein able to ranger ourselves come and once more he rose to his feet this time he was not held back the little woman at his side adjusted her bonnet tilted up her chin and in her turn rose to her feet sure enough she quavered bravely come hezekiah we'll ask the way to bunker hill and holding fast to her husband's coat sleeve she tripped across the floor to one of the outer doors on the sidewalk mr and mrs hezekiah warden came once more to a halt before them swept an endless stream of cars carriages and people above thundered the elevated railway cars oh shouted abigail and tightened her grasp on her husband's coat it was some minutes before hezekiah's dry tongues and lips could frame his question and then his words were so low-spoken and indistinct that the first two men he asked did not hear the third man frowned and pointed to a policeman the fourth snapped take the elevated for charlestown or the trolley cars either all of which served but to puzzle hezekiah the more little by little the dazed old man and his wife fell back before the jostling crowds they were quite against the side of the building when livingstone spoke to them well well if here aren't my friends again he exclaimed cordially there was something of the fierceness of a drowning man in the way hezekiah took hold of that hand mr livingstone he cried then he recollected himself we was just going to bunker hill he said jauntily yes smiled livingstone but your luncheon aren't you hungry come with me i was just going to get mine but you i hezekiah paused and looked doubtingly at his wife indeed my dear mrs warden you'll say yes i know urged livingstone suavely only think how good a nice cup of tea would taste now i know but she glanced at her husband nonsense of course you'll come insisted livingstone laying a gently compelling hand on the arm of each fifteen minutes later hezekiah stood looking about him with wondering eyes well well abby ain't this slick he cried his wife did not reply the mirrors the lights the gleaming silver and glass had filled her with a delight too great for words she was vaguely conscious of her husband of mr livingstone and of a smooth shaven little man in grey who was presented as mr harding then she found herself seated at that wonderful table while beside her chair stood an awesome being who laid a printed card before her with a little ecstatic sigh she gave hezekiah her customary signal for the blessing and bowed her head there exulted livingstone aloud here we he stopped short from his left came a deep-toned reverent voice invoking the divine blessing upon the place the food and the new friends who were so kind to strangers in a strange land by jove muttered livingstone under his breath as his eyes met those of jim across the table the waiter coughed and turned his back then the blessing concluded hezekiah raised his head and smiled well well abby why don't you say something he asked breaking the silence you hain't said a word mr livingstone'll be thinking you don't like it 
Mrs. Warden drew a long breath of delight. I can't say anything, Hezekiah, she faltered. It's all so beautiful. Livingstone waited until the dazed old eyes had become, in a measure, accustomed to the surroundings. Then he turned a smiling face on Hezekiah. And now, my friend, what do you propose to do after luncheon? he asked. Well, we calculate to take in Bunker Hill and Faneuil Hall, sure, returned the old man with a confidence that told of a new carriage imbibed with his tea. Then we thought maybe we'd ride in the subway and hear one of the big preachers if they happen to be holding meetings anywhere this week. Maybe you can tell us, eh? Across the table, the man called Harding choked over his food and Livingstone frowned. Well, began Livingstone slowly. I think, interrupted Harding, taking a newspaper from his pocket. I think there are services there, he finished gravely, pointing to the glaring advertisement of a Tencent show as he handed the paper across to Livingstone. But what time do the exercises begin? demanded Hezekiah in a troubled voice. You see, there's Bunker Hill and Sugar! Abby, ain't that pretty? he broke off delightedly. Before him stood a slender glass into which the waiter was pouring something red and sparkling. The old lady opposite grew white, then pink. Of course that ain't wine, Mr. Livingstone, she asked anxiously. Give yourself no uneasiness, my dear Mrs. Warden, interposed Harding. It's lemonade, pink lemonade. Oh, she returned with a relieved sigh. I ask your pardon, I'm sure. You wouldn't have it, course, no more than I would. But you see, being pledged so, I didn't want to make a mistake. There was an awkward silence. Then Harding raised his glass. Here's to your health, Mrs. Warden, he cried gaily. May your trip... Wait, she interrupted excitedly, her old eyes alight and her cheeks flushed. Let me tell you first what this trip is to us. Then you'll have a right to wish us good luck. Harding lowered his glass and turned upon her a gravely attentive face. Most fifty years ago we was married, Hezekiah and me, she began softly. We'd saved both of us and we'd planned a honeymoon trip. We was coming to Boston. They didn't have any electric cars then nor any steam cars only halfway. But we was a coming and we was planning on Bunker Hill and Faneuil Hall, and I don't know what all. The little lady paused for breath, and Harding stirred uneasily in his chair. Livingstone did not move. His eyes were fixed on a mirror across the room. Over at the sideboard, the waiter vigorously wiped a bottle. Well, we was married, continued the tremulous voice, and not half an hour later, mother fell down the cellar stairs and broke her hip. Of course that stopped things right short. I took off my wedding gown and put on my old red calico and went to work. Hezekiah came right there and run the farm, and I nursed mother and did the work. Twas more than a year, for she was up round, and after that, what with the babies and all, there didn't never seem a chance when Hezekiah and me could take this trip. If we went anywhere, we couldn't seem to manage to go together, and we never stayed for no sightseeing. Late years, my Jenny and her husband seemed to think we didn't need nothing but naps and knitting and somehow we got so we just couldn't stand it we wanted to go somewhere and see something so mrs warden paused drew a long breath and resumed her voice now had a ring of triumph well last month they got the electric cars finished down our way we hadn't been on em neither of us jenny and frank didn't seem to want us to they said they were shaky and noisy and would tire us all out but yesterday when the folks was gone hezekiah and me got her talking and thinking how all these years we hadn't never had that honeymoon trip and how by and by we'd be old real old i mean so's we couldn't take it and all of a sudden we said we'd take it now right now and we did we left a note for the children and and we're here there was a long silence over at the sideboard the waiter still polished his bottle livingstone did not even turn his head finally harding raised his glass 
we'll drink to honeymoon trips in general and to this one in particular he cried a little constrainedly mrs warden flushed smiled and reached for her glass the pink lemonade was almost at her lips when livingstone's arm shot out then came the tinkle of a shattered glass and a crimson stain where the wine trailed across the damask i beg your pardon exclaimed livingstone while the other men lowered their glasses in surprise that was an awkward slip of mine mrs warden i must have hit your arm but bill muttered harding under his breath you don't mean but i do corrected livingstone quietly looking straight into harding's amazed eyes mr and mrs warden are my guests they are going to drive to bunker hill with me by and by when the six o'clock accommodation train pulled out from boston that night it bore a little old man and a little old woman gray-haired weary but blissfully content we've seen em all hezekiah every single one of em abigail was saying and want mr livingstone good a gittin that carriage and takin us everywhere and it bein open so all round the sides we didn't miss seeing a single thing he was abby he was and he wouldn't let me pay one cent cried hezekiah taking out his roll of bills and patting it lovingly but abby didn't you notice twas kind of queer we never got one taste of that pink lemonade the waiter man took it away end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen when aunt abby waked up the room was very still the gaunt figure on the bed lay motionless save for a slight lifting of the chest at long intervals the face was turned toward the wall leaving a trail of thin gray hair wisps across the pillow just outside the door two physicians talked together in low tones with an occasional troubled glance toward the silent figure on the bed if there could be something that would rouse her murmured one something that would prick her will-power and goad into action but this lethargy this wholesale given up he finished with a gesture of despair i know frowned the other and i've tried day after day i've tried but there's nothing i've exhausted every means in my power i didn't know but you he paused questioningly the younger man shook his head no he said if you can't i can't you've been her physician for years if anyone knows how to reach her you should know i suppose you've thought of her son oh yes jed was sent for long ago but he had gone somewhere into the interior on a prospecting trip and was very hard to reach it is doubtful if word gets to him at all until too late as you know perhaps it is rather an unfortunate case he has not been home for years anyway and the nortons james is mrs darling's nephew have been making all the capital they can out of it and have been prejudicing her against him quite unjustly in my opinion for i think it's nothing more nor less than the thoughtlessness on the boy's part hm too bad too bad murmured the other as he turned and led the way to the street door back in the sick room the old woman still lay motionless on the bed she was wondering as she had wondered so often before why it took so long to die for days now she had been trying to die decently and in order there was really no particular use in living so far as she could see ella and jim were very kind but after all they were not jed and jed was away hopelessly away and he did not even want to come back so ella and jim said there was that money too she did not like to think of the money it seemed to her that every nickel and dime and quarter that she had painfully wrested from the cost of keeping soul and body together all these past years lay now on her breast with a weight that crushed like lead she had meant that money for jed ella and jimmy were kind of course and she was willing they should have it yet jed but jed was away and she was so tired she had ceased to rouse herself either for the medicine or for the watery broth they forced through her lips it was so hopelessly dragged out this dying yet it must be over soon 
she had heard them tell the neighbors only yesterday that she was unconscious and that she did not know a thing of what was passing around her and she had smiled but only in her mind her lips she knew had not moved they were talking now ella and jim out in the other room their voices even their words were quite distinct and dreamily indifferently she listened you see said jim as long as i've got to go to town tomorrow anyhow it seems a pity not to do it all up at once i could order the coffin and the undertaker it's only a question of a few hours anyway and it seems it's a pity to make another trip just for that in the bedroom the old woman stirred suddenly somewhere away back behind the consciousness of things something snapped and sent the blood tingling from toes to fingertips a fierce anger sprang instantly into life and brushed the cobwebs of lethargy and indifference from her brain she turned and opened her eyes fixing them upon the oblong patch of light that marked the doorway leading to the room beyond where sat ella and jim just for that jimmy had said and that was her death it was not worth it seemed even an extra trip to town and she had done so much so much for those two out there let's see to-day monday jim went on we might fix the funeral for saturday i guess and i'll tell the folks at the store to spread it putting it on saturday will give us a little extra time if she shouldn't happen to go soon's we expect though there ain't much fear o that now i guess she's so slow and it'll save me most half a day to do it all up this trip i ain't what's that he broke off sharply from the inner room had seemed to come a choking inarticulate cry with a smothered ejaculation jim picked up the lamp hurried into the sick room and tiptoed to the bed the gaunt figure lay motionless face to the wall leaving a trail of thin gray hair whips across the pillow gosh muttered the old man as he turned away there's nothing doing but it did give me a start on the bed the woman smiled grimly but the man did not see it it was snowing hard when jim got back from town tuesday night he came blustering into the kitchen with stamping feet and wild flung arms scattering the powdery whiteness in all directions Phew, it's a regular blizzard he began but he stopped short of the expression on his wife's face why ella he cried jim aunt abby sat up ten minutes in bed to-day she called for toast and tea jim dropped into a chair his jaw fell open sat up he stammered yes but she hang it all herrick's coming tomorrow with the coffin oh jim well i can't help it you know how she was this morning retorted jim sharply i thought she was dead once why i most had herrick come back with me to-night i was so sure i know it shivered ella but you hadn't been gone an hour for she began to stare and notice things i found her looking at me first and it give me such a turn i most dropped the medicine bottle in my hand i was clearing off the little table by her side and she was following me around with them big gray eyes slick up she asks after a minute and i could a dropped right there and then cause i was slick up for her fun row where's jim she asked then gone to town says i kind of faint like hm <laughs> she says and snaps her lips tight shut after a minute she opens em again i think i'll have some tea and toast she says casual like just as she's been calling for victuals every day for a month past and when i brought it she didn't drag herself up in bed and call for a pillar to her back so she could set up and there she stayed panting and gasping but setting up and she stayed there till the toast and tea was gone gosh groaned jim who'd a thought it course ain't that i grudge the old lady's livin he added hurriedly but just now it's so unhandy things bein as they be we can't very well he stopped a swift change come into his face say ella he cried maybe it's just a spurt for for the last 
Don't it happen sometimes that way, when folks is dying? I don't know, shuddered Ella. Shh, I thought I heard her. And she hurried across the hall to the sitting room and the bedroom beyond. It did not snow much through the night, but in the early morning it began again with increased severity. The wind rose too, and by the time Herrick, the undertaker, drove into the yard, the storm had become a blizzard. I calculated if I didn't get this ear coffin here pretty quick, there wouldn't be no getting it here yet a while, called Herrick cheerfully as Jim came to the door. Jim flushed and raised a warning hand. Shh! Herrick, look out! he whispered hoarsely. She ain't dead yet. You'll have to go back. Go back, snorted Herrick. Why, man alive, it was as much as my life's worth to get here. There won't be no going back yet a while for me or no one else, I calculate. And the quicker you get this here coffin in and out of the snow, the better it will be, he went on authoritatively as he leaped to the ground. It was not without talk and a great deal of commotion that the untimely addition to James Norton's household effects was finally deposited in the darkened parlor. Neither was it accomplished without some echo of the confusion reaching the sick room, despite all efforts of concealment. Jim, perspiring, red-faced, and palpably nervous, was passing on tiptoe through the sitting room when a quavering voice from the bedroom brought him to a halt. "'Jim, is that you?' "'Yes, Aunt Abby.' who's come jim's face grew white then red come he stammered yes i heard a sleigh and voices who is it why just just the man on on business he flung over his shoulder as he fled through the hall not half an hour later came ella's turn in accordance with the sick woman's orders she had prepared tea toast and a boiled egg but she had not set the tray on the bed when the old woman turned upon her two keen eyes. "'Who's in the kitchen, Ella, with Jim?' Ella started guiltily. "'Why, just a, a man. Who is it?' Ella hesitated. Then, knowing that deceit was useless, she stammered out the truth. "'Why, er, only Mr. Herrick.' "'Not William Herrick, the undertaker.' There was apparently only pleased surprise in the old woman's voice. Yes, Ella nodded feverishly. He had business out of this way, and, and got snowed up, she explained with some haste. You don't say, murmured the old woman. Well, ask him in. I'd like to see him. Aunt Abby, Ella's teeth fairly chattered with dismay. Yes, I'd like to see him repeated the old woman with cordial interest. Call him in, and Ella could do nothing but obey. Herrick, however, did not stay long in the sick room. The situation was uncommon for him, and not without its difficulties. As soon as possible he fled to the kitchen, telling Jim that it gave him the creeps, to have her ask him where he'd started for, and if business was good. All that day it snowed, and all that night— nor did the dawn of friday be in clear skies for hours the wind had swept the snow from roofs and hilltops piling it into great drifts that grew moment by moment deeper and more impassable in the farmhouse herrick was still a prisoner the sick woman was better even jim knew now that it was no momentary flare of the candle before it went out mrs darling was undeniably improving in health she had sat up several times in bed and had begun to talk of wrappers and slippers she ate toast eggs and jellies and hinted at chicken and beefsteak she was weak to be sure but behind her supporting and encouraging there seemed to be a curious strength a strength that sent a determined gleam to her eyes and a grim tenseness to her lips at noon the sun came out and the wind died in fitful gusts the two men attacked the drifts with a will and made a path to the gate they even attempted to break out the road and herrick harnessed his horse and started for home but he had not gone ten rods before he was forced to turn back tain't no use he grumbled i calculate i'm booked here till the crack o' doom and tomorrow's the fun route groaned jim and i can't get nowhere 
nowhere to tell em not to come well it don't look now as if anybody'd come or go snapped the undertaker saturday dawned fair and cold early in the morning the casket was moved from the parlor to the attic there had been sharp words at the breakfast table herrick declaring that he had made a sale and refusing to take the casket back to town hence the move to the attic but in spite of their caution the sick woman heard the commotion what you been cartin upstairs she asked in a mildly curious voice ella was ready for her a chair she explained smoothly the one that was broke in the front room you know and she did not think it was necessary to add that the chair was not all that had been moved she winced and changed color however when her aunt observed hm must be your expecting company ella it was almost two o'clock when loud voices and the crunch of heavy teams told that the road breakers had come all morning the nortons had been hoping against hope that the fateful hour would pass and the road be still left in unbroken whiteness some one however had known his duty too well and had done it i set to work first thing on this road said the man triumphantly to ella as he stood shovel in hand at the door the parson's right behind and there's a lot more behind him gorry i was afraid i wouldn't get here in time but the funeral wa'n't till two was it ella's dry lips refused to move she shook her head there's a mistake she said faintly there ain't no funeral aunt abby's better the man stared then he whistled softly gorry he muttered as he turned away if jim and ella had supposed that they could keep their aunt from attending her own funeral as herrick persisted in calling it they soon found their mistake mrs darling heard the bells of the first arrival i guess maybe i'll get up and set up a spell she announced calmly to ella i'll have my wrapper and my slippers and i'll set in the big chair out in the satin room that's parson jerry's voice and i want to see him but aunt abby began ella feverishly well i declare if there ain't another sleigh drivin in cried the old woman excitedly sitting up in bed and peering through the little window must be they're givin us a surprise party now hurry ella and git them slippers i ain't a-goin to lose none o the fun and ella nervous perplexed and thoroughly frightened did as she was bid in state in the big rocking chair the old woman received her guests she said little it is true but she was there and if she noticed that no guest entered the room without a few whispered words from ella in the hall she made no sign neither did she apparently consider it strange that ten women and six men should have braved the cold to spend fifteen rather embarrassed minutes in her sitting-room and for this last both ella and jim were devoutly grateful they could not help wondering about it however after she had gone to bed and the house was still what do ye suppose she thought whispered jim i don't know shivered ella but jim wa'n't it awful miss blair brought a white wreath everlastings one by one the days passed and jim and ella ceased to tremble every time the old woman opened her lips there was still that fearsome thing in the attic but the chance of discovery was small now if she should find out ella had said twould be the end of the money for us but she ain't a goin ter find out jim had retorted she can't last long course and i guess she won't change the will now unless someone tells her and i'll be plaguey careful there don't no one do that the funeral was a week old when mrs darling came into the sitting-room one day fully dressed i put on all my clothes she said smilingly in answer to ella's shocked exclamation i got restless somehow and sick o wrappers besides i wanted to walk around the house a little i git kind o tired o jest one room and she limped across the floor to the hall door but aunt abby where are you goin now faltered ella just up in the attic i wanted to see she stopped in apparent surprise ella and jim had sprung to their feet the attic they gasped yes i 
but you mustn't you ain't strong enough you'll fall there's nothing there they exclaimed wildly talking both together and hurrying forward oh i guess twon't kill me said the old woman and something in the tone of her voice made them fall back they were still staring into each other's eyes when the hall door closed sharply behind her it's all up breathed jim fully fifteen minutes passed before the old woman came back she entered the room quietly and limped across the floor to the chair by the window it's real pretty she said i always did like gray gray stammered ella yes for coffins you know jim made a sudden movement and started to speak but the old woman raised her hand you don't need to say anything she interposed cheerfully i just wanted to make sure where twas so i went up you see jed's coming home and i thought he might feel queer if he ran on to it casual like jed coming home the old woman smiled oddly oh i didn't tell you did i the doctor had his telegram yesterday and brought it over to me you know he was here last night read it and she pulled from her pocket a crumpled slip of paper and jim read shall be there the eighth for god's sake don't let me be too late j d darling End of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen wristers for three the great chair sumptuous with satin damask and soft with springs almost engulfed the tiny figure of the little old lady to the old lady herself it suddenly seemed the very embodiment of the luxurious ease against which she was so impotently battling with a spasmodic movement she jerked herself to her feet and stood there motionless save for the wistful sweep of her eyes about the room a level ray from the setting sun shot through the window gilding the silver of her hair and deepening the faint pink of her cheek on the opposite wall it threw a sharp silhouette of the alert little figure that figure which even the passage of years had been able to bend so very little to its will for a moment the lace kerchief folded across the black gown rose and fell tumultuously then its wearer crossed the room and seated herself with uncompromising discomfort in the only straight-backed chair the room contained this done mrs nancy weatherby for the twentieth time went over in her mind the whole matter for two weeks now she had been a member of her son john's family two vain unprofitable weeks when before that had the sunset found her night after night with hands limp from a long day of idleness when before that had the sunrise found her morning after morning with a mind destitute of worthy aim or helpful plan for the coming twelve hours when indeed not in her girlhood not even in her childhood had there been days of such utter uselessness rag dolls and mud pies need some care as for her married life there were eben the babies the house the church and how absolutely necessary she had been to each one the babies had quickly grown to stalwart men and sweet-faced women who had as quickly left the home nest and built new nests of their own eben had died and the church strange how long and longer still the walk to the church had grown each time she had walked it this last year after all perhaps it did not matter there were new faces at the church and young strong hands that did not falter and tremble over these new ways of doing things for a time there had only been the house that needed her but how great that need had been there were the rooms to care for there was the linen to air there were the dear treasures of picture and toy to cry and laugh over and outside there were the roses to train and the pansies to pick now even the house was not left it was october and son john had told her that winter was coming on and she must not remain alone he had brought her to his own great house and placed her in these beautiful rooms indeed son john was most kind to her if only she could make some return do something be of some use her heart failed her as she thought of the grave-faced preoccupied man who came each morning into the room with the question well mother is there anything you need to-day 
what possible service could she render him her heart failed her again as she thought of john's pretty new wife and the two big boys men grown sons of dear dead molly there was the baby to be sure but the baby was always attended by one or maybe two white-capped white-aproned young women madam wetherby never felt quite sure of herself when with those young women there were other young women too in whose presence she felt equally ill at ease young women in still prettier white aprons and still daintier white caps young women who moved noiselessly in and out of the halls and parlors and who waited at table each day was there not some spot some creature something in all that place that needed a touch of her hand the glance of her eye surely the day had not come when she could be of no use no service to her kind her work must be waiting she had only to find it she would seek it out and that at once no more of this slothful waiting for the work to come to her indeed no she finished aloud her dim eyes alight her breath coming short and quick and her whole frail self quivering with courage and excitement it was scarcely nine o'clock the next morning when a quaint little figure in a huge gingham apron slyly abstracted from the bottom of a trunk slipped out of the rooms given over to the use of john weatherby's mother the little figure tripped softly almost stealthily along the hall and down the wide main staircase there was some hesitation and there were a few false moves before the rear stairway leading to the kitchen was gained and there was a gasp half triumphant half dismayed when the kitchen was reached the cook stared open-mouthed as though confronted with an apparition a maid hurrying across the room with a loaded tray almost dropped her burden to the floor there was a dazed moment of silence then madam wetherby took a faltering step forward and spoke good morning i have come to help you ma'am gasped the cook to help to help nodded the little old lady briskly with a sudden overwhelming joy at the near prospect of the realization of her hopes pear apples beat eggs or anything indeed ma'am i you the cook stopped helplessly and eyed with frightened fascination the little old lady as she crossed to the table and picked up a pan of potatoes now a knife please oh here's one continued madam wetherby happily go write about something else i'll sit over there in that chair and i'll have this peeled very soon when john wetherby visited his mother's room that morning he found no one there to greet him a few sharp inquiries disclosed the little lady's whereabouts and sent margaret wetherby with flaming cheeks and tightening lips into the kitchen mother she cried and at the word the knife dropped from the trembling withered old fingers and clattered to the floor why mother i-i was helping quavered a deprecatory voice something in the appealing eyes sent a softer curve to margaret wetherby's lips yes mother that was very kind of you said john's wife gently but such work is quite too hard for you and there's no need of you doing it nora will finish this she added lifting the pan of potatoes to the table and you and i will go upstairs to your room perhaps we'll go driving by and by who knows in thinking it over afterwards nancy wetherby could find no fault with her daughter-in-law margaret had been goodness itself insisting only that such work was not for a moment to be thought of john's wife was indeed kind acknowledged madam wetherby to herself yet two big tears welled to her eyes and were still moist on her cheeks after she had fallen asleep it was perhaps three days later that john wetherby's mother climbed the long flight of stairs near her sitting-room door and somewhat timidly entered one of the airy sunlit rooms devoted to master philip wetherby the young woman in attendance respectfully acknowledged her greeting and madam wetherby advanced with some show of courage to the middle of the room the baby i-i heard him cry she faltered yes madam smiled the nurse it is master philip's nap hour 
louder and louder swelled the wails from the inner room yet the nurse did not stir save to reach for her thread but he's crying yet gasped madame wetherby the girl's lips twitched and an expression came to her face which the old lady did not in the least understand can't you do something demanded baby's grandmother her voice shaking no madam i began the girl but she did not finish the little figure before her drew itself to the full extent of its diminutive height well i can said madam wetherby crisply then she turned and hurried into the inner room the nurse sat mute and motionless until a crooning lullaby and the unmistakable tapping of rockers on a bare floor brought her to her feet in dismay with an angry frown she strode across the room but she stopped short at the sight that met her eyes in a low chair her face aglow with the accumulated love of years of baby brooding sat the little old lady one knotted wrinkled finger tightly elapsed within a dimpled fist the cries had dropped to sobbing breaths and the lullaby feeble and quavering though it was rose and swelled triumphant the anger fled from the girl's face and a queer choking came to her throat so that her words were faint and broken madam i beg pardon i'm sorry but i must put master philip back on his bed but he isn't asleep yet demurred madam wetherby softly her eyes mutinous but you must i can't that is master philip cannot be rocked faltered the girl nonsense my dear she said babies can always be rocked and again the lullaby rose on the air but madam persisted the girl she was almost crying now don't you see i must put master philip back it is mrs wetherby's orders they they don't rock baby so much now for an instant fierce rebellion spoke through flashing eyes stern set lips and tightly clutched fingers then all the light died from the thin old face and the tense muscles relaxed you may put the baby back said madame wetherby tremulously yet with a sudden dignity that set the maid to curtsying i i should not want to cross my daughter's wishes nancy wetherby never rocked her grandson again but for days she haunted the nursery happy if she could but tie the baby's moccasins or hold his brush or powder puff yet a week had scarcely passed when john's wife said to her mother dear i wouldn't tire myself so trotting upstairs each day to the nursery there isn't a bit of need mary and betty can manage quite well you fatigue yourself too much and to the old lady's denials john's wife returned with a tinge of sharpness but really mother i'd rather you didn't it frets the nurses and forgive me but you know you will forget and talk to him in baby talk the days came and the days went and nancy wetherby stayed more and more closely to her rooms she begged one day for the mending basket but her daughter-in-law laughed and kissed her tut tut mother dear she remonstrated as if i'd had you wearing your eyes and fingers out mending a paltry pair of socks then i i'll knit new ones cried the old lady with sudden inspiration knit new ones stockings laughed margaret wetherby why dearie they never in this world would wear them and if they would i couldn't let you do it she added gently as she noted the swift clouding of the eager face such tiresome work again the old eyes filled with tears and yet john's wife was kind so very kind it was a cheerless gray december morning that john wetherby came into his mother's room and found a sob shaken little figure in the depths of the sumptuous satin damask chair mother mother why mother there were amazement and real distress in john wetherby's voice there there john i i didn't mean to truly i didn't quavered the little old lady john dropped on one knee and caught the fluttering fingers mother what is it 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 isn't anything truly it isn't urged the tremulous voice is any one unkind to you john's eyes grew stern 
the boys or margaret the indignant red mounted to the faded cheek john how can you ask every one is kind kind so very kind to me well then what is it there was only a sob in reply come come he coaxed gently for a moment nancy weatherby's breath was held suspended then it came in a burst with a sudden rush of words oh john john i'm so useless so useless so dreadfully useless don't you see not a thing not a person needs me the kitchen has the cook and the maids the baby has two or three nurses not even this room needs me there's a girl to dust it each day once i slipped out of bed and did it first i did john but she came in and when i told her she just curtsied and smiled and kept right on and she didn't even skip one chair john dear john sometimes it seems as though even my own self doesn't need me i i don't even put on my clothes alone there's always someone to help me there there dear soothed the man huskily i need you indeed i do mother and he pressed his lips to one then the other of the wrinkled soft-skinned hands you don't you don't choked the woman there's not one thing i can do for you why john only think i sit with idle hands all day and there was so much once for them to do there was eben and the children and the house and the missionary meetings and on and on went the sweet old voice but the man scarcely heard only one phrase rang over and over in his ears there's not one thing i can do for you all the interests of now stocks bonds railroads fell from his mind and left it blank save for the past he was a boy again at his mother's knee and what had she done for him then surely among all the myriads of things there must be one that he might single out and ask her to do for him now and yet as he thought his heart misgave him there were pies baked clothes made bumped foreheads bathed lost pencils found there were a sudden vision came to him of something warm and red and very soft something over which his boyish heart had exulted the next moment his face lighted with joy very like that of the years long ago mother he cried i know what you can do for me i want a pair of wristers red ones just like those you used to knit it must have been a month later that john weatherby with his two elder sons turned the first corner that carried him out of sight of his house very slowly and with gentle fingers he pulled off two bright red wristers he folded them patted them then tucked them away in an inner pocket bless her dear heart he said softly you should have seen her eyes shine when i put them on this morning i can imagine it said one of his sons in a curiously tender voice the other one smiled and said whimsically i can hardly wait for mine yet even as he spoke his eyes grew dim with a sudden moisture back at the house john's mother was saying to john's wife did you see them on him margaret john's wristers they did look so bright and pretty and i'm to make more too did you know frank and edward want some john said so he told him about his and they wanted some right away only think margaret she finished lifting with both hands the ball of red worsted and pressing it close to her cheek i've got two whole pairs to make now end of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen the giving thanks of cyrus and huldah for two months cyrus gregg and his wife huldah had not spoken to each other yet all the while they had lived under the same roof driven to church side by side and attended various festivities and church prayer meetings together the cause of the quarrel had been an insignificant something that speedily lost itself in the torrent of angry words that burst from the lips of the irate husband and wife until by night it would have been difficult for either the man or the woman to tell exactly what had been the first point of difference 
By that time, however, the quarrel had assumed such proportions that it loomed in their lives larger than anything else, and each had vowed never to speak to the other until the other had made the advance. On both sides they came of a stubborn race, and from the first it was a battle royally fought. The night of the quarrel Cyrus betook himself in solitary state to the spare room over the parlor. After that he slept on a makeshift bed that he had prepared for himself in the shed chamber, hitherto sacred to trunks, dried corn, and cobwebs. For a month the two sat opposite to each other and partook of Hulda's excellent cooking, then one day the woman found at her plate a piece of brown paper on which had been scrawled, If I ain't worth speaking to, I ain't worth cooking for. Hereafter I'll take care of myself. A day later came the retort. Cyrus found it tucked under the shed chamber door. Hulda's note showed her schooling. It was well written, carefully spelled, and enclosed in a square white envelope. Sir, it ran stiffly. I shall be obliged if you do not chop any more wood for me. Hereafter I shall use the oil stove. Hold a Pendleton, Greg. Cyrus choked and peered at the name with suddenly blurred eyes. The hold of Pendleton was fiercely black and distinct. The Greg was so faint it could scarcely be discerned. Why, it's most like a divorce, he shivered. If it had not been so pitiful, it would have been ludicrous what followed. Day after day, in one corner of the kitchen, an old man boiled his potatoes and fried his unappetizing eggs over a dusty, unblacked stove. In the other corner, an old woman baked and brewed over a shining idol of brass and blacked enamel. And always the baking and brewing carried to the nostrils of the hungry man across the room the aroma of some dainty that was a particular favorite of his own. The man whistled and the woman hummed, at times, but they did not talk, except when some neighbor came in, and then they both talked very loud and very fast to the neighbor. On this one point where Cyrus Gregg and his wife Hulda agreed, under no circumstances whatever must any gossiping outsider know. One by one the weeks had passed. It was November now, and very cold. Outdoors a dull gray sky and a dull brown earth combined into a dismal hopelessness. Indoors, the dull monotony of a two-month-old quarrel and a growing heartache made a combination that carried even less of cheer. Holden never hummed now, and Cyrus seldom whistled. Yet neither was one whit nearer speaking. Each saw this, and curiously enough was pleased. In fact, it was just here that, in spite of the heartache, each found an odd satisfaction. By sugar, but she's a spunky one! Cyrus would chuckle admiringly as he discovered some new evidence of his wife's shrewdness in obtaining what she wanted with yet no spoken word. "'There isn't another man in town who could do it and stick to it,' exulted Hulda proudly, her eyes on her husband's form, bent over his egg-frying at the other side of the room. Not only the cause of the quarrel, but almost the quarrel itself had now long since been forgotten. In fact, to both Cyrus and his wife, it had come to be a sort of game in which each player watched the other's progress with fully as much interest as he did his own. And yet, with it all, there was the heartache, for the question came to them at times with sickening force. Just when and how could it possibly end? It was at about this time that each began to worry about the other. Hulda shuddered at the changeless fried eggs and boiled potatoes, and Cyrus ordered a heavy storm window for the room where Hulda slept alone. Hulda slyly left a new apple pie almost under her husband's nose one day, and Cyrus slipped a five-dollar bill beneath his wife's napkin ring. When both pie and greenback remained untouched, Hulda cried, and Cyrus said, "'Gosh darn it!' three times in succession behind the woodshed door. A week before Thanksgiving, a letter came from the married daughter, and another from the married son— they were good letters, kind and loving, and each closed with a suggestion that all go home at Thanksgiving for a family reunion. Hulda read the letters eagerly, but at their close she frowned and looked anxious. In a moment she had passed them to Cyrus with a toss of her head. Five minutes later Cyrus had flung them back with these words trailing across one of the envelopes. Write em. Tell em we are sick, dead, gone away, anything. Only don't let em come. 
uh, if we wanted to thanksgive. Hulda answered the letters that night. She, too, wrote kindly and lovingly, but at the end she said that much as she and father would like to see them, it did not seem wise to undertake to entertain such a family gathering just now. It would be better to postpone it. Both Hulda and Cyrus hoped that this would end the subject of Thanksgiving, but it did not. The very next day Cyrus encountered neighbor Wiley in the village store. Wiley's round red face shone like the full moon. "'Well, well, Cy, what you doin' down your way Thanksgiving, eh?' he queried. Cyrus stiffened, but before he could answer he discovered that Wiley had asked the question, not for information, but as a mere introduction to a recital of his own plans. "'We're doing great things,' announced the man. "'Sam and Jenny and the whole kit and them's comin' home and bringin' all the chicks. "'Tell you what, Cy, we be a Thanksgiving this year.' Ain't nothing like a good old family reunion when you come right down to it. Yes, I know, said Cyrus gloomily, but we, we ain't doing much this year. A day later came Hulda's turn. She had taken some calf's foot jelly to Mrs. Taylor in the little house at the foot of the hill, and Widow Taylor was crying. You see, it's Thanksgiving, she sobbed, in answer to Hulda's dismayed questions. Thanksgiving? "'Yes, and last year I had him.' Hulda sighed and murmured something comforting, appropriate, but almost at once she stopped, for the woman had turned searching her eyes upon her. "'Hulda, Greg, do you appreciate Cyrus?' Hulda bridled angrily, but there was no time for a reply, for the woman answered her own question and hurried on wildly. "'No. Did I appreciate my husband? No.' Does Sally Clark appreciate her husband? No, and there don't none of us do it till he's gone, gone, gone. As soon as possible, Hulda went home. She was not a little disconcerted. The gone, gone, gone rang unpleasantly in her ears, and before her eyes rose a hateful vision of unappetizing fried eggs and boiled potatoes. As to her not appreciating Cyrus, that was all nonsense. She had always appreciated him, and that, too, far beyond his just deserts, she told herself angrily. There was no escaping Thanksgiving after that for either Hulda or Cyrus. It looked from every eager eye and it dropped from every joyous lip until, of all the world, Hulda and Cyrus came to regard themselves as the most forlorn and the most abused. It was then that to Hulda came her great idea— she would cook for Cyrus the best Thanksgiving dinner he had ever eaten. Just because he was obstinate was no reason why he should starve, she told herself. And very gaily, she set about carrying out her plans. First, the oil stove, with the help of a jobman, was removed to the unfinished room over the kitchen. For the chief charm of the dinner was to be its secret preparation. Then, with the treasured butter and egg money, the turkey, cranberries, nuts, and raisins were bought and smuggled into the house and upstairs to the chamber of mystery. Two days before Thanksgiving, Cyrus came home to find a silent and almost empty kitchen. His heart skipped a beat and his jaw fell open in frightened amazement. Then a step on the floor above sent the blood back to his face and a new bitterness to his heart. "'So I ain't even good enough to stay with,' he muttered. "'Fool! Fool!' Fool, he snarled, glaring at the oblong brown paper in his arms, as if she'd care for this now, he finished, flinging the parcel into the farthest corner of the room. Unhappy Cyrus. To him, also, had come a great idea. Thanksgiving was not Christmas, to be sure, but if he chose to give presents on that day, surely it was no one's business but his own, he argued. In the brown paper parcel at that moment lay the soft, shimmering folds of yards upon yards of black silk, and Hulda had been longing for a new black silk gown. Yet it was almost dark when Cyrus stumbled over to the corner, picked up the parcel, and carried it ruefully away to the shed chamber. Thanksgiving dawned clear and unusually warm. The sun shone, and the air felt like spring. The sparrows twittered in the treetops, as if the branches were green with leaves. To Cyrus, however, it was a world of gloom. Upstairs, Hulda was singing. Singing! And it was Thanksgiving. 
he could hear her feet patter, patter on the floor above, and the sound had a cheery self-reliance that was maddening. Huldah was happy, evidently, and it was Thanksgiving. Twice he had walked resolutely to the back stairs with a brown paper parcel in his arms, and twice a quavering song of triumph from the room above had sent him back in defeat, as if she could care for a present of his. Suddenly now, Cyrus sprang forward in his chair, sniffing the air hungrily. Turkey! Huldah was roasting turkey while he... The old man dropped back in his seat and turned his eyes disconsolately on the ill-kept stove. Fried eggs and boiled potatoes are not the most toothsome prospect for a Thanksgiving dinner, particularly when one has the smell of a New England housewife's turkey in one's nostrils. For a time, Cyrus sat motionless. Then he rose to his feet, shuffled out of the house, and across the road to the barn. In the room above the kitchen, at that moment, something happened. Perhaps the old hands slipped in her eagerness, or perhaps the old eyes judged a distance wrongly. Whatever it was, there came a puff of smoke, a sputter, and a flare of light. Then red-yellow flames leaped to the flimsy shade at the window and swept on to the century-seasoned timbers above. With a choking cry, Huldah turned and stumbled across the room to the stairway. Out at the barn door, Cyrus, too, saw the flare of light at the window, and he, too, turned with a choking cry. They met at the foot of the stairway. Huldah! Cyrus! It was as if one voice had spoken. So exactly were the words simultaneous. Then Cyrus cried, You ain't hurt? No, no. Quick, the things. We must get them out. Obediently, Cyrus turned and began to work, and the first thing that his arms tenderly bore to safety was an oblong brown paper parcel. From all directions, then, came the neighbors running. The farming settlement was miles from a town or a fire engine. The house was small and stood quite by itself, and there was little, after all, that could be done except to save the household goods and gods. This was soon accomplished, and there was nothing to do but to watch the old house burn. Cyrus and Huldah sat hand in hand on an old stone wall, quite apart from their sympathetic neighbors, and talked. And about them was a curious air of elation, a buoyancy as if long-spent forces had suddenly found a joyous escape. "'Taint as if our things want all out,' cried Cyrus. His voice was actually exultant. "'Or as if we hadn't wanted to build a new one for years,' chirped his wife. "'Now you can have that air closet under the front stairs, Holda. "'And you can have that room for your tools, where it'll be warm in the winter. "'And there'll be the bow window out of the sitting room Holda. "'Yes, and a real bathroom with water coming right out of the wall, same as the Wileys have. "'And a tub, Holda. One of them pretty white, shiny ones. Oh, Cyrus, ain't it almost too good to be true? sighed Huldah. Then her face changed. Why, Cyrus, it's gone, she cried with sudden sharpness. What's gone? Your dinner. I was cooking such a beautiful turkey and all the fixings for you. A dull red came into the man's face. For me, stammered Cyrus. Yes, faltered Halda. Then her chin came up defiantly. The man laughed, and there was a boyish ring to his voice. Well, Halda, I didn't have any turkey, but I did have a tidy little piece of black silk for your gown, and I saved it, too. Maybe we could eat that, eh? It was not until just as they were falling asleep that night in Deacon Clark's spare bedroom that Mr. and Mrs. Gregg so much as hinted that there ever had been a quarrel. Then, under cover of the dark, Cyrus stammered, Hulda, did ye sense it? Them ere words we said at the foot of the stairs was spoke exactly together? Yes, I know, dear, murmured Hulda, with a little break in her voice. Then... "'Cyrus, isn't it wonderful, this Thanksgiving for us?' Downstairs the Clarks were talking of poor old Mr. and Mrs. Gregg and their sad loss, but the Clarks did not know. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 A New England Idol 
the hapgood twins were born in the great square house that sat back from the road just on the outskirts of fair town their baby eyes had opened upon a world of faded portraits and sombre haircloth furniture and their baby hands had eagerly clutched at crystal pendants on brass candlesticks gleaming out of the sacred darkness that enveloped the parlor mantel when older grown they had played dolls in the wonderful attic and made mud pies in the wilderness of a backyard the garden had been a fairyland of delight to their toddling feet and the apple trees a fragrant shelter for their first attempts at housekeeping from babyhood to girlhood the charm of the old place grew upon them so much so that the thought of leaving it for homes of their own became distasteful to them and they looked with scant favor upon the occasional village youths who sauntered up the path presumably on courtship bent the reverend john hapgood a man who ruled himself and all about him with the iron rod of a rigid old school orthodoxy died when the twins were twenty and the frail little woman who as his wife had for thirty years lived and moved solely because he expected breath and motion of her followed soon in his footsteps and then the twins were left alone in the great square house on the hill miss tabitha and miss rachel were not the only children of the family there had been a son the first-born and four years their senior the headstrong boy and the iron rule had clashed and the boy when sixteen years old had fled leaving no trace behind him if the reverend john hapgood grieved for his wayward son the members of his household knew it not save as they might place their own constructions on the added sternness to his eyes and the deepening lines about his mouth paul when it designated the graceless runaway was a forbidden word in the family and even the epistles in the sacred book bearing the prohibited name came to be avoided by the head of the house in the daily readings it was still music in the hearts of the women however though it never passed their lips and when the little mother lay dying she remembered and spoke of her boy the habit of years still fettered her tongue and kept it from uttering the name if he comes you know if he comes be kind be good she murmured her breath short and labored don't punish she whispered he was yet a lad in her disordered vision don't punish forgive years had passed since then years of peaceful morning and placid afternoons and paul had never appeared each purpling of the lilacs in the spring and reddening of the apples in the fall took on new shades of loveliness in the fond eyes of the twins and every blade of grass and tiny shrub became sacred to them on the tenth of june their thirty-fifth birthday the place had never looked so lovely a small table laid with spotless linen and gleaming silver stood beneath the largest apple tree a mute witness that the ladies were about to celebrate their birthday the tenth of june being the only day that the solemn dignity of the dining-room was deserted for the frivolous freedom of the lawn rachel came out of the house and sniffed the air joyfully delicious she murmured somehow the tenth of june is especially fine every year in careful uplifted hands she bore a round frosted cake always the chief treasure of the birthday feast the cake was covered with tiny colored candies so dear to the heart of a child miss rachel always bought those candies at the village store with the apology i want them for tabitha's birthday cake you know she thinks so much of pretty things tabitha invariably made the cake and iced it and as she dropped the bits of colored sugar into place she would explain to huldy who occasionally helped in the kitchen i wouldn't miss the candy for the world my sister thinks so much of it so each deceived herself with this pleasant bit of fiction and yet had what she herself most wanted rachel carefully placed the cake in the centre of the table feasted her eyes on its toothsome loveliness then turned and hurried back to the house the door had scarcely shut behind her when a small ragged urchin darted in at the street gate snatched the cake and at a sudden sound from the house 
dashed out of sight behind a shrub close by the sound that had frightened the boy was the tapping of the heels of miss tabitha's shoes along the back porch the lady descended the steps crossed the lawn and placed a saucer of pickles and a plate of dainty sandwiches on the table why i thought rachel brought the cake she said aloud it must be in the house there's other things to get anyway i'll go back again the click of the door brought the small boy close to the table filling both hands with sandwiches he slipped behind the shrub just as the ladies came out of the house together rachel carried a small tray laden with sauce and tarts tabitha one with water and steaming tea as they neared the table each almost dropped her burden why where's my cake and my sandwiches there's the plate it was on rachel's voice was growing in terror and mine too cried tabitha with distended eyes fastened on some bits of bread and meat all that the small brown hands had left it's burglars robbers rachel looked furtively over her shoulder and all your lovely cake almost sobbed tabitha it it was yours too said the other with a catch in her voice oh dear what can have happened to it i never heard of such a thing right in broad daylight the sisters had long ago set their trays upon the ground and were now wringing their hands helplessly suddenly a small figure appeared before them holding out four sadly crushed sandwiches and half of a crumbling cake i'm sorry awful sorry i didn't think i was so hungry i'm afraid there ain't very much left he added with rueful eyes on the sandwiches no i should say not vouchsafed rachel her voice firm now that the size of the burglar was declared tabitha only gasped the small boy placed the food upon the empty plates and rachel's lips twitched as she saw that he clumsily tried to arrange it in an orderly fashion there ma'am that looks pretty good he finally announced with some pride tabitha made an involuntary gesture of aversion rachel laughed outright then her face grew suddenly stern boy what do you mean by such actions she demanded his eyes fell and his cheeks showed red through the tan i was hungry but didn't you know it was stealing she asked her face softening i didn't stop to think it looked so good i couldn't help taking it he dug his bare toes in the grass for a moment in silence then he raised his head with a jerk and stood squarely on both feet i hain't got any money but i'll work to pay for it bringin wood in or somethin the dear child murmured two voices softly i've got to find my folks some time but i'll do the work first maybe an hour'll pay for it most he looked hopefully into miss rachel's face who are your folks she asked huskily by way of answer he handed out a soiled crumpled envelope for her inspection on which was written reverend john hapgood why it's father what exclaimed tabitha her sister tore the note open with shaking fingers it's from paul she breathed hesitating a conscientious moment over the name then she turned her startled eyes on the boy who was regarding her with lively interest do i belong to you he asked anxiously i i don't know who are you what's your name ralph hapgood tabitha had caught up the note and was devouring it with swift moving eyes it's paul's boy rachel she broke in only think of it paul's boy and she dropped a bit of paper and enveloped the lad in a fond but tearful embrace he squirmed uneasily i'm sorry i eat up my own folks's things i'll go to work any time he suggested trying to draw away and wiping a tear splash from the back of his hands on his trousers but it was long hours before ralph hapgood was allowed to go to work 
tears kisses embraces questions a bath and clean clothes followed each other in quick succession the clothes being some of his own father's boyhood garments her story was quickly told his mother was long since dead and his father had written on his dying bed the letter that commanded the boy so soon to be orphaned to the pity and care of his grandparents the sisters trembled and changed color at the story of the boy's hardships on the way to fairtown and they plied him with questions and sandwiches in about equal proportions after he told of the frequent dinnerless days and supperless nights of the journey that evening when the boy was safe in bed clean full-stomached and sleepily content the sisters talked it over the rev john hapgood in his will had cut off his recreant son with the proverbial shilling so by law there was little coming to ralph this however the sisters overlooked in calm disdain we must keep him anyhow said rachel with decision yes indeed the dear child he's twelve for all he's so small but he hasn't had much schooling we must see to that we want him well educated continued rachel a pink spot showing in either cheek indeed we do we'll send him to college i wonder now wouldn't he like to be a doctor perhaps admitted the other cautiously or a minister sure enough he might like that better i'm going to ask him and she sprang to her feet and tripped across the room to the parlor bedroom door ralph she called softly after turning the knob are you asleep huh no ma'am the voice nearly gave the lie to the words well dear we were wondering would you rather be a minister or a doctor she asked much as though she were offering for choice a peach and a pear a doctor came emphatically from out of the dark there was no sleep in the voice i've always wanted to be a doctor you shall oh you shall promised the woman ecstatically going back to her sister and from that time all their lives were ordered with that one end in view the hapgood twins were far from wealthy they owned the homestead but their income was small and the added mouth to fill and that a hungry one counted as the years passed haldy came less and less frequently to help in the kitchen and the sisters gowns grew more and more rusty and darned ralph boylike noticed nothing indeed half the year he was away at school but as the time drew near for the college course and its attendant expenses the sisters were sadly troubled we might sell suggested tabitha a little choke in her voice rachel started why sister sell oh no we couldn't do that she shuddered but what can we do do why lots of things rachel's lips came together with a snap it's coming berry time and there's our chickens and the garden did beautifully last year then there's your lace and my knitting they bring something sell oh we couldn't do that and she abruptly left the room and went out into the yard there she lovingly trained a wayward vine with new shoots going wrong and gloated over the rose bushes heavy with crimson buds but as the days and weeks flew by and september drew the nearer rachel's courage failed her berries had been scarce the chickens had died the garden had suffered from drought and but for their lace and knitting work their income would have dwindled to a pitiful sum indeed ralph had been gone all summer he had asked to go camping and fishing with some of his school friends he was expected home a week before the college opened however tabitha grew more and more restless every day finally she spoke rachel we'll have to sell there isn't any other way it would bring a lot she continued hurriedly before her sister could speak and we could find some pretty room somewhere it wouldn't be so very dreadful don't tabitha 
seems as though i couldn't bear even to speak of it sell oh tabitha then her voice changed from a piteous appeal to one of forced conviction we couldn't get anywhere near what it's worth tabitha anyway no one here wants it or can afford to buy it for what it ought to bring it is really absurd to think of it of course if i had an offer a good big one that would be quite another thing but there's no hope of that rachel's lips said hope but her heart said danger and the latter was what she really meant she did not know that but two hours before a stranger had said to a fair town lawyer i want a summer home in this locality you don't happen to know of a good old treasure of a homestead for sale do you i do not replied the lawyer there's a place on the edge of the village that would be just the ticket but i don't suppose it could be bought for love nor money where is it asked the man eagerly you never know what money can do to say nothing of love till you try the lawyer chuckled softly it's the hapgood place i'll drive you over to-morrow it's owned by two old maids and they worship every stick and stone and blade of grass that belongs to it however i happen to know that cash is rather scarce with them and there's ample chance for love if the money fails he added with a twitching of his lips when the two men drove into the yard that august morning the hapgood twins were picking nasturtiums and the flaming yellow and scarlets lighted up their sombre gowns and made patches of brilliant color against the gray of the house by jove it's a picture exclaimed the would-be purchaser the lawyer smiled and sprang to the ground introductions swiftly followed then he cleared his throat in some embarrassment ahem i brought mr hazelton up here ladies because he was interested in your beautiful place miss rachel smiled the smile of proud possession then something within her seems to tighten and she caught her breath sharply it is fine murmured hazelton and the view is grand he continued his eyes on the distant hills then he turned abruptly ladies i believe in coming straight to the point i want a summer home and i want this one can i tempt you to part with it indeed no began rachel almost fiercely then her voice sank to a whisper i i don't think you could but sister interposed tabitha her face alight you know you said that is there are circumstances perhaps he would but pay enough her voice tumbled over the hated word then stopped while her face burned scarlet pay no human mortal could pay for this house flashed rachel indignantly then she turned to hazelton her slight form drawn to its greatest height and her hands crushing the flowers she held till the brittle stem snapped releasing a fluttering shower of scarlet and gold mr hazelton to carry out certain wishes very near to our hearts we need money we will show you the place and we will consider your offer she finished faintly it was a dreary journey the sisters took that morning though the garden had never seemed lovelier nor the rooms more sacredly beautiful in the end hazelton's offer was so fabulously enormous to their unwilling ears that their conscience forbade them to refuse it i'll have the necessary papers ready to sign in a few days said the lawyer as the two gentlemen turned to go and hazelton added if at any time before that you change your mind and find you cannot give it up just let me know and it'll be all right just think it over till then he said kindly the dumb woe in their eyes appealing to him as the loudest lamentations could not have done but if you don't mind i'd like to have an architect who is in town just now come up and look it over with me he finished certainly sir certainly said rachel longing for the men to go 
but when he was gone he wished him back anything would be better than this aimless wandering from room to room and from yard to garden and back again i suppose he will sit here murmured tabitha dropping wearily on to the settee under the apple trees i suppose so her sister assented i wonder if she knows how to grow roses they'll certainly die if she doesn't and rachel crushed the worm under her foot with unnecessary vigor oh i hope they'll tend to the vines on the summer-house rachel and the pansies you don't think they'll let them run to seed do you oh dear and tabitha sprang nervously to her feet and started back to the house mr hazelton appeared the next morning with two men an architect and a landscape gardener rachel was in the summer-house and the first she knew of their presence was the sound of talking outside you'll want to grade it down there she heard a strange voice say and fill in that little hollow clear away all those rubbishy poses and mass your flowering shrubs in the background those roses are no particular good i fancy will move such as are worth anything and make a rose bed on the south side we'll talk over the varieties you want later of course these apple trees and those lilacs will be cut down and this summer-house will be out of the way you'll be surprised a few changes will do wonders and he stopped abruptly a woman tall flushed and angry-eyed stood before him in the path she opened her lips but no sound came mr hazelton was lifting his hat the flush faded and her eyes closed as though to shut out some painful sight then she bowed her head with a proud gesture and sped along the way to the house once inside she threw herself sobbing upon the bed tabitha found her there an hour later you poor dear they've gone now she comforted rachel raised her head they're going to cut down everything every single thing she gasped i know it choked tabitha and they're going to tear out lots of doors inside and build in windows and things oh rachel what shall we do i don't know oh i don't know moaned the woman on the bed diving into the pillows and hugging them close to her head we we might give up selling he said we could if we wanted to but there's ralph i know it oh dear what can we do rachel suddenly sat upright do why we'll stand it of course we just mustn't mind if it turns the house into a hotel and the yard into a, a pasture she said hysterically we must just think of ralph and of his being a doctor come let's go to the village and see if we can rent the tenement of old mrs goddard's with a long sigh and a smothered sob tabitha went to get her hat mrs goddard greeted the sisters effusively and displayed her bits of rooms and the tiny square of yard with the plainly expressed wish that the place might be their home the twins said little but their eyes were troubled they left with a promise to think it over and let mrs goddard know i didn't suppose rooms could be so little whispered tabitha as they closed the gate behind them we couldn't grow as much as a sunflower in that yard faltered rachel well anyhow we could have some house plants tabitha tried to speak cheerfully indeed we could agreed rachel rising promptly to her sister's height and after all little rooms are lots cheaper to heat than big ones and there the matter ended for the time being mr hazelton and the lawyer with the necessary papers appeared a few days later as the lawyer took off his hat he handed a letter to miss rachel i stepped into the office and got your mail he said genially thank you replied the lady trying to smile it's from ralph handing it over for her sister to read both the ladies were in sombre black a ribbon or a brooch 
seemed out of place to them that day tabitha broke the seal of the letter and retired to the light of the window to read it the papers were spread on the table and the pen was in rachel's hand when a scream from tabitha shattered the oppressive silence of the room stop stop oh stop rushing to her sister and snatching the pen from her fingers we don't have to see read pointing to the postscript written in a round boyish hand oh i say i've got a surprise for you you think i've been fishing and loafing all summer but i've been working for the hotels here the whole time i've got a fine start on my money for college and i've got a chance to work for my board all this year by helping professor heaton i met him here this summer and he's the right sort every time i've intended all along to help myself a bit when it came to the college racket but i didn't mean to tell you until i knew i could do it but it's a sure thing now bye-bye i'll be home next saturday your affectionate nephew ralph rachel had read this aloud but her voice ended in a sob instead of in the boy's name hazelton brushed the back of his hand across his eyes and the lawyer looked intently out the window for a moment there was a silence that could be felt then hazelton stepped to the table and fumbled noisily with the papers ladies i withdraw my offer he announced i can't afford to buy this house i can't possibly afford it it's too expensive and without another word he left the room motioning the lawyer to follow the sisters looked into each other's eyes and drew a long sobbing breath rachel is it true oh tabitha let's let's go out under the apple trees and just know that they are there and hand in hand they went end of chapter eighteen end of across the years by eleanor h porter